for around two years now. I've worked as a low-rent security guard at St. Daniel's Mental Health Facility in our town. It's classified as medium-slash-high-level security, and contains forensic units where patients are held who have committed crimes of some sort and been declared innocent by reason of insanity. I don't give any details about the history or crimes of the patients, except from nurses who will mention something in passing. In the lull after a code white or in the cafeteria, sometimes people would let things slip, like how the one who acts like a dog and howls, and drinks from toilets during full moons, he killed his little sister and her friends. Or watch out for that one, he's unpredictable. He's in here for strangling someone on the city bus. And we're pretty sure he's bringing in crack from the outside and selling it. I'd pick up all kinds of tidbits. I was on a first-name basis and had a friendly rapport built up with one patient named Sam until a nurse let it slip that he was a child molester. A serial child molester. I couldn't look him in the eye after hearing that. Although I never knew for sure if it was actually true. He was a small, chubby toad of a man with a goofy smile and a Kermit the Frog voice. I thought he looked harmless enough until I pictured him standing over a child in a dark back room somewhere or luring little ones at the mall with promises of puppies, video games, and candy. Despite all that, most of the patients in the facility were actually pretty pleasant. I tell people all the time that a lot of folks in these places get a bad rep, but they're actually pretty decent people. Hardly anyone was violent, especially when they were properly medicated. Code whites, violent patients, would happen maybe once or twice a shift, but it was usually manageable enough, and within a few minutes I would go back to being bored again. Maybe I had just gotten used to the place. Although the staff and most of the patients were amiable enough, the actual hospital, the grounds themselves, were really creepy. The hospital was first constructed over 150 years prior, and although it had been rebuilt and renovated piecemeal over time, many parts of the various buildings on the grounds were ancient. The basement of the main building, for example, had sections which were never refinished or renovated. Tunnels, two and three times the length of football fields, crossed beneath the buildings for vast stretches. You would be walking along at night through the old, mildew-smelling basement, and would hear footsteps coming towards you for a long, long time before actually seeing the person who was coming, due to the slanting walls or corners obstructing the view. When the smiling, anxious face of another staff member came around the corner to greet you, it was a relief, especially at night when there was hardly ever anyone in the basement. Code Yellows, missing patients, were so common they didn't even bother calling them on the overhead PA anymore. We would usually get a list of five to ten patients each night who had gone out on privileges and never come back, just hopped on a bus and left, or wandered off into the neighborhood across the street. Absconded was the official term we used. These missing patients made patrolling the hospital grounds at night even scarier, knowing an escaped mental patient could easily be hiding in a bush or in a tunnel down in the basement somewhere. I always just told myself they had absconded because they wanted to get away from the place. So why stick around? I had scared the jumpy records clerk, Rhonda, a number of times. During my patrols walking past her records room, she would see me out of the corner of her eye and jump, once even dropping the stack of paper she was holding and sending it flying into the air like a surprised cartoon character. She was pretty much the only one who worked on the lower level. I tried not to frighten her by startling her, but it was a bit of a running joke that she would jump whenever anyone passed by and said hello. The worst part of the basement to patrol was the really old section, at the far west end away from everything. It was isolated, and there was really no reason for anyone to go down there. There was a small alcove at the end with a pair of heavy old wooden doors. You had to walk down a short five-step staircase to get down to the alcove that looked like a lobby or waiting room for whatever was behind those doors. Whenever I walked past the alcove, my spine would break out into goosebumps. My whole body would tell me to get away. Our patrol check machine was at the top of the stairs just outside this creepy little vestibule. The patrol check machine was essentially what it sounded like, 
It was a machine that you would scan a swipe card against during your rounds. This way, the company knew you were doing your job, and walking around the hospital grounds doing your patrol, not just sitting in the office watching porno and reruns of The Office, as some night guards had been known to do. The patrol check machines were scattered all over the grounds, and twice per shift we had to visit all of them. It took about an hour and a half, depending on what you ran into during your route, to punch in at all of the machines. One pudgy old guard named Doug would just drive around in his car, hop out and punch in at each machine, then drive to the next one. He did this while he was training me. He told me not to do this, since it's not allowed. I explored the hospital by myself when I started on my own, and discovered 95% of the hospital was unchecked during his strangely absent patrol routes. One day, when I went to go punch in at the patrol check machine at the West End, I thought I heard something from down the stairs behind the old doors. It sounded like a small child crying. I went down the stairs and looked at the door handles. A two-inch thick chain was wrapped around them. The padlock was dusty, and the lock was laced with spider webs. I yanked on it briskly, but it was locked tight. My hands came away covered in gray dust and spider webs. No one had been in or out of the room for a very long time. I listened closely, thinking maybe it had just been the old pipes creaking, or an alarm chiming, something like that. I put my ear up to the thick wooden door. <laughs> there it was again. The unmistakable sniffling sounds of a young child crying. It sounded like a little girl. Hello? I called through the door, timidly, frightened of what I might hear call back to me. <laughs> Hello? Is someone there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm a security guard for the hospital. Are you okay? How did you get in there? I don't know. She began to speak quickly and unintelligibly before becoming understandable again. Lock the door. I can't see anything. It's so dark in here. I want my daddy. The child resumed sniffling and crying. I felt terrible for the little girl. Someone had probably come to visit a relative and left her alone, and she had wandered off to explore the mental hospital on her own. What kind of a parent could do something like that? She must have gotten in through a back tunnel somewhere, I thought. It was like the Clue Mansion around this place. Hidden tunnels were just a matter of course. I seemed to find a different, mysterious old section of the hospital every day, and side tunnels branched off in so many directions, it was nearly impossible to explore them all. Some were so dark, dusty, and cobweb-covered that it was obvious nobody had explored them for years. The place was so massive, it seemed like there was no end to the ancient and unusual sections that were no longer used, especially down in the basement. People in town called the hospital the sanatorium, and its mysterious tunnels had been the source of local rumors and legends for years. I'm going to get you out of there, kid. Just, just hang on for a few minutes. Can you do that for me? I paused and waited for her to answer back. She didn't. Hey, my name's Jordan, I said, softening my tone. What's yours? There was no response for a few long moments. Then the voice answered back. Samantha was all she would say. I looked at the key ring I had attached to my belt. It was the smaller ring, not the big one that had every conceivable key on it. This one had a copy of the GM, Grandmaster Key, which opened basically every door on the premises, aside from a few seldom used ones. Padlocks were an exception. These were not often opened, and locked off old, closed-off sections like this door, where we were not expected to go on our rounds so only the supervisor's ring held the keys for these locks. Behind these particular wooden doors was an old room which had once been used for electroshock therapy for pediatric patients. It had been closed up forever in the 1970s. Knowing I didn't have the right key for this lock, I pulled out my radio and called in to the supervisor. Nothing came back. In the basement, the radio signal was terrible, and our old walkie-talkies had range issues. I have to go upstairs to get help, Samantha. You're being very brave right now. I'm going to go get your dad and the key for this door, and we're going to get you out of there. I waited for a few moments, but she wasn't going to say anything. 
Who knew how long she'd been in there for? I bolted back up the hallway towards the staircase, pulling up my belt as I ran, the heavy keys and radio equipment jingling and rattling. I made it back to the main floor and called again on the radio for an answer. Hey, come in, Philip. I called over the radio, hailing my supervisor. A few long moments went by, and then I heard a crackle of static as his voice came back. Yeah, I'm here. I was about to tell him the situation when the PA beeped loudly overhead. A monotone, airline pilot voice spoke clearly and distinctly, and with evident boredom. Code white. E is an Edward III. Code white. E3. Code white. E is an Edward III. There was a loud click as the PA shut off. Perfect timing, I thought to myself. Philip, can you hear me? There's a kid down in the basement locked in a room. I, I heard the code white. What do you want me to do? I checked my watch, jotting the time quickly in my notepad. 2.43 p.m. My shift ended at 3 p.m. These things always happen just before quitting time. Whoa, okay. Um, we need to deal with one thing at a time. Is she safe? I'm all the way at the other end of the property. I need you to respond to the code white if you can. He didn't say what we were both thinking. That the only other security guard on duty was Doug. The disgruntled, overweight lifer who had trained me by driving me around the parking lot. He would not be a good person to rely on in an emergency. I'll just put it that way. His work ethic and motivation were... questionable. I honestly don't know. Who knows how long the kid has been stuck in that room? It's the one in the basement down at the west end behind those giant old wooden doors. Oh, wow. I could tell he knew the room I was talking about. There were a few guards who had bad feelings walking past it. I wasn't the only one. Okay, I'm going to run back. Just go to the Code White. I'll head to the basement, Philip said. I put the walkie-talkie back in its holster and ran down the hall, opening doors too quickly and bolting through them. I had to run to the other end of the main building, so it, it took me a few minutes to get there. One nurse shook her head at me as I walked into the unit and immediately threw some heavy shade my way. What are we even paying you guys for? We took care of it already. This particular nurse and I had never gotten along. She was an older RN named Marianne, who had worked there forever. She was the Queen Bee type, and during her shifts there was no doubt who was running the show. I walked further into the unit, ignoring her, and pulled out my notepad so I could fill out my report before going home. I talked to a male nurse quickly, anxious to get back to the basement. Yeah, it was weird. He was looking out the window, started freaking out, screaming, throwing his pudding at the wall. At least, that's what the roommate said. He's usually reliable enough. He pointed me in the direction of the roommate, Mike. I knew him from around the place. He was pleasant and kept to himself. He told me that he didn't see what had upset the other guy so much, but it was definitely something or someone outside that sent him into a frenzy. He had run away to get a nurse, and I told him he had done the right thing. With my notepad full of the requisite details, I hailed Philip on the radio again. Hey, bud, you get her out of there yet? Guess it's gonna take you a while to find the key, huh? There's nobody down here. I got the door open a minute ago. The room's empty. I swore and ran downstairs, trying to figure out how he had gotten the location wrong. I hadn't given him enough information, I realized. I got down to the basement and ran down the long corridor back to the west end. When I finally got there, I saw that he had gotten the location right after all. He was standing outside the room, dusting off his hands and looking at me. I left it open so you can take a look. No little girl. You sure you heard it coming from this room, not an air vent or something? I told him I was sure, and that we needed to call the police. I double-checked with my flashlight inside the terrifying room. Most of the old equipment had been removed, so it stood bare and dusty. The few remaining pieces of unidentifiable hardware bolted to the walls were covered in cobwebs. The feeling of dread I felt like an aura around the room intensified the longer I looked inside. I couldn't bring myself to step in there. I know, I'm a coward. But Philip told me he had checked, and I knew he was reliable. He was a volunteer constable with the police department on his days off, waiting for a real position to open up and trying to get his foot in the door. I stepped back, unsure how this was possible. Maybe the child had gotten out the same way she had gotten in. We checked, and no one had come to the hospital with a child named Samantha that day. No children had been in the building at all. 
The police took a report and said they would cross-reference the case if any girls named Samantha were reported missing. But at the moment, there weren't any open cases involving someone by that name in the area. We did a sweep of the basement and checked everywhere. I stayed three hours late, not caring if I would get paid for my time. The hospital was so large it felt like we were searching for a needle in a haystack. Doug even surprised me by staying late and helping to search, although he didn't cover a lot of ground. By the time we were done, Philip was looking at me strangely. You sure you heard a little girl behind these doors? The lock hadn't been touched for decades by the look of it. I don't see how anyone could have gotten in there. I left work feeling dejected, like people had begun to think I was crazy. But I had heard the little girl down in that room. I was 100% sure of that. The police assured us that they were going to follow up, but I couldn't help but think I was failing that little girl somehow. Where had she gone so suddenly? The next few days were strange. I had to switch over to night shift, as we did every two weeks. The lack of sleep and changeover played havoc with my circadian rhythm, and my brain always felt fuzzy and wrong for a few days, every time I switched from days to nights or back again. On my days off, I would be plagued by headaches that started as a dull ache behind my eyes, until they turned to gnawing migraines that forced me into darkened rooms to sit alone with my thoughts until I fell asleep. It was 3 a.m. on my second night shift when the phone rang in the switchboard office. It was so quiet I could hear the operator pick up the phone and answer the call from my seat three rooms over. Switchboard, Lisa speaking. Hello? Hello? Anyone there? She came back to the security office and I put down my pen. I had been working on a Sudoku puzzle that was seeming more like a hard difficulty than a medium, and I had only gotten one number down. That was weird, she said, popping her head in. What's that? Someone just called from the old trades building, but they didn't say anything. The trades building was one of the outbuildings that wasn't connected to the main hospital. Like many of those, it was old and in disrepair, no longer used for its intended purpose. It was now more of just an overflow storage space, with a couple of outdated workshops that the repairmen seldom used. I'll go check it out, I said, not relishing the prospect of walking out there by myself. The only other guard who wasn't locked in a control booth was Doug, and he was on his break trying to take a nap. I didn't want to wake him up, it was against our local customs. I walked out to the trades building in the brisk night air. It took a while to get out there, and I admired the stars as I walked. It was a full moon. Bats were flying in the sky above and hunting for bugs. I watched them and was surprised by their numbers. When I got out to the trades building, I looked at the window closest to me and thought I saw movement inside. I pulled out my walkie-talkie and called into the switchboard office, telling her to wake up Doug. Stand by to call the police as well. I think I saw movement in the building. Be careful, Jordan. If there's someone in there, it's probably better if you just wait for the police. It could be a burglar. I'm just going to peek in from the outside, see if I can see anything. I approached the building and started testing the doors to see if they were locked. I walked around the perimeter, putting my face up to the glass and looking inside. It appeared empty. I pulled out my radio and called back to the office, saying I was going to go check inside. The building looked unoccupied. Lisa told me the police were on their way and to be careful. She hadn't seen Doug in the break room, but he would have heard us on the radio by now, so probably would have started walking out to the trades building. At least that was my assumption. I unlocked the side door and walked in. Using my flashlight, I walked from room to room, checking inside each of them. I thought I heard something from the workshop ahead of me and to my right, and walked forward trying not to panic. I entered the room and looked around. It was filled with welding equipment. The door slammed shut behind me. I turned around, startled, my heart suddenly in my throat. How? I didn't even have time to complete the thought before something to my right caught my eye. It was a body on the ground, with a pool of fresh, bright blood surrounding it. I couldn't see where all the blood was coming from, but there was a lot of it. As I looked closer at the body on the ground, I saw she was far beyond my help. I recognized her face, too. It was Rhonda, the records clerk who worked in the basement. I could have imagined it, but as I stood there staring at her body, my jaw agape, 
I thought I heard the soft, playful laugh of a small girl from somewhere distant, yet somehow echoing in the room. The police arrived a few minutes later, after I called into the office to report what I had discovered. Doug waddled up to the scene about ten minutes after the police got there, looking sleepy and asking what he had missed. I told him and he did a double take, blinking his eyes and looking suddenly wide awake. Rhonda? Seriously? He looked really shaken for a moment. What was the scene in there like? Any ideas what might have happened? I told him about the door slamming shut behind me. He paused, then said the same thing had happened to him a couple times in that building. There was a constant draft in there. It seemed plausible, but I had never noticed it happening, and the timing of it had been spooky to say the least. I hadn't heard footsteps or anyone running away, though. I checked the halls just after that, too, and found them empty. Doug told me he recognized one of the cops from when he used to volunteer at the police station. He went over to them, saying he was going to try to get some more info for us. He sidled up to the crowd of police, and I was surprised to see that all of them immediately recognized him, and they seemed to be on friendly terms. He chatted with them jovially, and I was surprised to see him looking so animated and conversational. He'd always been a bit of a grouch in my experience, who kept to himself mostly and didn't talk much. The longer he stayed and talked with them, the more I began to realize he had no intention of coming back to talk to me. He seemed to have forgotten I was there. I walked back towards the hospital, slightly embarrassed and annoyed with him. A couple days later, it was like the whole incident had been forgotten. The death had been ruled a suicide, although the circumstances had seemed more than a bit suspicious to me. My story about the door slamming shut behind me, for instance, had been written off as a drafty building, just as Doug had suggested. For good measure, the entire hospital had been swept by a police search party. At least, that's what they said. I couldn't help but notice the old cobwebs remained untouched down long sections of derelict tunnels, where obviously the police hadn't ventured. It was understandable. The place was too massive to do a proper search, and there were too many areas locked off and dangerous due to the old and decaying construction. Another unsettling development was that Sam, the toady pedophile man, had absconded and not been seen for days. Since the day of the little girl's voice in the basement room, in fact. I had mentioned it to the police, but they appeared preoccupied now with Rhonda's apparent suicide, and they seemed less and less interested in what I had to say. They seemed to dismiss my thoughts as delusional. Besides, patients absconded all the time, as I've said before. Sam had disappeared at least a half dozen times before, each time turning up after riding the bus to the nearest major city, trying to blend in and disappear, and being unsuccessful at it. The cops were always on the lookout for him, so he was usually found relatively quickly. I mentioned to Philip, the supervisor, that Sam was missing, and I wondered if it could have something to do with the little girl in the basement. I complained that the police hadn't searched the tunnels properly, and she could still be down there somewhere. Do you want to go down there and search those tunnels? Because I can give you a flashlight, but I'm sure as hell not going with you. Philip snapped at me. I had never seen him angry with a coworker before. He was one of the nicest people I knew in the hospital. I tried to ask him if I had done something wrong, but he just huffed and walked away as if it was a stupid question. Despite the tension between Philip and I, there was still the matter of training the new hire who had just joined the team. He was in the room during the exchange between Philip and me, sitting there awkwardly. His name was Matt, and he looked to be in his early 20s. His longish brown hair was slicked back with far too much hair gel, and he looked a bit white in the face. There had been a lot of action around here recently. I had a feeling he wouldn't last long. Sorry about that, Matt, I said. Usually this place is a lot tamer, really. Uh-huh, he said, looking unconvinced. Let's go out for a patrol. I, I think you'll see this place isn't so bad. Our first patrol was uneventful. The sun had faded behind the horizon, but we still had enough daylight to finish walking to the outbuildings and back before it got dark. As we walked past an old house on the outer edge of the property, Matt pointed and asked, oh, What's in that building? That's Century Manor, I told him. That's where the patients lived over a hundred years ago. Back in the days when the mental patients had to grow their own food, cook their own meals, and pay the hospital's overhead costs with their labor, making clothes and blankets to sell at markets in the city. Well, how do you know all this stuff? He asked. There are educational posters hanging up in the lobby with big black-and-white photos of the hospital back in those days, I said. 
That building has been boarded up for decades, though. No one goes in or out. What's with the little girl up in the window, then? He asked. I looked up in surprise, my heart pounding. Where? I grabbed hold of his collar, shaking him. I don't know, maybe I was just seeing things, I don't know. I thought I saw a little girl up in that window, right there. I looked up at the window where he was pointing, but didn't see anything. We checked all the doors, but they were fastened tight with chains and padlocks. Just like the room in the basement, I thought. I hailed Philip on the radio. He was working for another hour and still had the big key ring. He called back, sounding annoyed. What do you want? Matt says he thinks he saw a little girl on the top floor of Century Manor, looking out the window at us. Considering the events of the last few days, do you think maybe we should check it out? <sighs> I'll call the police. They can check it out. Just come back to the office when you get a chance. I need to trade key sets with you so I can go home. The nightly ritual was for the supervisor to give the big key ring to the night guard, so they had it in case of emergency. The smaller set of keys would be locked in a drawer for safekeeping. I wished I could stay to check the house with the police, but who knew how long it would take for them to come. I called up to the back window a few times, seeing if I could get the girl to come back, but she didn't. We hung around for as long as we could, then finished our patrol and made our way back to the office. Philip gave me the bigger set of keys, saying the police had been to the house and checked it out right after we left. It was empty, of course. He looked even more pissed off now than before, as if my actions were somehow jeopardizing his future career with the police force. I resolved to check all the doors and windows of Century Manor when we got back out there for our late night patrol. If there was a window or door open, or another secret way in, we would find it. I considered just using the key on the big ring, but was worried about going into the house. It was condemned and falling apart. The floors and ceilings were no longer considered safe to bear weight, and were reportedly sagging and buckling in places. I had never been inside. It was against protocol because of the safety concerns. I spent the next few hours in the office showing Matt how to file an incident report, how to call in a code white, and other essential things he would need to know to do his job. There wasn't really that much, and I felt a bit empty inside when I realized I was done and had showed a stranger off the street how to do my job in a few hours. I had no delusions about my job security. I was highly replaceable. I told Matt we would start on our next patrol, and we put on our radio belts and headed out the door telling Lisa where we were going in case there was a code. We made our way hastily around the hospital. I checked the doors on the right to make sure they were locked, and Matt checked the doors on the left. A quick pull on each doorknob before moving on to the next one. The security guard shuffle. We made it outside and I headed straight for Century Manor, even though that wasn't my usual route. I had a bad feeling. I had to see what was there for myself. When we got to the building, we did our doorknob dance, walking around the outside, checking the windows visually as we went. When I got to the back door, the last one to check, I pulled on the doorknob and felt it was locked. How sure are you it was a kid you saw up in that window? Uh, pretty sure. I mean, uh, yeah, looked like it. I know eyes can play tricks sometimes, though, right? When I looked back up there and she was gone, it seemed like I must have imagined it, though. Why? I took a deep breath. He knew why. I'm going inside. I think you should stay out here. It's not safe in there, and what I'm about to do is against the rules, big time. He didn't argue. I turned around, and after a few minutes of trial and error, found the right key. The lock turned with an effort. I opened the door and looked inside. I told Matt that if I didn't come out in a few minutes, he should call the police. We each had a radio, but I turned the volume on mine down. If there was someone else in there with the little girl, I didn't want them to know I was coming. I stepped inside, and the smell of mildew and old dust filled my nostrils. It was pitch black inside. I walked forward with my flashlight in my hand, looking above me in dismay at the sagging ceiling above. The room I entered looked like a very old kitchen, with every appliance and counter covered in a thick layer of dust and debris. I tried to be silent. Remembering an old detective book for kids I had read when I was younger that had said to stick to the sides of hallways and staircases in old houses to avoid making them creak when trying to be sneaky. I made my way deeper into the house and found the staircase to the right of the main entrance. I was about to go up the stairs since that was where Matt had seen the girl last when I heard something from below me. It sounded like a little girl laughing. 
or maybe she was crying. Turning around, I made my way back to the middle of the house where I had seen stairs leading to the basement. I walked down them slowly and stuck to the sides, the edges where it didn't creak so much. As I got down to the basement, I heard the sound again. It was a little girl, and she sounded like she was laughing, not crying. I was afraid, but my curiosity drew me down the stairs, and I found myself on the pitch black lower level. I continued deeper into the dungeon-like basement, the cold stone floor wet beneath my feet. The smell down here was worse, damp and moldy, with something else acrid and unidentifiable beneath. I walked forward and entered a large room. I saw at the other end a little girl swinging her legs, sitting on the edge of a plastic-wrapped table, and smiling broadly. My throat was choked with fear, and I found myself unable to speak. There was someone else in the room as well. I could hear them moving around. I went in further and stopped dead in my tracks when I saw the scene on the floor. Someone was down on their hands and knees, sawing away with a hacksaw at the upper arm of what appeared to be Sam, the toad-like pedophile man. A pile of limbs were set aside, and as he finished off detaching the arm, he threw it onto the floor. The floor was covered with tarps and plastic sheets, as were the walls and everything else in the area. Blood spatter stood out stark red against the white and blue background of plastic. Daddy, look! Someone came to our clubhouse to play with us! Can I play surgeon and you be the nurse this time, Daddy, please? The man stood up and I realized with a shock that it looked like Doug, his face obscured mostly by shadows. Of course. Fucking Doug. No wonder everyone had been treating me so strangely. Doug was a lunatic who had been gaslighting them all behind my back, telling them I was bonkers, that I had been acting really weird and maybe I should see someone, a professional someone. He had talked to the cops and convinced them of his bullshit, door-slamming, must-have-been-the-goddamn-wind story, of his Rhonda suicide theory, and who knew what other lies he could have been feeding them. I looked around and noticed the windows down here were all boarded up so no one could see in from the outside. He must have made a key from the big ring when he was alone on night shift so he could come and go as he pleased. Before Doug could do anything, I ran out of there as fast as I could, to the sound of Samantha giggling behind me. They didn't even try to chase me, just let me go. I ran outside and pulled Matt away from the house, taking out my phone and dialing 911. It took three attempts, my hands were shaking so badly. The cops came in record time as I watched the back of the house and Matt watched the front. We called into Switchboard and asked them to send additional staff for backup support. By the time the police arrived, there was a crowd of 20 nurses, security guards, healthcare aides, and myself standing outside the old house, with more arriving by the minute. My story had gotten around to everyone. They all knew there was a killer inside. The thing is, the police went in SWAT style and came out 20 minutes later shaking their heads. There was no one in the basement or anywhere in the house. The place was dangerous, with the ceilings looking ready to cave in any second, so they didn't spend more than an hour inside searching. Each one who came out had a strange look on their face for me and I heard them talking softly to each other with their backs turned away from me, glancing my way occasionally and trying not to point. The whole time I kept thinking, they have to find something down there. A bloody hacksaw, a severed finger, something. Staff members had started heading back to the hospital, shaking their heads and whispering to each other. Matt said he hadn't seen anything, although he conveyed his possible sighting of a girl on the second floor earlier, saying he hadn't been sure what he had seen. I was accused of filing a false police report, a serious charge, but they ended up dropping it later, after my psych evaluation. I was suspended from work pending an investigation. I had numerous meetings with bigwigs at headquarters, always with union representatives present, who had lots of good ideas on how to allow me to keep my job. They suggested I go see a psychiatrist. The doctor examined me and promptly diagnosed me with severe PTSD. He said he couldn't determine the source of my childhood trauma without extensive talk therapy, but explained that I experienced a, a flashback of the event, something horrible in my past. He prescribed me some medication which I pretended to take, a bright yellow and white capsule with a blue oblong tablet. I eventually was allowed to come back to work, but no one treated me the same. I was told Doug had left, citing personal reasons for his departure, 
saying his young daughter had health issues. When I asked what her name was, I was told to mind my own business. There was no record of either of them on Google, either. I wanted to see a picture of her to compare her to the little girl I'd seen in the basement. One day, shortly after I returned from my suspension, another security guard, a wise older man from Afghanistan, who had been a chemistry professor back home, said something that stuck with me. Do you know, Jordan? He said, his voice thickly accented. We become like the people we surround ourselves with. The people we spend time with. And here, we're surrounded by mental patients. He left me to sit with the idea, saying but not saying who he was referring to. I just can't help but wondering, what's down in the tunnels below the hospital? Is there a sub-basement below the basement? I know I've seen stairs leading downwards from the basement into what appeared to be a mechanical section. Is there a tunnel or tunnels down there that no one knows about? One that goes from Century Manor to the main building, to the trades building, and to the west end of the basement? I'm determined to find out. Doug is not going to get away with this. Things didn't go well at work after the incident at Century Manor. I was transferred from my post on patrol duty and reassigned to the access control booth for one of the maximum security wings. I was told to sit in a glass box, the size of a small bedroom, and push buttons to engage and disengage magnetic locks, opening doors to allow access to the unit. The dozens of monitors in front of me showed me staff coming and going, looking up impatiently at the camera, waiting for me to hit five, then four, then three, to unlock the corresponding doors. There were five thick steel doors to get through the entrance. To get through each door, the previous one had to be closed properly first. The doors never closed right, though, so people got stuck, then gave impatient looks to the camera until I'd politely say, check the door behind you, I don't think it closed properly, into my decades-old intercom system. I was always locked in my booth, so all I could do was watch as they struggled to comprehend my garbled instructions. The staff on the unit was nice enough at first, saying hi and good morning as they'd come in for their shifts. I'd smile back and wave and buzz them through the doors. But it was only hours before I became a background fixture in my booth, and people would walk through the inspection area and pass my desk without even glancing at me, expecting the doors to open as if by magic. Doctors and nurses passed through, chins in the air, ignoring my desperate attempts at pleasant conversation and rapport building. I have a complex. I really need people to like me. It's a sickness. Still, I didn't mind it at first. I was locked in the most secure part of the hospital, so I felt totally safe at least. Doug was still on the loose, and the police were in his back pocket, as was Philip, my supervisor. Although Doug no longer worked in the hospital, I suspected he wasn't far away. For all I knew, he and his demented daughter lived beneath the hospital, in an undiscovered tunnel system somewhere. Why else would Samantha have called that room in the old manor a clubhouse? I shuddered, thinking back to the bloodbath in the basement. And how else could they have disappeared with all the exits covered? I wasn't about to venture back into Century Manor anytime soon, though, that was for sure. I didn't trust those buckled and sagging ceilings, and I definitely didn't like the memories I had of the place. I didn't always hide in my booth, though, as we'd switch out with a patrol officer each day for a couple of hours to do a quick patrol and take a half-hour lunch break. I enjoyed getting out in the fresh air, but the indoor parts of my patrol were difficult and filled me with anxiety. The grounds never ceased to surprise me, as I would discover a new section almost every day. The place was labyrinthian. When I patrolled the basement, I would feel constantly terrified. I would hear steps coming from a distance, and my mouth would go dry. My legs would stop working, and I'd have to force myself to move forward. I knew Doug wanted me dead. I was the only one who knew his secret. Fortunately, I had no address or personal information listed online. No way for the two of them to find me. Still, one night I could have sworn I'd heard the high and melodious laugh of a familiar little girl from just outside my apartment, down below on the street level. I had looked outside and had seen no one there. It was unnerving, to say the least. One happy accident that came out of my reassignment to the control booth outside E3 
was that it had led to a discovery of a way into the sub-basement. I checked the mechanical section of the basement that had been my first hunch, but found the stairs which descended from that room led down to a new section of isolated mechanical rooms, full of a lot of machinery but nothing else. No tunnels, no secret passages either. At least it looked that way to me. The fresh cinder block walls had no visible gaps or irregularities. The following day in the control booth, however, I had called the repairman to investigate a noise. It had been coming from an area up a ladder and through a hatch in the ceiling of the control room. The noise had become a constant nuisance to me. It was an impossibly loud droning and grinding noise, which I believed to be coming from a malfunctioning fan or something similar. Occasionally it would rise in pitch to a screeching squeal that would attack my eardrums for hours, causing a painful headache in the process. I had peeked up there and seen the area was vast, filled with mechanical equipment, giant fans, and air conditioning units. It opened up to the roof and fresh air beyond that. I noticed an old steel cage elevator, likely about a hundred years old, off in the distance. Another relic that had been left to decay atop the sanatorium, like the electroshock therapy room below in the basement where I'd first met Samantha. That gave me an idea. Maybe that old elevator accessed areas no longer accessible by stairs or the more modern elevators in the building. It was worth a shot. A man from the engineering department arrived after I called to complain about the sound and asked him about the elevator. He shrugged, saying it didn't work and had been locked up for as long as he could remember with a padlock and chain. I resolved to get in there somehow. An opportunity presented itself quickly enough when Matt, the new guard, came to relieve me for a break. He had already been entrusted with the big key ring and passed it off to me so I could get where I needed to go on my break. That was when I had a flash of inspiration. I told him I was going up to the roof for a smoke, even though I'm not a smoker. He didn't know that. He didn't argue, just passed me the keys and told me to have a good break. I climbed up the ladder and found the key for the rusty padlock after trying a dozen different ones. I opened up the lock and unwound the heavy chain from the outside of the elevator which held it closed. With a large, flathead screwdriver that a repairman had left behind, I managed to pry open the doors slightly. It took all of my effort since they were heavy and rusted, almost seized, but I managed to pull them open all the way. I took a deep breath and got in. The lever to the left of the door was ancient, pitted and rusting, but had an additional level on it that I had never seen in the other elevators in the building. In this elevator, below B1, was B2. A sub-basement, just as I had suspected. The legendary underground tunnels of the sanatorium, source of the haunted stories which were passed off around town as myths and urban legends. I hesitated for a minute. I wasn't just curious to see what was down there. I, I needed to see what was down there. But my arm wouldn't let me pull the lever. The deep-down lizard part of my brain was telling me to leave, to run, and to never come back to this place. I found myself walking out of the elevator, but then, against my better judgment and all rational common sense, ignored my fears and got back in. I just had to see what was down there for myself. I pulled the dingy bronze lever downwards. Decades of thick spider webs stretched and tore as they came with it. The steel cage shook and heaved, sending me off balance into the steel bars behind me. With an alarming squeal, it began to descend. Gradually, the sound faded and the car shook and rattled its way down. I could see out through the steel bars as I dropped down into the darkness. I pulled out my flashlight and turned it on. After a minute, the car stopped and I let out my breath. As I inhaled, I immediately regretted going down there. The smell was horrible, like the stench in the basement of Century Manor, but worse. It was a fleshy, pungent smell of decaying and rotting meat, left out for months or years even. I pulled my shirt up over my nose, but that made little difference. I willed myself forward and found flies were buzzing and swarming all around me. There were hundreds of them, thousands. No wonder the hospital always had such an insect problem. The cafeteria was always swarming with big, nasty flies landing on your food and buzzing around your head while you ate. Patients would complain about them constantly, saying they were coming out of the vents. I had always chalked it up to delusion. As I walked forward, I realized I had not come prepared for this. I needed a gas mask or a respirator. 
I felt like I couldn't breathe, especially not with the flies buzzing around my head and flying up my nose and into my mouth. I felt like I was close, though. If I could get some proof, I could show that I wasn't crazy, that Doug had killed Rhonda, the records keeper, and Sam, the toady pedophile patient. I suddenly wondered how many others who had absconded and never come back were really victims of Doug and his demented daughter. They had probably hidden numerous bodies down there, which accounted for the smell. My flashlight beam lit on something unusual carved into the wall, and I stopped for a moment to look. Someone had engraved their initials into the wall with a knife. DL plus MB forever was encircled by a heart. Weird. Wasn't Doug's last name Lambert? Could DL be Doug Lambert? And if so, who was MB? I continued on and saw up ahead was a split in the tunnel. It went three different ways. Each direction looked like it went on for a long, long ways. I checked my phone. I had already been gone for half an hour. Where had time gone? My break was already over. I would have to come back when I had more time. I took the key for the elevator lock off the keychain and put it into my pocket. I turned around and walked back to the elevator car. When I got there, my heart stopped in my chest. Standing there, snickering in the elevator, was Samantha. How had she made it past me? She smiled at me deviously and pulled the lever. The car began to rise, leaving me in the lightless tunnels below the hospital. She giggled as the elevator rose up and out of sight, and then she disappeared from view, leaving me drenched in darkness. As if on cue, the light from my flashlight began to fade and flicker, and I realized with dismay it was due for a battery change. How stupid of me to go down there on a whim, not even planning enough to bring back up batteries for my only flashlight. If I died down there, I thought, I would deserve it for my lack of preparation. My childhood Boy Scout leader would be so disappointed if he could see me right now. I could hope that Matt would set someone down to look for me, but Samantha had probably gone up and locked the elevator again so that it looked the same as always. It seemed that there was no way to call the elevator down from here. The whole thing was operated from inside the box. No one knew I was down there, so no one would come looking for me. The walkie-talkie had no reception, as per usual. My cell phone had no bars and said service interruption at the top. My only choice was to walk forward and look for another exit. I made my way back to the intersection and decided to head right, thinking that would take me underneath E-Wing, where maybe there was a ladder or something I could use to climb out. I would have to take my chances and hope this wouldn't lead me to a booby trap set up by Doug. I had a feeling he was expecting me, though. Somehow. I continued along, trying to ignore the mice and rats that I began to notice scurrying here and there. Didn't see those before, I thought. My flashlight flickered off again, and I almost had a panic attack when it went out for a few seconds, leaving me in total darkness. I shook it, and it refused to come back on. I shook it again, banging it against my palm hard enough to leave a mark. It lit up again, reluctantly and dimly. I let out a shaky breath and continued forward. I heard a noise from behind me and spun around, only to see a big rat noisily chewing on something. It made a crunching noise. I shone my flashlight in the rat's direction and it scampered away, but I caught a glimpse of a dehydrated human finger in its mouth, covered in old blood and bite marks. I shuddered and picked up the pace. I kept walking and eventually saw what I was looking for, a ladder leading up to a hatch in the ceiling. I climbed it quickly and turned the handle, pushing up. It wouldn't budge. I had another moment of sheer panic when I thought, there could be a fridge on top of this hatch for all you know. They might have retiled the floor right over top, sealing you in here forever. What did you think was going to happen? You're obviously going to die down here and be eaten by rats, mice, bugs... And Doug. I forced my shoulder into the hatch with all my might and it budged an inch. I pushed again the same way and managed to get it up high enough to squeeze my arm and shoulder out. I wiggled and squirmed out through the small gap I had made and managed to pull myself out onto the basement floor. I lay there defeated. How could I ever bring myself to go back down there? And yet, strangely, I felt like I couldn't stay away. Once I got home from work... All I wanted to do was go down there again. It felt like an itch that needed to be scratched. 
the headaches were back again after that. I didn't realize at the time that this was odd, but I couldn't help but think that the darkness in those tunnels would be kind of soothing. I could almost picture myself lying down and taking a nap on the filthy floor down there. When you have a migraine, there's nothing better than lying in a dark room and closing your eyes. The sub-basement was about as pitch black a place as I had ever seen. And I wanted to go back down there. If only so I could explore it properly. The key was in my pocket. All I had to do was sneak back to the elevator when no one was watching. The next night I came to work prepared. Not just for my night shift, but to explore the sub-basement tunnels afterwards. My backpack held an extra flashlight, an 8-pack of batteries, and a can of anti-rust spray for the elevator and locks along the way. I also brought water, food, lighters, and matches, plus a couple of candles for good measure. Included was a large knife, which I would put around my waist once I got down there. I was wishing I had a gun. On the other hand, bullets ricochet, and who knows where one might end up if I fired a pistol down there. I could easily end up shooting myself since I had no firearms knowledge or experience. Unlike most of the security guards around the hospital, I had no aspirations to become a cop. My plan was simple. I would work my night shift, and then at 7am when the day guard came on, I would tell him I was going up to the roof for a smoke, and that I would go back down another ladder to the hospital entrance to get out and leave for the day. Matt hadn't seemed bothered or concerned when I had used the excuse on him, and he was the one coming in to relieve me, so I didn't think it would be an issue. I would use the key I had stolen to go back down to the elevator and explore. My headache was pounding, getting worse by the hour. It no longer went away completely when I slept, instead hanging around in my dreams. My dream self would complain about it to my dream companions. The dreams would turn to nightmares, and I would have visions of myself chained to a post in the basement of Century Manor, of ice picks and sledgehammers being pounded into my skull. By Doug, of course. His daughter laughing happily while she watched, swinging her legs excitedly from atop the plastic-wrapped table where she perched, asking, Can I help, Daddy? Can I pull out his tongue next, please? I would wake and the sun from outside my window would assault me immediately. I'd feel like a knife was being driven into my skull. I had started taking four and five codeine painkillers at a time, and my head was getting fuzzy from the constant narcotic effect. They did little to help, though. When the time came at the end of my shift, I was ready. Matt came in, and we had a quick chat and discussed the issues of the night before. There hadn't been any. It had been quiet aside from another six patients had gone missing. Everyone assumed they had absconded, but I knew it might not have been that simple. Marianne, the queen bee nurse who worked on E3, interrupted us by buzzing, no pun intended, to get out of the unit. Her shift was over. She looked up at the camera expectantly and waited for the click of the magnetic lock. I rolled my desk chair over, wheeling halfway across the room with one quick push of my legs. I hit the five button, then the four, and she came out into the alcove in front of us, separated from us by the glass window and a locked steel door. The alcove was where we would pass out a metal detector for the nurses to wave over the patients as they came back in from their jaunts outside the unit. Their privileges. It was a medium-sized glass-walled room where patients and staff entered and exited the unit. I was about to look back at Matt when I noticed Marianne was smiling broadly at me. I was surprised and did a quick double-take. She had always hated me, I thought though I couldn't determine why. The smile she had on now was different from the one she used on patients, when she was trying to get them to do something they didn't want to do. That one faded immediately when she turned around. I had seen it on camera the night before, on one of the many monitors in my booth. A patient hadn't wanted to take his medication. She had said a few words to him, smiling with faux friendliness, and then he took the pills and swallowed them dry. She would then turn and look up at the camera, no longer smiling. This grin, on the other hand, looked genuine, and I was surprised to see she actually looked radiant, her white hair streaming out behind her as she walked. Good night, Jordan, she said as she walked up to door number three. It was morning, but when you work nights, that's what you say as you leave, as well as the prerequisite, have a good sleep, which she tacked on next. She was actually being friendly. 
I could hardly believe it. I found myself smiling back before I could stop myself. As I've said, I have a sickness. I always need people to like me. You too. I waved at her and buzzed her through doors three, two, and one so she could get out. I looked back at Matt and saw him eyeing me strangely. Yo, you two sure are chummy, he said. That one's been a complete bitch to me since I started here. She called me an idiot the other day because the door got stuck. I told him we had never really gotten along either, and that it was strange she was so nice to me all of a sudden. But maybe she was just happy to go home for the day. I finished my report and told him my cover story. I was going up to the roof for a smoke, then would take another ladder down out the front entrance to get home. He looked a bit more suspicious this time. I realized suddenly that my excuse was more unusual than I had planned, but eventually he said, sure. I climbed up the ladder with my backpack, his eyes watching me the whole time, his brow furrowed. I got up to the roof and found the old elevator, chained up just as it had been before. I took the ancient key out of my pocket and gave the lock a spray with the lubricant canister I had brought. I opened it up and I sprayed the elevator down with it as well, trying to get any moving parts. The last thing I wanted was to get stuck in that thing, as I'd probably die in there before anyone found me. Prying open the elevator doors, I got inside. I sprayed down the lever that controlled the box and pulled the lever down to B2. The cage rattled and shook, but not as violently this time, and I managed to stay on my feet. I felt the box descend slowly again into the darkness. As I got down to the lower level, I found myself not wanting to turn on my flashlight. The darkness and cool air felt good, and I felt my headache fading instantly. I wondered if my eyes would adjust down there if I gave them a few moments. The cage stopped with a sudden jolt, and I nearly fell over. I grabbed the steel bars and righted myself. I left the door closed for a minute to protect me while I waited for the dim outlines of the walls to appear. After several minutes, I finally was able to see slightly. My headache was gone, leaving not a trace of discomfort. It was the best I had felt since, well, since I had been down in the tunnels last. It was weird, but the flies and the smell didn't seem as bad this time. My brain fuzzy from lack of sleep and the effects of too many painkillers. I walked forward and brushed my right hand against the walls as I walked, feeling its bumpiness and age with my fingertips. I finally came across the familiar graffiti. DL plus MB forever. I felt the carving with my fingers for a moment, like a pilgrim on a holy trek, touching a sacred object, and then moved on. I came to the intersection and already knew where I was going straight ahead into what I presumed to be the longest section of tunnel leading into the meat of the hospital. Rats and mice streamed past my feet and I felt them brush against my legs, but they didn't bother me. The tunnel went on for a long time until another intersection, and then I was a little less clear about where I wanted to go. I hesitated, and was about to go left when I heard Samantha's high-pitched laugh from far up ahead in the distance. Following the sound, I continued forward. At least I wouldn't get lost if I just kept going straight, I thought. The tunnel continued on for another long stretch, mirroring the never-ending hallways in the basement above. It helped that I knew the hospital so well, so I wasn't scared of becoming lost. I would just picture the basement above me and use it as a guide. That plan went to hell when I came across a hole in the side of the tunnel. It appeared to have been carved out roughly and imperfectly by the crude tools of amateurs. It opened up into a tunnel which headed downwards. The walls of this new tunnel were dirt, and appeared to have been dug in the same rough fashion. It was narrower too, and I found I had to get down on my hands and knees, even my belly in places, to get through. I elbowed my way past rats and mice, and they nipped at my hands playfully. They seemed friendly, and I wanted them to like me, so I let them. The stench was no longer bothering me, I noticed. I couldn't even smell it anymore. The flies had become thicker, blanketing my face and tickling my eyeballs as they skittered across them. I didn't swat them away, just continued crawling forward. Eventually I came into an opening. It was dim, but my eyes slowly took in all the details. It appeared to be the vast cavern of a cave system beneath the hospital. There was what appeared to be a natural rock formation which resembled a ramp leading downwards. 
I walked down slowly, watching my footing as the dirt slipped away beneath my feet occasionally, threatening to send me sliding off into the deep, dark pit I noticed to my right. I stayed close to the rock wall on my left, leaning against it for comfort. I've always been afraid of heights. I finally got down to the floor of the cave and saw several tunnels open up before me. I had no idea which one to go through next. I was at a crossroads again. I looked around and saw more details coming into focus in the darkness. In the area to my right was a shallow pit, filled with dead bodies. Too many to count. The flies were gorging on them, making nests of eggs in the soft, rotting flesh as they decayed. Millions of maggots were squirming everywhere, all throughout the pile. Normally, that sort of thing would bother me. I heard Samantha's laugh from behind me, close this time, and hands grabbed me before I could react. I saw human forms appear from the shadows and realized they had been waiting for me down here. They had blended in with the shapes of the cave. I hadn't even seen them standing a few feet away from me. As the person behind me zip-tied my wrists, expertly, not too loose or tight, I saw a face come into focus before my eyes. I was startled to see it was Mary Ann, the nurse from E3, the Queen Bee. Hello, Jordan. So glad to see you, she purred. We were hoping you would come down to meet us. We've been waiting for you. I looked around in shock to see there were more than a few of them living down below the mental hospital. There were a dozen of them at the very least. And more came into focus every second I looked. We've lived down here for a long time, she said. Some, like you, can quickly adjust to things down here. With a little bit of help. You were built for it. Our ancestors were cave dwellers, you know. For thousands of years along the way, during ice ages, people lived in caves. This is how it was meant to be all along. Her words were soothing, hypnotic. She stroked the side of my face and I felt my body tingle all over. You can cut him loose, Doug, she said. I felt a knife cut loose the restraints which held my wrists. I stood there looking at her as she spoke. Flies crawled all over her face and body, in and out of her nose. You need to understand, though. We have to eat. And some are not meant to live with us down here. Sam, for instance. I thought back to the basement of Century Manor. The piles of body parts stacked like fresh butcher cuts lined up on the tarp. So it appeared that Sam, the toady pedophile patient had been a potential member of this group. But he hadn't made the cut. They fulfill other purposes. He wasn't like us. And besides, we could have never trusted him alone with the children. You understand. I nodded, entranced. A thought popped into my head. I tried to swat it away, but it persisted. I had to ask. What about Rhonda? I asked, still under her spell, just barely able to get the words out. She smiled at me flirtatiously and touched my shoulder with her hand. I melted under her gaze and felt my knees buckle. How old was she? Her face looked so young, but her hair told a different story. I wondered if the lack of light down here kept you looking young longer. No sunspots or wrinkles when there's no sun, I thought sleepily. I was suddenly getting very tired. I just wanted so badly to take a nap. Marianne never did answer my question, at least not that I can remember. Instead, she led me over to a soft spot on the ground with a pillow. I lay down in the dirt and put my head down, falling asleep instantly. I slept for a few hours, according to my phone when I woke up. The light from the screen was far too bright and it hurt my eyes. I went back to sleep and didn't really wake up again after that for a long time. My eyes were open, but my mind was shut off. I turned into a drone bee. 
following the commands of the Queen for the next two months. I kept having the same dream. I woke up covered in cold sweat, my heart racing. The tunnels where we lived were cold and damp, dark and empty. The sounds of my movements echoed down the long passageways and cracks of the cave. In my dream, Marianne is looking at me with disbelief in her eyes. Her face is pale and full of shock. She reaches down and feels the cold steel blade I plunged into her belly and tries to say, Why? But all that comes out is blood. I say to her, Because of Rhonda. But who the hell is Rhonda? More of the dream came back to me in bits and pieces. I was walking down a long hallway, one that seemed to never end. I was stopping at the doors as I came across them, twisting the doorknobs, moving on after making sure each one was locked. I just wanted so badly for one of them to be unlocked. Another image, this time I was running down the same hallway, something heavy around my waist rattling and clanging metallically. The nightmare always made me feel dizzy and made me want to vomit. I rolled from my bunk and got up and went to the pantry. Samantha was there. She couldn't sleep either, she told me. Another nightmare? She asked. I nodded my head. I still hadn't told her what it was, but maybe she already knew. She had confessed she also had dreams of killing her mother, Marianne. It didn't make sense, though. Why would we both dream of killing her? We all loved Marianne. She wasn't just Samantha's mother, she was the matriarch, the, the leader of the tunnel folk. I asked Samantha why she couldn't sleep. She told me she had that same nightmare again. The one where she kills her mother. Can I trust you with something? I asked. Of course. I've been having the same dream, I said. You? Since when? She looked surprised. For as long as I can remember. I told her. A thought flickered briefly in my mind, and I tried desperately to grasp it, but it was gone too quickly. I felt panic and claustrophobia for a moment. Sheer dread and the weight of all the rocks and earth above us weighing down on me like a million billion tons. And then the feeling passed with a wave of relief. She seemed to think about something for a second. Do you remember when you came down here? She asked that sense of dread again, claustrophobic and full of fear. I swallowed my feelings and spoke. Bits and pieces, I said. I was injured, right? That's, that's what Marianne said. I, I'd been hurt and left to die. I was attacked by... By what? I don't remember. A patient, said Marianne, walking in and surprising us both. He attacked you, and we found you and brought you down here. We revived you, nursed you back to health. And you decided to stay and help support the group. Oh, right. I said shakily. Of course, now I remember. I still didn't remember. Come back to bed now, Marianne whispered in my ear. I felt my legs go wobbly, and I suddenly wanted to do whatever she said. The Queen Bee had that effect on everyone. Man or woman. Okay, I whispered back weakly. I followed her to the bunk room where the crowd of us lived and huddled together for warmth at night. Our bodies were like a living furnace, and those who didn't join in were left alone in the cool dampness of the cave. I dozed off and slept fitfully. It felt like all we did down in the tunnels was sleep. The activities in the caves consisted of the following options help carry water from the spring, roast human remains over the fire for communal mealtime, wash clothes in the water downstream from the spring, take a nap, take a dump in the pit of dead bodies no longer suitable for eating, assist with initiation of new members, sleep some more, assist with murdering of any new members who don't take well to cannibalism and or perpetual darkness. And that was about it. 
It was starting to get monotonous and felt more and more revolting and wrong with each passing day. I pondered my life while struggling to sleep and began to get that feeling again. All I wanted suddenly was to go up that ramp past the pit of dead bodies. I couldn't figure out why. It was forbidden, Marianne said. There was nothing but pain and misery up there, she said. But for some reason I didn't believe her. Why could I remember nothing past a few weeks ago? She said I had been a patient in the old mental hospital above us, but that didn't feel right. I was something else. Something different. I thought back to the face of the man who had been killed by the group earlier that day. He hadn't done well in the darkness. Hadn't been able to cope with the cannibalism, and he'd lost it. He tried to escape. So the clan had killed him, cut off his arms and legs, roasted them over the fire, and eaten them for dinner. No one had told me his name, but somehow I knew it anyways. Mike, a patient from the mental hospital above us. One of the good ones. I had spoken to him up there, had been acquaintances with him almost, I thought. But that didn't feel quite right. The image of the hallway flashed before my eyes again, and I imagined myself trying a door handle, moving on to the next one, testing that one, moving on to the next. Like I had done at work, I realized. The security guard shuffle. My heart began to hammer as images of my life came back to me, and with it that weight, that pressure from above, the million billion tons of rock and dirt above me, ready to come crashing down. I realized I was hyperventilating again. I didn't want Marianne to see. I looked and saw she was laying there, completely still. Her bed was up above us all on an elevated rock shelf, overlooking the large room, the cavern where we slept. Up there with her was Doug, and whoever else was in her good graces. They had blankets, a mattress, and pillows as well, which I suddenly coveted with increasing resentment. I wasn't a mental patient at all, I realized. In my mind, I imagined the door from my dream. The one I wanted so badly to open. Finally, I imagined the doorknob turn in my grip and the door swung open, revealing a room with a couple worn desk chairs, a computer, a coat rack, and a charging station for walkie-talkies. The security office. I was a security guard in the old mental hospital above and they had brainwashed me somehow into venturing down here. They had kept me here by means of drugging me, and the rest I still couldn't figure out, and my still fuzzy mind just didn't understand. I had to find a way to escape. Samantha would help me. I had a feeling she would. She wanted out as well, I could tell. We would find a way out together, and, and I would get her some help. We needed to formulate a plan first, though. I suddenly remembered the elevator up the ramp and through the basement tunnels, but realized quickly that wouldn't work. There was no way to call it from the basement. Then I recalled the hatch, the one I had crawled up out of and escaped through once before. Another memory suddenly occurred to me. Samantha had been responsible for nearly getting me trapped down here, I thought to myself. I had barely managed to escape, but had stupidly come back down to the sub-basement for a second helping of horror and pain. I began to get up again. Then I saw Marianne's open eyes watching me in the darkness. I quickly sat back down and huddled up next to the twitching, jabbering woman beside me, my body rejoining the pile of insane and increasingly unpredictable people who I had begun misguidedly to call my family. I needed to get out of there. I woke up feeling clearer than I had in a long, long time. I didn't know if it was just my memories coming back to me or if they'd been drugging me with something and had run low on their supply, but I had a suspicion it was the latter of the two. My head pounded. Despite the darkness, I had the worst headache of my life. I had struggled to sleep through it. More and more memories were flooding back to me of my life above ground. I was starting to feel increasingly terrified and trapped down in the caves as I remembered that wasn't all there was in the world. Marianne must have had suspicions I was remembering things because she came straight over to me when we were sitting around the fire eating breakfast. I was nibbling away on a piece of meat and taking very, very small bites. 
Suddenly I was becoming more and more uncomfortable eating human flesh. Are you okay, Jordan? Is something wrong with that piece? I can ask Tom to bring you a fresh one. Marianne asked, looking at me with concern in her eyes. I gulped down the small piece in my mouth and almost retched. I tried to hide the disgusted look on my face, but didn't do a very good job of it. Sorry. No, it's, it's fine. I'm just feeling a bit queasy this morning for some reason. I'm going to go for a walk in the caves after this. Maybe that'll help, I said. I'll go with you. Samantha came over and looked at me with worry in her eyes. Yeah, you really don't look too good. Are you sure you're all right? I looked at the puddle in front of me and saw my reflected face was ashen in the still water. Dark circles were visible below my eyes, and I had begun to develop sores all over my face. What was happening to me? I'll, I'll be okay, I think. I pretended to eat a couple more bites and got up a few minutes later. Samantha and I went for a walk in the caves. We went down a side tunnel I wasn't that familiar with, but Samantha said she knew the way. As we stepped carefully over holes in the rock, she began to whisper to me. They know you know, she said softly. My heart skipped a beat. I must be a terrible actor. It had only been a few hours since I remembered my past, and yet the whole place already knew. Were they going to kill me? I asked her. That's the plan, she said. I'm supposed to lure you to a spot. There's a back tunnel that we're going to use to cut you off so they can ambush you. But we're not going there. You going to help me? I asked, hopefully. Of course. You're my only friend down here, she said. Besides, maybe you can find a way to get me out of here, too. If not, that's okay, but I thought I would at least ask. I want to see the sun again. I want to feel the wind on my face and my hair. I want to be a regular person. How are we going to get out of here? I asked. She took a few moments to answer as she made her way past a precarious place in the rocks. Our voices echoed despite our whispers, and I hoped no one was following who could hear us. I know a way, she told me. There's a tunnel that takes you out of the caves. It brings you out to a cliff high above a forest. Nearby I can hear traffic like there's a road above the cliff. I know it's going to be scary because it's a steep drop and a long way down. But you can climb out, I think. I've tried, but I'm not tall enough to reach the handhold to climb up. You're tall, though. You, you can climb up and get help. We kept going, and eventually she told me we needed to pick up our pace. They'll have realized by now that we're not where we're supposed to be. We need to hurry, she said, her footsteps now jumping quickly from rock to rock. I followed her, but I had a difficult time keeping up with her in the darkness. I kept stumbling and falling down. I slipped again and banged my temple hard against a rock and the darkness turned to bright white momentarily, my headache flaring up with a new pain like a tightening vice grip around my head. The spot where the rock had hit me felt like a drill was boring into it. We went down tunnel after tunnel, and I was thankful Samantha was there to guide me. I'd be hopelessly lost without her, as I'd lost track of direction a while ago. I began to see light from up ahead. I heard footsteps from behind us. It was hard to tell how far back they were, but it sounded like they were gaining on us. Have they been drugging me? I asked her, panting and out of breath. She was running up ahead of me and stopped to wait for me to catch up. Oh yeah, for a long time. Even back when you were a security guard. I wanted to tell you, but they were always listening. Even when I thought we might be alone, they were listening. It all made sense now. The headaches the numbness I felt when I went down into the darkness. I knew from my experience working with psychiatric patients that one type of medication they were given was classified as hypnotics. Had I been hypnotized by Mary Ann? I thought of her mesmerizing eyes and her hand on my face as she whispered in my ear. I always wanted to do what she said. I wasn't able to control myself around her. They finally ran out of their stash. Whatever it was they were using... Marianne's being investigated and can't get her hands on stuff anymore. Someone's finally starting to get suspicious of her and all the missing patients who disappear under her watch, Samantha said. We finally emerged from the caves and found ourselves on a narrow ledge with a very long drop below us. I saw a forest and beyond that the small town I lived in, back in another life. The sound of occasional cars driving past could be heard above us. 
The road was only a short climb away if I could get to it. I felt the sun burn my eyes, and all I could see was white. How could I escape when I couldn't even see? I had been in the darkness for so long my eyes needed to adjust. But the sound of shouting voices and footsteps behind us was getting very close now. I could hear them maybe only 50 yards away. It was hard to tell with the echoes of the cave. Grab up here, we have no time, Samantha shouted at me. She grabbed my hand and directed it upwards. I can't see! I was becoming hysterical and terrified. I didn't understand how Samantha could see either and squinted to observe she was doing the same, shielding her eyes from the sun with her other hand. Grab the rock up there! We need to do it right now, they're coming! They're gonna be here any second! I reached my hand up and felt the rock above me. I felt for the handhold but wasn't sure if I managed to grasp the right spot. I tried to pull myself up and couldn't. Here, there's a foothold right here! Samantha shouted, and I saw people running toward us with knives in their hands, emerging from the darkness and coming around the corner from the tunnel. My eyes got a moment's relief from the sun as I looked into the shadows of the cave, and I was able to see the hole up past my waist to my left. Up above that, the handhold. There were more spots to grab onto above that, I saw, and felt a moment of hope. I stuck my foot into the hole and pulled myself up, almost completely blind, I was starting to be able to see a tiny bit now if I squinted hard enough. The light felt like it was burning my eyes, though, and it was nearly impossible to keep them open for more than a second. There was a ledge above the opening to the cave, and I managed to climb up to it. There was another handhold above that, and I pulled myself up, just as members of the group emerged onto the rock shelf and screamed from the blinding light of the sun. I kept climbing up, and when I was almost at the top, I ran out of handholds. There was nowhere to go. I made the mistake of looking down and saw the forest floor hundreds of feet below. The members of the group were still screaming, blinded by the bright light, on the ledge of the cave. I heard Marianne yelling for them to go back to the bunk room. I hoped desperately they had given up. Looking around, I tried to see if there was anything to hold on to to pull myself up. There was nothing. Not even a root or a tiny space in the rock to grab onto. A hand suddenly appeared in front of my face. I grabbed it unthinkingly. The strong arm of a man pulled me up and I scrambled to my feet on solid ground. The pudgy, five o'clock shadow face that looked back at me was smirking. It was Doug. Suddenly he stuck something hard and cold into my belly, and I felt hot, wet blood run out of me. He pulled the blade out and stuck it back in, again and again. No one ever leaves the caves. No one, he whispered in my ear. I fell to my knees as the blood soaked through my filthy clothing. I saw there was a pool of red liquid on the ground in the dirt, and thought in a haze, that's mine. I need that. I realized all was lost. Surely he would now push me off the cliff, and my body would tumble and bang off the rocks and fall far into the forest below. But no. That wasn't what happened. Someone saved me. Matt, the security guard I had trained a couple months before, came out of nowhere. He grabbed Doug's arm and twisted it backwards. Doug dropped the knife and screamed, his hand wrenched painfully back behind him. Doug struggled and slammed his head backwards into Matt's face and bloodied his nose. Matt staggered backwards and almost lost his grip on Doug's arm. But Matt held on tight. Doug's arm was still twisted awkwardly behind his back, and I could see on his face that he was in pain. Matt pitched himself backwards to throw him off balance, then used his position to his advantage against the larger man. He flung Doug forward, howling in fury and triumph as he threw him off the cliff. Doug's pudgy body went flying, sailing through the air as he screamed. I wanted to shout in triumph, but I was too stunned and stabbed to respond. I fell down in the dirt from my knees, exhausted and full of impossible relief. Oh, I guess you did something right when you trained me, huh, Jordan? He said with a smile on his face. Let's get you some help, buddy. He ran over to his car, which was parked behind some bushes, and brought it around closer. Then helped me in. I collapsed into the front passenger seat. He found some gauze and a first aid kit in the trunk and applied it to my wounds. It turned red instantly, but seemed to slightly stop the flow of blood. I told Matt I needed to get to a hospital. 
but he was already driving in that direction. Matt explained to me that he had been suspicious ever since I left the guard booth and climbed up the ladder onto the roof. He said I had been acting strangely and then had disappeared for a couple months. Matt said he began to wonder if I had been right all along. He had seen the girl in the window of Century Manor, he told me, and began to realize as time went on that it couldn't have all been a coincidence. As he began to look deeper into Doug's life, he realized the guy had no house, no apartment. He had a car, but it stayed parked at the hospital all day and all night. That was when he realized Doug was no ordinary man. He said he had waited for his opportunity, but Doug was very careful until today. Doug had received a phone call and had said that he needed to leave early. He had been acting strangely all day and looked anxious and irritated. Matt decided to sneak away from work and follow him from a distance in his car. That had brought him out to a cliff on the side of an isolated road, where Doug had rushed to the cliff edge and looked down from it strangely as if waiting for someone. It seemed Marianne had contacted Doug somehow and sent him to intervene. Marianne knew everything, and that obviously included any escape routes from the cave. I wondered how Samantha would take to our killing her father, and how Marianne would react since we had murdered her lover. She was a queen bee without a king now, and I didn't think she would be too happy about it. My eyes fluttered and closed as we pulled up to the hospital entrance. I heard Matt shouting for help and saying something about how there was so much blood. How could there be so much blood? In my dreams, it was me falling, instead of Doug. The forest rose up rapidly from below, and my stomach lurched as I came crashing down with sickening speed. As it got closer, I saw the forest floor was littered with bones. Endless piles of bones as far as the eye could see. When I woke up in the hospital room, the first thing I saw was Mary Ann's grinning face hovering over me. I wanted to scream, but she had already covered my mouth with her strong hand. She smiled as she plunged the hypodermic needle into my neck, and I felt a sting as its contents flowed into me. My body went numb soon afterwards. My mind was still focused and lucid, but I suddenly had no muscle control. My head flopped limply to the side, and Mary Ann settled it carefully back down onto the pillow and used the controls on the bed to lay me flat. I heard a nurse come in, and Mary Ann casually tucked the syringe into the back pocket of her scrub pants as she spoke calmly and without hesitation. Oh, hi there. How's it going? Just going down for the x ray. Her voice was cheery and professional. Mary Ann's ID badge showed her as a registered nurse for St. Daniel's Healthcare. The same organization that ran the mental hospital also ran this hospital a short distance away. Marianne hadn't even had to make a fake badge, I thought to myself. It was almost too easy. I was amazed at how well she could lie, saying the porters were backed up again, as always. The other nurse didn't argue, since Marianne knew all my information, and sounded like she knew what she was talking about. It didn't take long before the other woman was leaving the room, saying she would be right back with a transfer form, and it was about time that an x-ray got done. They'd been waiting all morning. Marianne clicked the bed's brakes off with her foot and whispered in my ear, I'll have you back home soon, sweetie. You can be my new Doug. How does that sound? It sounded terrible, but I couldn't tell her that. I was incapable of movement or speech or screaming when the nurse came back in with a green sheet in her hand stamped with my name on it. Mary Ann thanked her courteously and wheeled me out through the door. The nurse's station was hectic, and I saw they were dealing with a situation of some kind that didn't involve me. My kidnapper and I left the ward, and no one spared us a second thought. Mary Ann took me down to the lower level of the hospital, where two of her followers were waiting. They were dressed in green scrubs, and looked the part of porters, as they helped transfer me over to a wheelchair in the hallway, a short distance away from the x-ray department. No one looked suspicious, thinking I was just another drunk or junkie who had OD'd. One of them took a baseball cap from his back pocket and pulled it down low over my face when no one was looking. Then they left and headed in a different direction. Mary Ann pushed me down the hall towards the exit and turned to go down a descending ramp. Green signs on the wall with the letter P and arrows pointed where we were going. 
She put on a large pair of sunglasses, and we made our way towards the parking lot. I'm not mad, Jordan. I'm just disappointed. You have so much potential. You could be so much more. She whispered in my ear as we made our way to the white windowless van parked on the ground floor in the visitor parking lot. She opened up the back doors of the van, and the two men from the tunnels were already inside waiting. They lifted me up, still strapped into the wheelchair, into the back of the white van. I recognized them vaguely from the caves. It was hard to tell, though. It was always so dark down there. Faces looked different up here on the surface. I noticed they appeared sick and malnourished, their skin dotted with weeping sores. We slept a lot in the caves, and yet they looked so tired, their eyes bloodshot with bags beneath them. One man rubbed his temple in a self-soothing gesture that I knew all too well. I wondered if everyone down there had headaches now. Was that a side effect of the drugs wearing off? Then I noticed something else. Something I probably was not meant to see. Beneath the front passenger seat was a CD case, lying haphazardly on the floor, amid the hair and dirt. Marianne's face was on the cover with the title that promised, Quit Smoking in Two Weeks While You Sleep, Volume 4, Helping You with Hypnosis. In my mind, I saw more of the puzzle pieces beginning to come together at the edges, and yet a great gaping hole remained in the middle, right where Marianne's face should be. She was at the center of all of this. I knew it. Somehow I knew there was more to this mess. There had to be. I had a hundred questions and no one willing to answer them. One of the men got behind the wheel, and the other watched me as I lay helplessly secured in the back. Marianne sat shotgun in the front seat. The van began to drive away from the hospital, and my dread turned to complete terror. I felt as if I was having a panic attack, unable to move or speak, being taken prisoner against my will back down to those tunnels and the caves beneath the sanatorium. My eyes darted back and forth as my heart hammered in my chest. My breathing seemed shallow, and I felt short on air like I was suffocating. Marianne motioned to the man in the back to switch places with her when we stopped at a red light and she sat down next to me in the back of the van. She began to whisper in my ear again. I think she intended to try to calm me down, but succeeded only in making my fear that much worse. It doesn't matter if you escape, she whispered to me. You'll just keep coming back to us. You can't stay away from your family. Besides, you love me. I've gotten into your head. She gave me a flirtatious grin and tapped the tip of my nose playfully with her finger. She looked far less composed, manic almost, now that we were alone. Her hair was in disarray, and I noticed a smudge of dirt on her cheek, a bit of mud on her typically spotless clothing. Marianne continued to smile at me with a blank look in her eyes that seemed to gaze far past me, and I noticed she was rubbing my upper thigh in a very PG-13 kind of way. Didn't she remember she had just drugged me and I couldn't feel a fucking thing? We pulled up outside the back of the mental hospital several minutes later. As they opened the doors to let me out, I observed it was now dark outside. How long had I been asleep in that hospital bed before that, I wondered. I had so many unanswered questions. Where was Matt? Did he call the cops and tell them what had happened? And if so, had they believed him? Or perhaps they were going to charge him with murder for killing their best buddy, Doug. I had a feeling he was tied up at the police station and Marianne confirmed it a moment later as they lifted me out of the van, still strapped into the wheelchair from the hospital. Your friend isn't going to save you this time, she said with a smile. He's busy at the police station for the foreseeable future. I don't think he'll be out for quite a while. Her large grin told me she had done something to ensure that was the case. I was sick with guilt and grief for Matt. He had helped me, he had saved my life, and then apparently reported the whole thing to the police and that was the reward he got for it. With me gone and no one to confirm his story, he would likely spend the rest of his life in jail. I didn't have much hope for the cops to do the right thing in this case, since Doug was their boy. They had made that quite clear when I asked them to do their due diligence after Rhonda's death, and they had responded by writing the whole thing off as a suicide, despite the obvious evidence to the contrary. At least Doug was no longer able to gaslight them, although it sounded like the cannibal queen had taken up the torch. Marianne pulled out a ring of keys as they wheeled me to the door next to the loading dock. 
I only hoped they were being as incautious as it appeared, and that someone would catch them going into the basement. But then again, Marianne worked there as a nurse and could sweet-talk just about anybody. She could easily explain away the other two men, and myself, by saying they were patients out for a scheduled day trip that had run late or any other number of things. Marianne would likely just pass me off as a catatonic patient while the other two would nod and agree to anything she said. I felt a weight in the pit of my stomach, as any remaining scraps of hope I had left slipped away. She unlocked the double doors and they wheeled me through. It didn't take long to figure out where they were taking me. Back to the same place where all of this began. After going down a long hallway, we reached the stairs above the creepy little alcove, where the patrol check machine was located. The two men lifted up the wheelchair and carried me down the stairs, while Marianne unlocked the padlock on the heavy wooden door. She untwisted the chain and pulled it off, then dropped it to the floor. It hit the ground, making a very loud noise that I really hoped someone would hear. She pulled the door open and turned away from the darkened room. She looked at me, smiling. Welcome back, Jordan. We missed you so... She turned around quickly, seeing something in the room. I saw blood spray out behind her and a long, sharp spike appeared, protruding from her back. She looked down and was no longer smiling. Her face turned to fury. You! She was gagging and choking on her own blood, but managed to spit out one more thing. How could you? I raised you, you little bitch! Well, you did a really shitty job, Mom, a girl's voice said from the shadows. I heard a familiar giggle and wished I could run to help her, but I was still paralyzed. The two men hurried to assist Marianne as she fell to her knees. Blood was pouring from the wound in her chest and back and began to dribble down her legs and onto the floor. They dragged her into the room and then came back for me. I had thought for a brief second I was saved, but realized then that they were still going to take me down into the tunnels. They would carry on without the Queen Bee if they had to, I guessed. The fuck? The voice from up the stairs was familiar, but it had been so long I couldn't place it for a second. And then I remembered. It was Philip, my old security supervisor. My wheelchair was turned just enough so that he could see my face. I tried to give him a look with my eyes, but instead my head just slumped forward and my neck made a painful creaking sound. The baseball cap they had put on my head at the hospital fell off and onto the floor. My eyes rolled up in their sockets to observe him, and I managed to gurgle something that I hoped sounded like help, but actually sounded more like... Urf. Still... He seemed to get the picture. He pulled out his walkie-talkie and tried to call the office. No signal, I thought. Good luck. But was amazed that he got a quick response. They had finally upgraded their gear. I wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. Something was finally going to go right for me. Hey, call the police. There's some people down in the basement I don't recognize. And it looks like they might have taken someone hostage. It looks like Jordan, that old security guard. Except I thought he was in the hospital. Philip's voice was music to my ears. Well done, Philip, well done. One of the men pulled out a handgun, and my proud hopefulness turned to dread and despair once again. He squeezed the trigger, and the bang in my ear deafened me on that side. My headache bloomed again, this time a whole new flavor of pain. Tangy tinnitus. The bullet appeared to strike Philip in the shoulder, and he spun around and tried to duck behind the wall at the top of the stairs. The man shot several more times, and I realized very quickly that guns are not indoor toys. They're definitely not indoor toys. My ear was ringing loudly, and I couldn't hear anything else. Was that blood trickling down my face from a burst eardrum? Eh, worry about that later, I thought. At least I was starting to get a pins and needles sort of sensation back in my arms, feet, and hands. I tried to move a finger and realized I could. The men began to pull me into the room, into the darkness where a hatch was open and waiting. Marianne was already down below, and I wondered how they would get me safely down there without dropping me. Once we were inside the shadowy, abandoned old room, I heard voices from the hatch and realized they had enough people below to assist me and pull me down into the tunnels. Down to a hole in the side of the wall in the sub-basement, carved into the rock that led to a cave. A cavern of despair encircled by a pit of corpses left by cannibals, and surrounded by rats and mice and cockroaches feasting and festering. My thoughts raced as my heart hammered in my chest. 
I heard Philip, still at the top of the stairs, talking into his radio, saying he had been hit, that they were shooting at him. He told the switchboard operator he was just grazed by a bullet. He would be okay. I sighed with a bit of relief. At least if he lived, he would be able to tell the police what had happened. Maybe I had a chance of living after all. They lowered me down into the hole and closed the hatch seamlessly behind us as we descended. From above, it would look like nothing, since it was perfectly hidden and concealed. I had inspected the room myself a couple months before and said it was impossible for anyone to escape it. Philip had done the same. I only hoped he would be more thorough this time. It took several hours before I began to suspect that no one was coming down to the tunnels to save me. The time ticked by at an interminable rate as we waited in the caverns below the sanitarium. For all I knew, I'd spend the rest of my life down there. I was both alive and dead, waiting for the outside world to find me or forget I'd ever existed. Like Schrodinger's cat, only not as cute. Marianne wailed and cried from her bed. The raised platform area where she usually slept with Doug looked empty and dark. People were afraid to go near her since she had been furious with Samantha and was taking it out on everyone else. But it wasn't their fault that her daughter had impaled her with a sharpened broom handle before disappearing into the sub-basement tunnels, I thought. No one knew where she had escaped to, but there were a lot of people looking for her. Those who were left in the caves were the dregs of the group, rejects and anxious newcomers. With her most loyal followers gone to search for Samantha, and her cannibal king no longer by her side, Marianne suddenly looked more human, as she shifted uncomfortably and whimpered in pain. I smiled selfishly at her misery, but had a suspicion she would live. Marianne's voice was still strong and commanding, and the flow of blood from her wound seemed to have stopped from what I could overhear of their conversation. Apparently the sharpened wooden pole had gone right through her shoulder, missing any vital organs. One cannibal, who seemed to have some medical background, pulled the weapon out of her quickly and cleansed the wound with saline, packing and dressing it using stolen supplies from upstairs. I only hoped the bullet lodged in Philip would similarly do minimal damage. I needed him to tell people what he had seen, and I needed them to believe him. I was starting to think that he was having some trouble with that part. I remember back to when I had told him I heard a little girl's voice calling for help from that same dark abandoned room where the hatch to the sub-basement was. He had inspected the derelict old electroshock therapy room and decided I was crazy, or imagining things. I only hoped he would have better luck convincing people. The bloodstains on the floor might help. I kept waiting for a SWAT team to burst in. Flashlights to illuminate the darkened cave, as Marianne's cannibal crew surrendered and begged for mercy. I pictured Marianne being shot by machine guns and riddled with bullets as she refused to comply. But none of that happened. I waited and waited. By my estimation, it was the early hours of the morning when I heard Samantha being dragged back to the caverns. They had finally found her. Marianne sat bolt upright in her bunk at the sound of her daughter's shrieks and calls for help. Bring that little brat over here, she hissed, her voice full of venom and hate. Samantha was dragged into the bunk room covered in filth and grime. She had been hiding somewhere sneaky, but they had finally found her. You ungrateful little monster. Your father gets killed and instead of mourning, you try to kill your mother as well? Marianne's voice was loud and threatening. I was still strapped tightly to a wheelchair, but at least the paralytic drug she had injected me with had worn off. You're not my mother, Samantha said back to her, matching her poisonous tone. This was news to me. As far as I had known, they were related by blood. But things weren't always as they seemed especially down in the darkness of the caves. I heard a loud slap as Marianne struck Samantha hard across the face. She recoiled backwards and ended up on the floor. Marianne winced and cried out in pain after the sudden movement, grabbing at the hole in her shoulder. You bitch, she wheezed. Of course I'm your mother. You ungrateful little monster. I should kill you. Do it. You'd be doing me a favor. One more minute down here with you is too much to handle. Samantha said, her eyes filling with tears. This is all your fault. Everything is because of you, Samantha screamed. I had no idea what she was talking about. However, I got the impression suddenly that Samantha had not lived below ground her whole life. 
what was it that she had said the day before? I want to see the sun again. I want to feel the wind on my face and in my hair. I want to be a real person. The way she had spoken, I realize now, made it sound like she had lived once outside of the tunnels. Had Marianne lured Doug down there as a young, fresh-faced security guard? Had she brainwashed him and convinced him to leave his wife and kidnap their daughter to live down in the tunnels with her? Perhaps that was why she had said Marianne was not her real mother. Take her away from me, Marianne said to the men holding Samantha. Then, almost as an afterthought, throw her in the pit for a while. See how she likes having rats and roaches for a family instead of us. Samantha screamed and begged as they dragged her away. Her pleas for mercy were ignored and I was very concerned for her safety. The rats were always hungry, and fresh meat was much more tempting than the stale stuff lying around. I realized with alarm that one of the rats was currently sniffing my legs, which were probably looking like a couple of big, juicy drumsticks to him. I hissed at the rat as menacingly as possible, and it scampered off reluctantly. More were huddled nearby, sniffing the air hungrily. I had to save Samantha. I had a very strong suspicion Marianne would leave her down in that corpse-filled hole out of spite and would conveniently forget to retrieve her until it was too late. I had a sense that she didn't want to hurt me physically, but would use Samantha against me as leverage, knowing that we were friends. Stop! I yelled at them. They ignored me completely. She'll die down there. You can't put her in the pit. Hey, stop! They trudged past me, and I got a good look at Samantha's eyes as they dragged her away. She looked resigned to death and the tragedy of her life. I remembered when I had once been so afraid of her and her father. Now he was dead and she was next. If only I had known who I should really be afraid of. I whispered to her, I'm going to save you. I don't know how, but I will. Just don't give up, okay? She gave the slightest nod of her head. She would try, at least. Good. Kill those fucking rats if they get near you, Samantha. Bash their brains in. I heard her feet sliding across the slick stone floor a few moments later as she was dragged away against her will, and then it was quiet again. When the men came back, their faces were grim and displeased. I got the distinct impression morale was slipping among the inhabitants of the tunnels. Marianne would have her work cut out for her, whipping them back into shape, especially if she didn't have access to her usual supply of mind-altering medications. I thought back to the CD I'd seen laying in the van beneath the seat, Helping with Hypnosis, Volume 4, it had said on the label. That edition promised to help you quit smoking while you slept. I wondered what the other lessons were. Volume 3, take your life to the next level with a carnivore diet, perhaps? I wondered if the actual messages were hidden deeper in the recordings, implanted in people's minds while they slept. How many people's thoughts had she infected with her devious machinations, I wondered. I had begun to realize where my urge to be enveloped in darkness had come from. My headaches from bright lights. A chemical cocktail they had been sneaking into my coffee. As well as some subliminal messages they had played while I slept on my breaks as a security guard upstairs. I had no proof of the second part, but Samantha had confirmed the first. It all seemed to fit somehow. I wondered if Marianne had played the subliminal messages to patients upstairs, explaining it to others as music therapy as she put the headphones on their ears and played her hypnosis for them, plying them with benzodiazepines, probably. Marianne called me from her bunk. Why don't you come up here and join me, sweetie? She had never called me sweetie before. I shivered at the thought of her touch. If you come up here, I'll have them bring her back. You want that, don't you? I had a feeling she was lying, which gave me pause. But if there was anything I could do to help Samantha, I had to at least try. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. Fine. But you have to send them to get Samantha first, then I'll come up there, I told her. Playing hardball, huh? Okay, fine. Steve, Tom, untie him, then go grab the bitch before she loses too many fingers. Marianne smiled at me cruelly. Take your time, no rush. She patted the space beside her on the bed. Steve and Tom gave each other a look, then came over to my wheelchair and began to untie me. Once I was free, they made their way back to the pit, grumbling something to each other. Come here, honey. I have a surprise for you, Marianne said. I tried to stall. 
Once Samantha's back and I know she's safe, I'll come up there. Not before. You're so clever, aren't you? All right, have it your... Let's get him! I heard a shout from over my shoulder and breathed a sigh of relief. It was Philip's voice. I looked in amazement and saw he was joined by several other guards who I recognized from the mental hospital. Their battle cry rang and echoed in the tunnels. They were carrying axes, baseball bats, sharpened broom handles, large flashlights, and knives. Philip scared off the two men standing near me as he ran forward swinging an axe. He caught me as I almost tipped forward trying to stand on wobbly legs. The drug Marianne had injected me with was still in my system, and I would be useless in a fight, I thought. I got you, buddy, he said, helping me back into the wheelchair. I'm sorry I doubted you, Jordan. You are right about everything. Doug was a murderer. Matt told me everything. Forget about it. At least you got here when it counted. Just go help the others. They need you. I said to him, my head suddenly feeling heavy and full of bright building pressure, which began behind my eyes. His headlamp was too bright, I thought vaguely to myself. He ran off to help the others. I watched from the wheelchair as Philip surprised one of the cannibals from behind with his axe. The wedged blade landed with a wet thunk sound and fixed itself firmly into the right side of the man's neck. He screamed and wailed as he collapsed, the axe blade still lodged firmly in the right side of his bloody neck. Philip was now without a weapon. He was surprised from behind by another cannibal. The man swung his forearm down into the side of Philip's head and he staggered forward from the heavy blow. That was when Ahmad, the old Afghan security guard who I had always liked, came up behind the man and put a baseball bat against his throat, pulling him off of Philip and choking him. The cannibal bit into the old man's hands and forearms, taking out chunks of flesh and chewing on them hungrily. Ahmad screamed and released him, the man still chewing on pieces of grisly flesh. Ahmad backed away and nursed his wounds, dropping the baseball bat to the stone floor of the cave as blood poured from his hands and forearms. The other two security guards attacked, having incapacitated their surprised foes from earlier. The cannibal ran away, outnumbered, as the guards from upstairs chased after him with knives. When they were sure he was gone, they turned around and came back to us. I suddenly remembered Mary Ann. I looked up and saw she wasn't in her bunk, and she hadn't been fighting with the others who had been taken out one by one. They hadn't expected an attack and were surprisingly unprepared for it. The remaining cannibals who had been hiding scared in the shadows fled as the security guards helped me to my feet. We were safe, at least for the time being. Where the fuck are the cops? I asked. Philip laughed. Well, that's a hell of a thank you, he said with a smirk. Sorry, man, I don't mean to sound ungrateful, but really, what does it take to convince those assholes to help? Are they even coming? Fat chance. I'll tell you about it when we get out of here. There's something really strange going on, and I'm hoping you can shed some light on it, Philip said. Samantha was waiting for us near the exit. She was bloodied and covered in bite marks from the rats. She appeared shaken and very uncomfortable around all the strange men, but I was proud when she looked each one in the eyes and said thank you, before dropping her gaze to the floor once again. You're safe now, Samantha, I said and put my arm around her shoulder. We left the caverns and went up the ramp. We crawled through the tunnel of rats and went back through the dark sub-basement towards the elevator. I had to stop and look when the shape to my left caught my eye. The heart engraved in the wall of the tunnel had been altered. DL was scratched out. It now said JG plus MB forever. I heard a noise from up ahead and realized with sudden dread it was the elevator rising to the roof, leaving us in the sub-basement below the old mental hospital. Marianne's laugh could be heard fading as she rose up on the old rattling steel elevator. Then she began to cough and hack and her laughter stopped abruptly. We stood there in shock and horror. The elevator was the only clear way out of the tunnels. I'd gotten out once before by way of a hatch down a hallway under E-Wing, but the place was always under construction, and who knew if that was still a serviceable exit. We were left in near darkness, and I got deja vu as one of their flashlights began to flicker. Rats and mice scurried by, and one tried to crawl up onto my shoe. I kicked it away as it probed hungrily at the flesh of my leg. Don't worry, guys, I said in a trembling voice. I know a way out. Follow me. I've done this before. The eight of us walked through the dark tunnels, 
trying to avoid stepping on rats and mice as they scampered in the dim beams of the flashlights. I was leading the way with Samantha at my side. We carried switchblades the other guards had brought to use as spare weapons. The cannibals were still roaming the tunnels beneath the mental hospital. They were almost all former patients from upstairs, brainwashed and medicated by Marianne, the cannibal queen. We could only hope they were deeper in the depths of the sub-basement, and we would miss them altogether. Dave, one of the security guards who had saved us from the clan of cannibals, walked up close to me and started to make nervous conversation. We knew each other a bit, but I was out of practice with making pleasantries. Hey, Jordan, he said. Do you know where you're going? There's a lot of flies down here. And the rats? And that smell? Isn't that smell bothering you? I didn't admit to him that I had grown accustomed to it a while back. And the flies were just my friends. As were the rats, mice, and roaches. I shook my head in response and tried to clear my mind of lunatic thoughts. I needed to see a specialist who practiced in reversing hypnotic brainwashing. But where do you even begin to look for someone like that? Yeah, I, uh, I had to do this once before. I threw a sidelong glance at Samantha, and even in the darkness I could see her face turn red. She mouthed an apology, and I nodded back to her. There's a hatch right up here to the right, under E-Wing, but we have to keep an eye out. There's a bunch of cannibals roaming around down here looking for her. I had already told them to keep their voices down, but they were still murmuring in frightened tones, and exclaiming every so often when rats would climb up their legs. We turned the corner and came face to face with four cannibals. I yelped in surprise and pulled Samantha back behind me. They lunged at us as we backed away. They weren't expecting us to have backup. A bloodbath quickly ensued as they were caught by surprise coming at us from around the corner. Philip led the charge and attacked with his axe. He caught one of them in the arm with a glancing blow as the man quickly ducked away, lifting his forearm in a protective motion. The other three were slightly less surprised and attacked with their crude weapons. One of the cannibals, who I recognized as Suzanne, caught Dave off guard with her spear and went right through his midsection. She pulled it out and stabbed him again and again while he screamed. Philip jumped in and attacked her with the axe while Ahmad swung his bat and the other guards joined the fray. I was still weak and barely capable of walking, but I tried to do my part. One of the cannibals noticed my frail and fragile state and grabbed me from behind and held a knife to my throat. I nearly released my full bladder, but managed to refrain myself from doing so at the last second, just as the point of the knife pierced my flesh, and Samantha stuck her knife into the woman's back. The sharp knife blade left a trail leading downwards as she fell off of me and clutched her back, screaming in agony. The cannibal collapsed to the ground behind me, and I looked around and saw we had killed them all. Or, they had killed them all, I should say. Up there, I said, sweating and pointing at a hatch in the ceiling up ahead. We walked forward over the dead bodies, and the mice and rats took our places and had a feast. I reached the ladder and could hear the crunching of bones as the bigger rats took off fingers and nibbled on them, the occasional pop of an eyeball being bitten into. I climbed up the ladder and pushed on the hatch from below. It wouldn't budge. I felt panic set in and tried to reassure myself. This had happened last time too, just push harder. Using all of my strength, I pushed up with my forearm and still... Nothing. It was like the thing was cemented in place suddenly. I tried to conceal how terrified I was as I spoke to the others. I remember this was hard to get open, but I don't remember it being this difficult. Maybe I'm just too weak now. So can someone else give it a try? Yeah, sure, no problem, said Roger, a big guard who was at least six foot five. He climbed up the ladder and pushed with all of his strength. Nothing. It's stuck. Feels like it's nailed shut, he said, grunting and straining at the hatch. Samantha spoke up softly. "'What is that, dear? We can't hear you,' Ahmad said to her in his gentle tone. He had children of his own, and I was glad he was there. He was a good man. "'I said there's a bunch of other ways out, but we have to hurry. My mom is sneaky, and she doesn't like it when things don't go her way. She's probably out there closing the exits one by one,' Samantha said in a louder voice. "'I hadn't even thought of that. She didn't have a big head start on us, though. We had to hurry.' Where would she go last? Try to think, where would she not expect us to go? We've got to get into her head like she got into ours. Century Manor, Samantha said. I got chills down my spine. 
That was the last place I wanted to go, but it was true. Marianne wouldn't expect it. Plus, it would be suspicious for her to walk all the way out to that abandoned building. She would probably start by locking the other exits first, like the old electroshock chambers. Why that space wouldn't be considered a crime scene, I hadn't the foggiest idea. But as Philip had said, we would discuss that later. Plus, I didn't know if that door was padlocked shut once again. At least Sentry Manor had windows we could smash out to escape if we had to. Done. Let's go. You lead the way, Samantha. She ignored one of the other guards when he tried to hand her a flashlight. I told him it would be okay. She could see better without it. We walked forward for a long time without seeing anyone. Our steps were quiet and careful, knowing there were still at least a dozen cannibals out looking for Samantha. They were in small groups, knowing she could be dangerous. We rounded a corner and I saw movement in the shadows up ahead. I tapped Samantha's shoulder and pointed. I saw it, she said. It looked like someone was peeking around the corner from up ahead. This was likely an ambush. Is there any other way to get over there? I asked. Nope, this is it. What do you want to do? What about the trades building or, or another outbuilding somewhere? They're all accessed through this tunnel, she said. So much for that idea. Philip made a sound from behind us like he had just remembered something. Oh, hey guys, I got this buddy of mine who's in the army. He said not to show it to anyone, but... I think since this is an emergency, he'll forgive me, Philip said, and he pulled out what appeared to be a grenade. Are you crazy? We'll cave in the ceiling and be buried alive, I whisper yelled at him. It's a flashbang. If we can throw it around the corner up there, it could incapacitate them. It's worth a try. Philip held the thing out to me. Was he expecting me to throw it? I have no idea how to use that thing. I'll probably blind us with it. He just shrugged at me. No one else was volunteering either. I sighed and turned around. Stepping forward into the darkness, I played with the pin in my fingers. Hopefully it would work just like in the movies, I thought. As we approached the corner, I felt my hair stand up on end and goosebumps rise on my skin. Have you ever walked into a crowd of cannibals waiting to ambush you? Nothing but a switchblade in your hand, a flashbang, and a few friends following behind you? Well, I have, and it's no fun, let me tell you. We got close enough and I pulled the pin. I lobbed the thing underhand and it clanged off the wall and landed around the corner. Perfect. A few seconds passed and I wondered if the thing was a dud. I heard them exclaim and begin to get up to attack us. Then the bright light exploded and there was a haze of fog floating gently in the tunnel. We charged around the corner and attacked the five cannibals who were waiting there. They didn't stand much of a chance, I thought at first. But their weapons were long and they were not to be taken lightly. They stabbed outwards, terrified with their sharpened sticks and spears. We tried to duck past them, but they swiped and thrust their sharp weapons quickly and erratically, their movements wild and desperate. Dave was struck again, as was I. I saw Roger receive a wound to his hand from the spear. Ahmad was still nursing his wounds from earlier and was hanging back a bit. He looked pale and shaken now, and I wondered how much blood he had lost. The cannibals began to regain their vision, but it was too late. Philip bashed the last one's head off the wall of the tunnel with the back of his axe blade, with one powerful swing. I was beginning to feel faint, and could tell Ahmad and Dave weren't faring any better. Dave now had a hole in his leg as well as his side. I had received a couple of new battle wounds as well. My forearm now had a hole in it, and the side of my neck had been grazed. We were panting and out of breath when we finally got to the ladder leading up to Sentry Manor. This is it, Samantha said. We climbed up the ladder and one by one emerged in the basement of the old house. We were almost there. So close to freedom I could taste it. I wondered what day it was, what month. What had I missed? I had so many nagging questions now that I had time to think without distractions. The stairs ahead were rickety and old, the ceiling sagging and buckled. The darkened basement was terrifying by any standards, except for mine at that moment. I nearly got down on my knees and kissed that grimy, mildewed basement floor, but Philip yanked me by the arm and pulled me away from there. We climbed the stairs and went up the next flight to the second floor. The windows of the first floor were boarded up, so we had to escape by breaking the glass of one of those on the upper level. The doors were chained and padlocked shut from the outside. When we got upstairs, Samantha led the way to a bedroom. This is my happy place, she said as we looked on in astonishment. It didn't look like a little girl's bedroom or playroom. This looked like the den of a serial killer. There were dolls made of severed fingers and arms, 
rotting and decaying. Dozens of them were assembled into miniature human form, dressed in scraps of fabric sewn like doll's clothing. They were propped up and arranged in macabre dioramas, a hand and finger doll family over here eating dinner around a small table, another in the corner standing around a dead doll who had limbs missing and a screaming face drawn in blood. The walls were also painted with blood, and I saw crude drawings of her and Doug, her father, chopping up bodies and eating them with big grins on their toothy faces. The pictures covered the walls of the room. How had the cops not seen this when they looked in here? Or had they seen it in a voice in their minds that told them not to worry? This was all fine. No big deal. Go on with your lives. I wondered if perhaps Doug had given out free samples of Marianne's self-help hypnotherapy CDs at the police station. Another piece of the puzzle falling into place? Perhaps. But there was still this to deal with. I realized Samantha was not as normal as I had wanted her to be. I realized I barely knew her, really. She had killed dozens, maybe hundreds of people. What's wrong, Jordan? She asked, holding the knife in her hand. Don't you like it? I made a drawing of you. It's up on the ceiling. I looked up. I don't know how she had done it, but there was a very large drawing of me up there, extending wall to wall. I was smiling and holding hands with her. Beneath it was written, My Friend and Me, in sloppy, childlike writing. It was all painted with blood. So, so, so much blood. It's, uh, it's great, Samantha, really. Very cool, I said lamely. Well, let's get out of here. How's that sound? I tried without success to control my shaking voice. Smiling, she gave me a relieved look. Samantha dropped the knife to the floor and reached her hands out toward mine. I nodded at Philip as I took her hand in mine, and he walked over to the window. He broke the glass with his axe, and fresh air flowed into the room. It smelled sweet, the morning air of summer. And I saw the sun was rising bathing the world in a dull, crimson glow. It was a new day. The decision to escape the tunnels through the basement of Century Manor proved to be a good one for more than one reason. Not only did we outwit Marianne, since she didn't expect us to leave through the most inconvenient route, but also the getaway vehicles happened to be parked nearby. Philip and the other guards had parked near an old powerhouse building close to Century Manor, an area often used as an auxiliary parking for staff. Since it was the early hours of the morning, no one else was parked there, but their vehicles also blended in and didn't look too suspicious. The exit through Century Manor had also provided us a glimpse at Samantha's happy place, her secret room full of disembodied hands she had dressed as dolls. The walls and ceilings were covered in murals she had painted with vast quantities of blood, and I was becoming increasingly uneasy around my new friend from the tunnels. I tried not to let that show, as I told her to climb out of the window ahead of me. I really didn't want to turn my back on her. When we got out of there, we would have to set some ground rules, and we would have to discuss her dark past. I wanted to find out just what kind of person I was dealing with. Samantha looked like a small ten-year-old child. But I knew she was closer to my age. She'd been deprived of sunlight for most of her life, which had stunted her growth severely. Since the cars were parked nearby, it helped us escape quickly and without notice, which was useful since we were all covered in multiple stab wounds and cannibal bites and our clothes were filthy and torn. We would have stood out a lot more walking through the basement, and I was starting to suspect it was best for the time being if we could keep all of this secret. Philip agreed, and said we would all meet up at his place later that night to discuss what had happened and decide a course forward. Samantha and I would stay with him. We were clustered around the cars and waiting for Roger. The oversized guard was the last one to come out through the small window. He was slowly and deliberately clearing pieces of glass out of the window frame to avoid cutting himself while crawling out. I was about to call up to him to tell him to hurry. It wasn't safe. When he finally finished and started climbing out, Roger put his leg through the window and then his head, pulling himself through the window frame carefully. Then suddenly his body was yanked backward. Roger turned his head, eyes wide and full of terror, his hands now holding on with every ounce of strength as the broken glass dug into his palms and blood poured out. 
Then I heard Roger scream as filthy, long-nailed hands grabbed him from the darkness and pulled him back in. Roger's agonized screams rose in pitch and sounded terrified as the cannibals tore him apart. His head flew out the window and rolled onto the grass near us, his mouth open in a silent scream. The cannibals jumped quickly out of the window and scampered down from the roof with ease. They held machetes in their teeth and climbed down the drain pipes with Jackie Chan-like agility. I recognized them immediately as Marianne's royal guard. The six men were the meanest, cruelest cannibals in the tunnels, and I had been glad we avoided them during our escape. They sprinted towards our cars as we piled in quickly and Philip gunned the engine. His tires left lines of burnt rubber as we sped away. The other guards also drove away quickly. We'd all managed to escape, except for Roger. We drove towards the road from the hospital and I still felt supremely guilty for him. Still, I was relieved and breathed a bit easier as I watched the building get smaller and smaller in my rearview mirror. About an hour later, I began to feel an itch an urge to go back there. It was like a bug in my brain saying I needed to return, and I was afraid to tell Philip or anyone else about it. The voice in my head kept pestering me, and eventually I gave in and decided to ask Philip if I could get my job back at the hospital. He was the supervisor, and I saw he was wearing a different company's security guard uniform now. I asked him about it as we drove back to his house. We were both still in shock from the death of Roger, but Philip managed to form his thoughts and provide an explanation. Yeah, the, the old company got beat out for the new contract, about a month after you disappeared. Things were up in the air for a while, and none of us were sure if we'd keep our jobs. Luckily, they decided to keep everyone on, since it was easier than training a bunch of new people to guard the place, he said. Later that night, before everyone got there for our meeting, I asked him if he could get me my job back. I thought he would fight me on it, but he agreed almost immediately. I barely even had to try to convince him. He just said it would be good for me to get back to normality even if our version of normal was patrolling an insane asylum. It would take a bit of creativity, but we managed to work out a potential cover story that made sense. I would say I had been in a car accident as I had gone to visit a friend out of town. I was returning from a brief coma and a long recovery in hospital, where I had been listed as a John Doe. My injuries looked fresh, but if they were covered by bandages, it would be difficult for people to tell. Philip could hire me on the spot if he wanted to, as the new company provided little oversight. He did so then and there, and told me we'd do the paperwork later. Eventually everyone arrived at Philip's house, and we brought people up to speed from both sides of things. I explained to all of them how I suspected Doug after Rhonda's death, and realized there were tunnels down in the sub-basement he could have used to escape from the murder scene. I had gone down to investigate in the elevator. I had been brainwashed somehow by Marianne after weeks of being secretly dosed with her special blend of what I suspected were benzodiazepines. Hypnotics. What they actually were, I still don't really know. I had found a tunnel in the sub-basement leading to a cave system where Marianne led a clan of cannibals in near total darkness. Patients were brainwashed and brought down beneath the basements to the caverns and forced to join or die. If they hadn't seen it all with their own eyes, they would not have believed it, I thought. And yet somehow Philip had convinced them to follow him down there to rescue me. I owed the group of them my life and thanked them all sincerely. Ahmad and Dave were missing from our meeting. They had gone to the hospital for treatment, and were now having issues explaining their wounds. The police had been called by suspicious ER staff, and we were becoming increasingly concerned for their safety. It seemed the cops had been compromised. I told the group about the CD case I had seen in the van. Quit smoking in two weeks while you sleep, I said to them. From a series called Helping with Hypnosis. I think it said that one was volume four. It had Marianne's face right on the cover. Philip suddenly looked white as a ghost. I've seen those, he said. They're all over the police station. Guys were handing them out recently and lending them to each other. I didn't even realize it was Marianne on the cover. I had like five people ask me one day if I wanted one that helped you reduce stress. It sounded weird, so I said no, but people kept coming up and offering me the damn things. He looked really scared. I just thought it was some new fad, but... It seemed really strange at the time. In the last few weeks, I saw people in the hospital passing them around as well. Those CDs are everywhere. No wonder the cops aren't helping us, I said. And that's why they've been keeping Matt in jail, even though he saved my life. If I go over there and tell them what happened, they'll probably just arrest me too. 
I had no idea what to do now. We call the RCMP, Greg, another guard, said. The RCMP, or Royal Canadian Mounted Police, are basically our equivalent to the FBI. They do local law enforcement in remote areas, too. But they're pretty much our version of federal law enforcement. That's an idea, Philip said. On the other hand, a lot of the guys at the station have friends and family in the RCMP. If they send someone from the local office, they could very well have been infected with that damn hypnosis shit, too. Wouldn't surprise me, I said. Greg leaned back and exhaled loudly. It was a good idea, but we couldn't risk it. Is there some other law enforcement we could call? Tanya, another guard, offered. We all thought about it for a minute. It seemed we all had the same thought rattling around in our heads. How far exactly did Marianne's reach extend? We all turned and looked at Samantha simultaneously. She looked extremely nervous at the sudden attention. Why is everyone looking at me? She asked. I put my hand gently on her shoulder. Sorry, Samantha, it's just you were the one in the tunnel who saved us all. I think we all thought the same thing at the same time just now. That maybe you can be the one who tells us what to do now. So what do you think we should do? She sat there and was quiet for a couple minutes and didn't say anything. Finally, she spoke up. She's been working on this for years. They're up to volume 12 of those CDs now. They've made thousands of them. They started with the local police, but pretty soon they were struggling to keep up with production as the demand grew. The messages on the CDs ensures that the word will spread. Anybody could be under her influence. Including the people in this room right now. Her voice was cold and distant. What is the message, Samantha? I asked. She sat there silent for a while longer. I don't know. It's subliminal, so your conscious mind can't understand it. She sighed and continued. There were things you guys didn't know about my dad. He was a genius with computers and sound equipment. He found a way to embed a message in an audio track that couldn't be heard with your ears. Only with your subconscious mind. Without him around, my mom can't make new CDs anymore. She can only print the old ones. Well, that was a bit of good news, at least. How do you know that? I asked. But before I could get an answer, something happened that would change everything. My phone rang. Everyone in the room who had a phone, theirs rang as well. Marianne was behind this, we could be sure of that. But there was no sense avoiding her. I looked at my phone and saw it was my aunt calling. She and my uncle and cousin Fred were the only family I had left in the world. And they lived in another city across the country. It's my aunt, I said. It's my brother. Philip told me, reading his caller ID. Everyone in the room had a close family member or friend calling. Only Samantha didn't have a phone. I had managed to grab mine from the caves before leaving. The calls stopped one by one as they went to voicemail. The phones began to ring again a few seconds later. All right, I said. Let's see what she wants. I was already resigned to the fact that Marianne had gotten to my aunt somehow. Of course she had, I thought. Over the past two months, she had plenty of opportunity to weasel her way into all of our family's lives. It was becoming very clear she wanted me back. We all picked up our phones at the same time and said hello to those closest to us, who had now been brainwashed by the cannibal queen to do her bidding. Hi, Jordan, said my aunt in a very unusual tone. Her voice was sleepy and monotonous. Put me on speakerphone, dear. No, I said. I shook my head at the others. Their callers had the same request. No, Aunt Sue, I will not put you on speakerphone. What would you like? My voice sounded cold and harsh to my own ears, and I had to remind myself I was talking to my aunt, not Mary Ann. Do it, or I'll tell your cousin Freddy to jump in front of a train. He'll do it, too. He loves trains. My cousin Freddy was twelve years old, and he did indeed love trains. There was a busy track right near their house. Oh, Freddy, she called. The other people in the room's faces turned white one by one, as they also made their refusals to comply. I guess they were having similar threats made against their loved ones. I gave up and put my phone on speaker. It seemed that Marianne was like a terrorist, and we were already obeying her demands. This wasn't going well. You're on speaker, I said resignedly. 
The rest of the guards in the room did the same. Hello, Jordan. Marianne's voice echoed throughout the room from five different speakerphones. The effect was eerie, to say the least. And hello, Samantha, Philip, Roger, Greg, and Tanya. How nice of you to get together like this and make it so easy for me to communicate concisely with you all at once. She sounded like the snake telling Eve to take a bite. Her voice was like a spider which crawled into your ear and refused to come out. A brain parasite that invaded your gray matter and refused to let go, planting its eggs in your temporal lobes. I'll make this very simple, she continued. Bring back Samantha and my favorite tall, sexy security guard boyfriend. You do that and you can live. You're all smart cookies. You've realized by now that this is hopeless for you, right? Samantha doesn't want to go back there. I don't either. Any other demands? Because you can't have your first two. I had stopped negotiating with her, or so I thought. She began to laugh. She did that for a while as her cackles rang off the walls of the room and the tinny tones of the speakers of our cell phones. Finally, she stopped. You think you can haggle with me, Jordan? You think you can barter and bargain for your lives? No. You don't get to make decisions here. You do what I say or your friend Matt dies. You have until midnight. I want you back at the front door of Century Manor, dressed up in a sexy suit and tie for me. I want you all dolled up for our date tonight. You can bring some flowers for me, too. If you do that for me, I'll release all of your friends, and the three of us can go on to live a nice, happy life in the caves. I've got more drugs, she added. You won't even be able to remember what you were before. You'll just be happy again with me. Don't you want to be happy again? And spend the rest of our lives together, just the two? She stumbled slightly. Just the three of us? No, I said, gritting my teeth. If you're not there by midnight, I'll kill one of your friends every hour until you show up. Dave will be next, then Ahmad. I have people in the hospital who will see to that. Then I'll take out each of your co-conspirators' families, one by one. Oh, and of course your aunt, uncle, and cousin. I'll murder them too, of course. Every hour that passes after midnight, someone will die. That's the bottom line. But I don't think you'll let it get that far. I know you want people to like you. The lines went dead at the same time. I made sure everyone had hung up. We have to kill her. I said. It's the only way out of this. She can't give those brainwashed people commands if she's dead. Are you sure about that? Philip asked, looking pale and worried. What if you're wrong? I had to admit he had a point. I looked at the clock. It was 10 p.m. We had two hours until she was going to start killing people. One by one. Hey, Philip, I said. You're about my size. Got a suit I could borrow? Marianne had given us an ultimatum. Samantha and I could go back to her and rejoin the clan of cannibals living beneath the mental hospital, or everyone we knew and care about would die. I couldn't put at risk the lives of the people who were gathered around me at Philip's house. They had saved my life, and I owed it to them to do whatever I could to ensure that they and their families would be safe. It felt like we'd been racking our brains for hours. Eventually, we ran out of ideas and slowly, one by one, began to turn our eyes to Samantha. She was so quiet that it was easy to forget she was there. She had been ignored by us once again, even though she clearly had the most insight into this whole situation. Samantha, what should we do? I asked her again. We're out of time and options. It was true, there was only an hour left now. It was 11 p.m., and we had to return to Century Manor by midnight. The old, dilapidated mansion was on the outskirts of the mental hospital property, and had been the living quarters of patients back in the 19th century. It had long since been closed off and boarded up, left in disrepair. It couldn't be torn down since it was protected as a historical landmark, but the cash-strapped town didn't have the money to provide regular upkeep and maintenance. Samantha sat there again for a few minutes silently, which, as I had learned, was her way of framing her thoughts into words. The cannibals in the caves didn't talk much, 
but she had received an education from her mother and father over the years, so she was quite capable of intelligent speech. Emotionally and socially, she was on the level of a ten-year-old. She acted just like an extremely bright and precocious young child, wise beyond her years. We have to go back, she said. I'm okay with that. We all started to interrupt her, but she raised a hand and closed her eyes, in a motion that said, without deliberation, No, let me finish. So we did. There isn't a choice about that. We both have to do what she says. But she's losing it. She isn't herself right now. I'm not sure why, but I think my dad held her together. That maybe she needs another person so she doesn't lose control. That's what I think, anyways. She's toxic, and if she doesn't have another person to spread that poison to, it will infect and destroy her. Does that make sense? We all nodded reluctantly. This normally wouldn't work with her since she's usually very cunning, but she's not all there at the moment. Samantha went on and explained her plan to us. Once again, she wasn't wrong. As Samantha spoke more and more, I realized she'd been thinking about this for a long time. She had known this was coming, this confrontation, and she had planned for it. Samantha, I said when she had finished explaining what we were all going to do. This plan might work, but you have to understand there's a chance it might not, and she won't be happy that we tried to double-cross her. We could both die in there. Samantha nodded her head and looked at me solemnly. I know, but it's the only chance we have. It's your life on the line here, too, so what do you want to do, Jordan? After some deliberation, I told him that if we were going to die, I wanted one last meal. We had time enough for that, at least. Since it was late at night and almost everything was closed, my options were limited. But that was okay. I had been dying for a cheeseburger ever since starting to remember bits and pieces of my past while I'd been down in the tunnels. I know it sounds psychotic, but... Human flesh was a poor substitute for a double cheeseburger and fries, and I told Philip that was what I wanted as we drove back to the mental hospital grounds. My treat, he said. It's the least I can do. We pulled into the lot and parked. The big neon sign announced that they were open 24 hours a day. The place was deserted and we were the only customers. Samantha had never been to a fast food restaurant before, she said. At least, not that she could remember. The bright yellow and red tile floors and walls burnt my eyes as we walked in, and a teenage boy behind the counter greeted us with a pimple-faced smile. Welcome to the Rumble Burger, home of the Rumble Shake, he said, his voice cracking. Can I take your order? His smile was wide and toothy. I didn't see anyone else working with him. I'll take a double cheeseburger and a large fry. Eh, what the hell, a medium chocolate shake, too, I told him. I was hungry. I'll make that into a combo for you. It'll save you a dollar eighty-five. And for you, little miss? He asked Samantha. She looked at me questioningly. I decided it might be best if I ordered for her. If she started asking questions about the menu options, things could get awkward. She'll take a kid's meal, the cheeseburger one, with an orange juice. I didn't have kids, so this was new to me. What was I thinking? She wasn't a kid. The guy tried to entice Philip with a contraption called a barbecue bacon waffle chicken burger with habanero mayo and Monterey Jack cheese, served special with jalapeno cheddar sauce smothered curly fries, but he just waved his hand and said he didn't want anything. The kid rang up our orderer and then went into the back. I figured they were working short. The young guy was doing everything himself, including making the food by the looks of things. We waited, and a few minutes later, our cardboard-packaged burgers came zipping down the steel slide from the kitchen and landed safely in the designated area to be picked up by the same person who had dropped them down from the other side. He came back around and grabbed the burgers. I noticed there were too many. We only ordered the two burgers, I said as he was packing things up. He ignored me and continued what he was doing. He came back with that same large grin still on his face. The order looked right, but there was an extra burger container and fries. I told him again there were too many, and he just kept smiling and handed me the bag. Just being nice and giving out free food since it was late at night and close to the end of his shift, I thought. Um, thanks, I said. Did you want anything extra for that? No charge, he said in his youthful, happy tone. Okay, well, I appreciate it. I'm pretty hungry. I'm not going to say no to a second burger right now.
I told him. Oh, that one's not for you, he said. My skin turned ice cold as he spoke. The grin never left his face and only stretched further and further as he told me. It's for the queen, Marianne. These are for her, too. Better not keep her waiting, or your friend Matt will die soon, Jordan. He pulled out a bouquet of mashed, mangled, and wilting flowers from beneath the counter and thrust them at me. I took them, startled and terrified. They had been picked from the side of the road by the looks of it, and the stems were broken and leaves fell off all over the bright yellow and red tiled floor. I saw now the pool of spreading blood creeping towards the cash registers from the back. The clerk's shoes left bloody footprints where he walked, as he grabbed napkins, straws, and ketchup packets, and put them on the takeout tray with my milkshake. I noticed the liquid inside the cup was dark red, and smelled of pennies even from where I stood. The clock behind the counter said 11.45. We only had 15 minutes. It had felt like we had more time. We need to go. Now. Don't forget your rumble shake, the kid behind the counter said as we started moving away. I reached out to pick up the cup instinctively, even though I didn't want it, and he grabbed my wrist and clenched it with a vice-like grip. His teeth were bared like a frightened primate in an expression that was now not a smile. He was clenching his teeth and grinding them violently, while his eyes looked far past me at something a thousand yards distant. I yanked my arm away painfully, his fingernails leaving long red scratch marks behind, and the liquid in the cup spilled everywhere. It flew up into the kid's face, spraying him with crimson blood, but his thrilled expression never changed. His hand stayed frozen in front of him, gripping an arm that was no longer there. Those burgers should be real good, fellas. Just made them myself, with a little help from my pal back there. Missy was a darn good girl. I was hoping she could be my girlfriend, but I bet she'll be real tasty. Mm-hmm. I'm jealous. He continued to grind his teeth and grinned at us as we backed away. Oh, wait, I've still got some to snack on. The young man reached down and pulled out another surprise from beneath the counter. The severed arm appeared to have been charbroiled on the grill, in the Rumble Burger signature fashion, and had been glazed with something that looked sticky and dark red like barbecue sauce. He took a big bite and chewed, then spoke with his mouth full. Don't keep your queen waiting, Jordan. You know better than that. Enjoy your dinner with the future ruler of mankind. We will all be under her watchful eye one day as the... The door shut behind us as we backed away, cutting off the demented teenager's rambling rant. We fled the brightly painted restaurant and Philip sped away from there quickly in his car. The clock on the dashboard said 11.52. We were cutting it close. Too close. What the hell had I been thinking trying to have a normal life even just for a minute? Samantha gasped in the back seat. I looked back and saw the clerk had chosen a very specific toy for her kid's meal. Not the standard girl-boy option on display, which I think had been a choice between a miniature doll and a tiny car. I think my mom is still mad at me, Samantha said, pulling a large rat up and out of the bag by its tail. It was foaming at the mouth and its red eyes looked hungry and angry as it thrashed and tried desperately to bite her. Samantha swung it by its long tail and bashed its head swiftly once off the glass of the window beside her and put the disease vermin out of its misery. Philip rolled down her window at my request and she threw the thing into the gutter at the side of the road. By the time we arrived at the grounds of the old mental hospital, there were only two minutes left to spare. Why had I insisted on getting a burger? I wondered if it was another of Marianne's implanted thoughts. It was terrifying to consider the influence she had displayed in just that simple situation. She had brainwashed the fast food employees, and who knew how many others in town and beyond. I wondered what was in my burger. Probably Missy, the girl from the restaurant, and or a few mind-altering medications. I would bet good money on that. Philip pulled up in front of the house just seconds before the deadline. His tires squealed as he stopped and we jumped out. I spared one more moment to speak to him. Hurry up, we're almost out of time, Samantha said to me impatiently from the steps. Go knock on the door, I'll be right up, I said to her. I stayed with Philip and quickly whispered something to him. I felt like we were leaving too much to chance and suggested a way to mitigate the risks we were taking. Philip looked at me with anxious and surprised eyes. Remember that, okay? I asked him. 
No matter what, just remember that. He nodded and said he would tell the others. I gave him one last thank you as he drove away and turned around to walk up the steps to the front door where Samantha was waiting. I looked at my cell phone from the top step. 11.59. Samantha looked up at me expectantly. I nodded to her and knocked. I heard the soft click of heels coming to the door. There was no chain, no padlock now. They had been removed and the rotten, weathered front door was now decorated with a tasteful wreath dotted with summer flowers. Marianne opened the door wearing a red and white polka dot dress with a frilly white apron. She looked the part of a 1950s housewife, her hair done up and lips carefully painted with bright red lipstick. Well, hello, you two. What are you doing knocking? She smiled at us as if to say how silly we were. This is your home as much as it is mine. We're going to have many good years here, just the three of us. Her tone was kind and soothing. I noticed one of the red polka dots on her dress was larger, darker, and differently shaped than the others. The leaking blood was spreading beneath the bandage on her shoulder, where Samantha had impaled her with a sharpened broom handle. I smiled at the thought. Oh, look at that. You brought dinner, she said, smiling back and leading us into the house, closing the door behind us. Too bad you didn't bring enough for our guests. Flowers? Oh, you shouldn't have. She took the battered and wilted bouquet from me. Wipe off your shoes before you come in, she told us. She leaned over and planted a kiss on my cheek that left a bright red lipstick stain there. I kicked the dirt off my shoes and Samantha did the same. It made little difference, they were filthy. I looked inside the house and was horrified to see Ahmad, Dave, and Matt tied up to chairs and arranged like members of a dinner party around the table in the room off the entryway. They were gagged and making muffled screaming noises. They thrashed desperately against their bonds, which appeared far too tight. The flesh of their arms puckered and red around the ropes. Marianne had been three steps ahead of us from the beginning, as she always was. She took the food out of the paper bags and arranged it on the old, filthy dining table. It was covered in mold, dust, and hair, but she acted like she didn't notice, or care. A cobweb festooned chandelier swung from a mildew-black ceiling above us. The sagging ceiling hung down severely and threateningly in places, and I saw pieces of it on the floor. I looked into the next room and saw a bathtub had crashed through from upstairs at some point in the past. Mice and rats ran around in the corners of the room, and occasionally ventured up and down the chair legs we were sitting in. The mice also sniffed at the prisoners, biting off samples of the skin of their hands as the prisoners winced and made muffled yelps of pain. A large candelabra was lit in the center of the table, around which Marianne had arranged elaborate place settings and wine glasses filled with a dark red liquid. She pointed to the head of the table and motioned for me to sit there. She glared at Samantha and told her to sit wherever the hell she wanted. We sat down and she opened the containers from the fast food restaurant. This is what you eat now, Jordan. This is what you want. You don't want those other things. You don't need them. You're with us now. Just like you were meant to be. The double cheeseburger I had wanted so badly was not what I had gotten. They had really fucked up my order. Instead of two all-beef patties, it contained the fleshy face of a teenager. Missy, I thought sickly to myself. Grill marks were visible burnt into the nose and brow, and it was glazed with the same sticky red sauce that had covered the disembodied limb the fast food worker had been eating. They had also forgotten the cheese, I noticed. The cannibal queen was watching me closely as I inspected my cheeseburger from the fast food place. It was not really a burger, but instead the face of a teenage girl from the restaurant. Marianne had brainwashed the kid who served it to us, and probably a lot of other people around town. The cops for sure were brainwashed, we knew that much. I grabbed the fries out of the bag instead and sniffed at them, then took a suspicious bite out of one. I realized it tasted normal and kept eating. I was beyond hungry and they smelled delicious. I figured it would be pretty hard to slip something into french fries. If she offered me a drink, I would politely decline. I needed to pretend I trusted her again, like I was going to stay. I kicked Samantha's shin under the table to remind her to do the same. 
She sat up straighter and put on a thin, fake smile. You can't just eat french fries, silly goose, Marianne said with a grin as she sat down at her spot next to me. The other security guards looked terrified and in pain as they tried to stay silent in their suffering, gagged and tied up to chairs around the large dining table. I tried to remind myself I still had three other friends out there, and they had saved us once before. They could do it again. As I chewed on the french fries, I asked, Can you let these guys go now, Marianne? That was what you promised, right? I looked at her with what I hoped was a trusting gaze. Not yet. They haven't had dessert. It's a dinner party. You can't send the guests home without dessert. She made a high-pitched squeal of a giggle, and I thought again how she was acting very differently now. In the caves, she had been a stoic leader. Now she was behaving like a teenager with a crush. If she wasn't a psychotic, serial-killing cannibal, I might have been flattered at the attention. All right, I said. Let me at least call Philip to tell him they're here. Marianne grabbed my arm and told me to put my phone away at the dinner table. I could call Philip afterwards, she told me lightly. I obliged and decided not to push my luck. I ate a french fry and swallowed it quickly, then noticed it had a strange taste on my tongue. She snuck something in the salt, a manic voice in my mind said. I put the container down on the table and tried to determine what the taste had been. It was medicinal and unpleasant, and I suddenly felt full of dread. I wanted to stick my finger down my throat but found my arm wouldn't move. My head felt dizzy and light. The world buzzed and rang in lingering tones which swam in my head. She snuck something in the salt. She snuck something in the salt. She snuck something in the salt, the voice in my head chanted. You feeling all right, sweetie? Marianne asked, tilting her head slightly. Samantha hadn't touched her food and was looking at me like I was a complete idiot, shaking her head. The world suddenly spun around and wouldn't stop spinning, and I went to sleep with a painful bang to the head as my limp body hit the floor. She snuck something in the salt, my unconscious mind told me, dully and without humor. When I woke up again, I was in the bedroom with Marianne. My hands and feet were tied to the bed in a very BDSM kind of way, and she was looking at me hungrily from the doorway. Nice of you to finally wake up, sleepyhead, she said with a seductive grin. The room was still spinning, but it was starting to slow down. I want you to remember something, she told me, suddenly serious. You're not in charge here. I am. Your friends, Samantha, none of them are in charge. I am. So don't do anything to piss me off again. I won't forgive you so easily next time. But if you're loyal... She walked over to me and ran her finger down my face gently and seductively. If you're loyal, then you can be my king. You want to be my king, don't you? She looked at me, waiting. There was only one answer that wouldn't get me killed. Of course, I said. Music started to play softly through the wall, and I wondered where it was coming from. Marianne looked annoyed for a second, but then made a forget-it gesture by waving her hand, and I realized where the music was coming from. Samantha was playing a stereo in the room next door. I suspected Marianne had locked her in there. The music was strange and unidentifiable, and I wondered for a moment if Samantha had made it herself. I thought I told her to throw out that old CD player, Marianne said, undressing. Outside in the hallway, I was surprised to see a cannibal from the tunnels climbing up the stairs silently, trying not to be noticed by her. His ears were stuffed with something. I was too surprised to say anything and just watched him. He walked past our open door and took a key from his pocket, which he used to open the door next to ours, Samantha's happy place. Marianne didn't see him, but turned at the sound of the door opening. She suddenly stopped unzipping her dress and froze still like a statue, her head slightly turned in the direction of the sound. I realized I couldn't move even my fingers now, and those weren't tied up, obviously. I was paralyzed. Then Samantha walked in. She strode past her mom, her ears stuffed with decayed old wallpaper scraps. Marianne's eyes followed her in, but her body stayed frozen still. Samantha took a set of keys from the dresser and grabbed a couple other things from around the room, putting them into a bag she was carrying. When she was done collecting all the things she wanted from her mother's room, she walked up and stood over me. I didn't want to do this to you, but you didn't give me much choice, she said. My dad taught me a lot. 
See, my mom was never good with computers, but I was a quick learner. I started to pick things up very quickly, until pretty soon I was even better at creating subliminal messages than he was. My mom always relied on him for his technical skills. It was our little secret that he taught me everything he knew. I had never seen computers down in the caves, but I supposed it made sense. They had to make the CDs somewhere. Maybe down in the sub-basement they had a room hooked up with power, and Doug had smuggled some equipment down there. It made a strange sort of sense. I figured out a really good one I could use on people. I call it the statue song, she said with a devious smile. I wanted you to be my friend, Jordan. I really did. But you didn't want to be friends with me. You think I'm a freak, don't you? I couldn't say anything. Couldn't move my lips or my tongue. But I still thought it. I can help you, Samantha. You can have a normal life. Sure. You sound just like my dad when he sent me to the hospital. There's no such thing as normal for someone like me. She said as if she'd heard my thoughts. She pulled out a book of matches. I hate to lose my happy place, but you gave me no choice. Too many people know about this now. She pulled out a match and struck it against the abrasive back of the matchbook. The flame bloomed, and she took it and held it to the bottom of the ratty curtains, hanging around a window across the room. The flame caught quickly and raced up the dry old fabric. The whole house was made of ancient wood and would catch fire like dry kindling, I thought with sudden panic. I was going to die there, I realized. Samantha looked at me with sad eyes as she moved away from the curtains to stand by the door, not even sparing a glance at her mother, whose eyes burned with hatred. We could have been friends. But I remember how you looked at me after you saw my happy place. I believed you for a second when you said it was fine. Except you never felt the same about me after that. Suddenly you had fear and distrust in your eyes when you looked at me. And I can't stand to see that look from you. She spoke with eloquence and maturity, and I realized she'd been fooling me all along with her little kid act. The uncharacteristic moments of maturity weren't as confusing now. It had just been her struggling to keep up the act. I thought about the pictures painted in blood on the walls of the room, the quality and care she had put into the paintings to make them look childlike. She had wanted me to gush over them and tell her how great they were, as a test. I had failed the test and acted scared instead, only covering it up sloppily at the last second. I wondered if it would have mattered either way, but still, I wanted her to like me. If only so I didn't die. You tried to save me from her, so I'll give you a small chance at life, she said. It surprised me to see a look of remorse on her face, which she tried to hide behind the false bravado. I called your friends and told them your situation. Don't be surprised if you die before they get here, though. The smoke began to billow as she spared me one last glance and exited the room. She left the door open to facilitate the airflow. All the better to keep the fire burning. Smart girl, I thought. I only wish she was a little bit stupider. The fire got hot very quickly and began to spread across the room. I coughed and choked, retched and vomited, unable to get away from the black cloud which flowed toward me. The fire spread to the ceiling, then to the adjacent walls until it was everywhere. Marianne stood motionless, waiting for death near the doorway of the room. The strange music played on an endless loop loudly from next door. It hurt my brain and made me feel dizzy and wrong just listening to it. I heard clomping on the stairs as I began to feel faint and out of air. Then Philip charged in to save me yet again. He did me wrong once, but he was making up for it in spades, I thought to myself. The earplugs I had told him to wear when I had whispered to him outside were visibly sticking out of his ears, and he fiddled and poked them in further. Good, I thought. He had seen Marianne and realized something was seriously wrong, not to mention the walls and ceiling full of fire. Philip started to untie the bonds holding me, and I saw other people rush in behind him in the smoke. I thanked Tanya and Greg with my eyes as they helped to untie me. They pulled me off the bed roughly and dragged me out of the room to safety, awkwardly tilting me and turning me to get my frozen, outstretched arms and legs through the narrow doorway, as if I were a large and inconvenient sofa they had been asked to help a friend move. Pivot! shouted Philip. I don't know what that means! Greg shouted back, bumping my head into the door frame. They finally got me out of the door awkwardly and dragged me downstairs. 
out through the slightly wider front door and into the fresh air outside. As the music faded out of reach from my ears, I began to move and speak again. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit, I said, coughing out black stuff. You guys saved my life again. I can't thank you enough. What the hell happened in there? Philip asked, removing his earplugs. We backed away from the house, and Greg pulled out his phone to call the fire department. The house was a lost cause, that much was already obvious as flames shot out the top floor windows. But at least the surrounding structures could be saved if help was called. We would just have to make sure we were gone before they arrived. I had a feeling Marianne might try to use some subliminal attack, but I never thought for a second that Samantha would be the one we needed to worry about. I said, still coughing and wheezing between words. Samantha? What the hell? Was she behind everything all along? Tanya asked. I don't know what to believe anymore, but... I don't think so, I said. I think the apple just didn't fall far from the tree. Maybe she was tired of her mom bossing her around, and obviously she didn't take very kindly to me not complimenting her artwork. Very touchy, that one. So what are we going to do? Greg asked, hanging up from his 911 call. The cops are going to be here pretty soon with the fire department. We can't stick around here. He removed the battery from his phone and threw both parts into the blaze in front of us. I stood up suddenly and started to run toward the inferno. Philip grabbed me and pulled me back. What the hell are you doing? He asked. Dave, Ahmad, and Matt, they're still in there. In the dining room, just inside. I tried to run in again and Greg stood in my way. There's nobody in there, Jordan. I checked the whole ground floor. It was just you and Mary Ann, he said. Of course. Samantha was going to take over. She had the skills and ability to reformat the cannibals and install a new Samantha-based operating system. It seemed she had already started. I guess she was going to celebrate the start of her new rule with a very large feast, and the main course would be security guards three ways. At that moment, the stereo playing the hypnotic music must have finally died. We knew because we heard the sound of Marianne's screams as she burned to death upstairs. I was surprised she had lasted that long. That had almost been me, I realized. I looked at the four guards standing around me, earplugs in their hands. It was a good thing Greg's wife snored and he had a bunch of extra ones lying around or we all might be dead. I thought of Samantha and the wads of wallpaper she had jammed in her ears. Clearly she wasn't immune to her own subliminal messages. You guys got an extra set of earplugs for me? I asked. Because somehow I don't think we're done here yet. I'll bet anything she went back through that hatch and down to the tunnels. I looked towards the mental hospital in the distance. There was only one sure way down to the tunnels that I knew of. I didn't trust the secret old elevator anymore. It would be too easily sabotaged. I didn't like the idea of being trapped in the ancient steel contraption and starving to death inside of it. Our calls for help drowned out by several feet of concrete, passed off as delusion by nurses and patients would say they heard us screaming. The only way for sure that I knew we could get back down to the sub-basement was via the same room this had all started. I thought back to the day I had heard Samantha's voice, calling from behind the old wooden door at the bottom of the short flight of stairs, the creepy old alcove where we had all gotten bad feelings as we walked past over the years. That was where we needed to go. That was the only way to end this. Samantha wouldn't stop at just killing me and Marianne. I knew. She had grander ambitions. Just like her mom. We stood there watching the old mansion burn for a few moments longer than we should have. I heard the sirens of a fire truck wailing in the distance and looked around anxiously. I couldn't see anyone coming yet, but they were close. And that meant the brainwashed cops wouldn't be far behind. I really didn't want to see what they were going to do when they found out we had killed their cannibal queen. Samantha was clearly the real threat now. She was twice as devious and cunning as Marianne, her mother. I realized this too late and had almost paid the ultimate price for it. She had revealed to me a secret, though. That she had learned from her father how to make subliminal messages that were far more powerful than anything Marianne had made before. I had been able to overcome her mother's hypnotic suggestions to a certain extent, especially once I realized what was happening. But Samantha's statue song was far more persuasive than Marianne's self-help while you sleep CDs. Her mother and I had been frozen unable to save ourselves while the room burned around us. I shuddered to think what other suggestive songs Samantha had created. I need to get out of here, I said. 
Greg, Tanya, and Philip heard the siren as well, and we began to hurry in the direction of the old mental hospital. We needed to get back to the west end of the basement, where there was an old secret hatch leading to the basement and the old electroshock chambers that had been chained up for years. How we were going to get in was another issue. We were all off duty, so none of us had keys for the padlock. I can get Nathan to open the door for us when we get back there, Philip said, a step ahead of me. And then what exactly is the plan when we get down there? Tanya asked. Remember those freaks with the machetes who almost got us killed this morning? How could I forget? Mary Ann's royal guard. They would be more than a little upset with us, I thought. You're right, I said. We're not prepared for this at all. But if she gets down there ahead of us, we don't stand a chance against her. We need to get Samantha some help, I thought. But I didn't say this. The thought of having to kill her hadn't even crossed my mind. Not yet, anyways. We were still a couple hundred yards away from the hospital when the cop cars began to arrive. The four of us tried to stay in the shadows of a few large trees, which dotted the property where we were walking. Still, one of the cop cars began to veer off and headed in our direction. Shit, I said. One of them saw us. I pointed in the direction of the police car, which was now speeding rapidly toward us. I'll handle this, said Philip. He stopped moving and stood still, waving his hand at the cop car, which was now on the grass, closing in on us. A couple other cop cars had started heading our way as well. What do you mean? They're not your friends anymore, Philip. Those guys are going to kill us, I told him, trying to pull him away. There was no point, though. I realized we were too far away from the building. There was no chance of getting away. The car skidded to a stop in the grass near us, and two officers got out and drew their firearms, standing behind their car doors for cover. Get down on the ground now, one of the officers shouted. I began to comply when Philip spoke in a loud voice. Uh, Mary Ann's in that burning house over there, he said calmly. The officers' faces turned pale as ghosts, and they holstered their weapons quickly and got back into their car. The wheels spun and grass and mud went flying as the police car did a quick U-turn, and they raced off in the direction of the burning building. We watched them go in stunned silence. When the car pulled up at the building, we heard the officers shouting at other policemen as they got out of their vehicles. A fire truck had also arrived, and the firemen struggled to restrain the cops as they tried to run into the burning building. A few got past, and those who didn't fought the firefighters desperately. They struggled and squirmed away, and more ran into the blaze. Philip suddenly didn't look like he was feeling very well, as we watched the policemen run into the burning building one after another. The firefighters looked on, stunned. It's okay, Philip, I said. There was no way you could have known that was going to happen. For a second, he looked like he was about to walk in the direction of the house, but then he stopped. They were going to kill us, I said. Besides, there's nothing we can do about it now. I didn't know that for sure, but there was no sense making him feel worse than he already did. And one thing was for sure. A lot of people were going to die if we didn't stop Samantha. Let's go, I said, leading the way towards the loading dock at the back of the building, which opened into the basement. The doors down there were always unlocked, and I figured we would avoid detection better by moving through the basement to get to the security office upstairs. We ran the distance to the doors as fast as we could, and by the time we got there, we were all out of breath. I paused to give everyone a chance to get a quick rest. It was a good thing, because I had a thought just before we went inside. I think we should all put in our earplugs now, I said, just in case. No one spoke a word of argument. The consequences of hearing another one of Samantha's songs was certainly not a pleasant thing to think about. We all put our earplugs in and I opened the doors to the loading bay area. It was full of pallets stacked halfway to the ceiling, loaded with food, drinks, toiletries, and other necessary supplies. All the things needed for life in the mental hospital. The place was essentially a small town, so there was a lot needed to keep it running day to day. I heard music playing softly in dull, low tones through my muffled ears. Not good. There was either a radio playing in the loading bay, or Samantha had hijacked the PA system and was using it to play one of her special songs. I wasn't sure which it was, but I had a feeling it was the second one. The dull tones of the music sounded strange and unpleasant through the earplugs. Keep your earplugs in tight, I shouted so the others could hear me. Then I remembered we were trying to avoid detection. Damn it, that was dumb. I thought to myself. Lack of sleep will do funny things to you. And it had been a while since I'd had a good night's rest. My headache was coming back, and I could tell it was going to be one for the record books. As always, it felt like pressure building in my eyeballs and behind them, 
then grew and spread to my forehead. The pain and pressure nestled in there like a poisonous, spike-covered snake, and took a bite from my brain every time I saw any sort of light. Stepping into the fluorescence from the darkness outside had felt like someone was jamming ice picks into my eyes, and the gray matter behind my forehead every second, but I continued forward leading the group. I squinted, trying to block out some of the bright lights, as my head pounded in time with my heartbeat. We rounded a corner, and there were three uniformed security guards standing there waiting for us. Their eyes looked far into the distance past and through us. The one in the middle, Nathan, spoke. His voice sounded like an adult in a Charlie Brown cartoon through the earplugs, but I think I knew roughly what he was saying. <laughs> Hello, my good friends. We will be murdering you now. I honestly don't know, but that's what I guessed from reading his body language. Either way, the axe and the long flashlights they were holding pretty much told the whole story. We pulled out our own weapons. Philip once again had his own trusty axe. Greg had a baseball bat. And I just noticed that Tanya had stolen her stepbrother's katana, which was pretty fucking excellent, if I do say so myself. Way to go, Tanya. Philip had brought an extra knife for me, and I felt far less prepared than everyone else. I would need to get very close up to use my weapon. Why the hell was I standing up front? Before I had a chance to selfishly ask someone to switch places with me, the other guards attacked. They came at us with their large, heavy flashlights and axe. Nathan, wielding an axe he'd stolen from one of the fire cabinets, came straight at me, a crazed look in his far-off eyes. Spittle flew from his mouth and his nostrils flared, his face red as he raced towards me, the axe raised up and ready to swing. I dove out of the way just as it came down and sliced my left leg, thankfully only grazing it and taking a deli-style slice out of my shoe. I looked over and saw that Philip was swinging his axe, and it removed the top half of Nathan's head with one quick and silent swing. It appeared he had sharpened his axe blade. Tanya swung her katana and managed to remove several fingers from one security guard. He continued toward her anyways, as if he hadn't even noticed. She swung the sword again and took off the top half of his face. He jumped toward her like he hadn't felt a thing. He landed on top of her and lunged at her throat with his teeth, grabbing her and pulling her toward him with his mangled, bloody hand. The guard tore and bit at her neck and blood flew everywhere. The katana was sticking through the guard's neck, and I saw she had impaled him with it when he landed on top of her. I ran over and pulled the son of a bitch off of her, but it was already too late. Tanya's throat was in ruins. It looked like she'd been attacked by hyenas. Her esophagus was ripped in half and her trachea appeared gnawed and bitten at. What the hell was the message in the song Samantha was currently playing, brainwashing the entire mental hospital with? Anyone who comes inside, rip out their throats with your bare teeth? Was that the message Samantha was broadcasting on her hellish hospital radio station? Greg was using his baseball bat to good effect. He was hitting the last remaining guard over the head with it when he came at him. The first few blows only stunned him, but the man went down hard to the floor with the last swing, and stayed down for the count. I could already see several large goose eggs rising on his head. We took a few moments to say our silent goodbyes to Tanya. And then it was only me, Greg, and Philip left. I kicked the man over onto his back and pulled out the katana. Blood spurted out like a geyser and sprayed me in the face. But at least now I had a really nice sword. Goodbye, pocket knife. Sorry, Tanya. I pointed ahead as Philip grabbed the keys from Nathan's belt. Nathan's ruined head was pouring blood and cerebrospinal fluid everywhere. The clear fluid mixed with the red blood and made a strange cocktail on the tile floor, which we tried to step around without getting our shoes wet. Blood gets so sticky when it starts to dry. It's like stepping in soda. And who wants that? Ugh. At least now we have the keys. That would eliminate the need to make a trip upstairs. I paused for a second. The music was playing from the PA system. That meant Samantha was here, in the hospital, because the main office was the only place with access to the PA system. I grabbed Philip's arm and stopped him. I pointed up and mouthed the words at him. She's upstairs. He looked at me, surprised, then nodded his head and told Greg what I had just told him. We went into the basement hallway and turned left. No one was around. Good news for once, I thought. There was a door to our left with a staircase that went up to the main floor. Philip pushed it open and went in first with his axe. He was covered in blood and gore, as was I. 
Greg had managed to stay mostly clean, and I was slightly jealous of his choice of weapon. If we ever had to explain ourselves to the authorities, who hadn't been brainwashed by Mary Ann, it would have been nice to not be covered in blood for the affair, I thought. We got to the main floor, and Philip pushed open the door and walked into the hallway. I followed him and bumped right into him, realizing he had stopped dead in his tracks. The hallway on the main floor was full of mental patients. They had been let out of the locked units and were roaming without supervision. The dull music played overhead softly through the earplugs, just quiet enough that we couldn't hear the message lying below the lyricless tunes. The message that said, Kill. Rip out their throats with your teeth. All of the patients turned to look at us at once. There was no way we could fight them all. And I was not interested in creating a bloodbath of essentially innocent mentally ill patients. It was one thing to defend ourselves, but this was just a bad idea. I was already regretting coming here. To our complete surprise, the music stopped suddenly. The patients stood where they were and looked around at each other confused and dazed. Holy shit, those guys are covered in blood, one patient said. Oh my god, he's got a sword, said another. I looked at Philip and mouthed a question. What the hell was she doing? She could have finished us right then and there. The voice on the PA said. I took out one earplug hesitantly. I was ready to pop it right back in if I needed to. Philip and Greg did the same. Oh good, you took out those stupid earplugs. Samantha's voice came over the PA. Look, I don't want to kill you guys, okay? Just leave. I'll let you leave and I won't kill you. But you have to make a promise to not come after me again, got it? Look, I just want to make a YouTube channel. Maybe a podcast. It's 2023, after all. My mom was living in the past making CDs. You can reach a way bigger audience online these days. And the word spreads quickly when a song is good. I think mine will be a hit, don't you? I call it Tear Out Their Throats by Samantha Lambert. Pretty good, right? Think I'll get a record deal? Her laughter came through the speaker, sounding tinny and childish. So loud it pierced my ears. What do you guys want to do? Philip asked. Looks like we're damned if we do, damned if we don't, I said. Greg was silent and waited for us to decide. He was ready for anything. I could tell that much just by the crazed look on his face. We had seen too many of our own die, but this was like committing suicide if we went ahead with it. Or was it? I had an idea. Plug your ears, I yelled at the top of my lungs to the patients. She's brainwashing you, but she can't do it if you plug your ears. I watched as the mental patients looked at me, then each other, confused. I probably wasn't the most credible source, especially covered head to toe in blood as I currently was. I just hoped this would work. Plug your ears! She's brainwashing you with the music on the PA! But she can't do it if you plug your ears! I yelled again. I sound insane, I thought to myself. The mental patients standing in the hallway stared at us, their jaws agape. We were covered in blood and gore from our encounter with the brainwashed security guards downstairs. Only Philip, Greg, and I were left. Tanya had just been killed and her horrible, gruesome death was still fresh in our minds. If they didn't do it in a second or two, the music would turn back on. Samantha's song. The one that made those who heard it attack us viciously and without mercy. That was how Tanya had died, and subsequently I had managed to pick up her extremely badass katana, which she'd been carrying as a weapon. A souvenir her brother had brought back from Tokyo. The weapon's weight felt perfectly balanced in my hands, and I could tell it was not a cheap gift store knockoff. It was Tanya's brother's prized possession, and he had paid a small fortune for it. A few mental patients plugged their ears immediately, looking dazed and concerned with how they had ended up in the hallway. My explanation seemed to suit a few of the conspiracy theorist patients quite nicely, and they were quick to follow my instructions, even covered in gore as I was. Perhaps that even gave some credence to my wild statement. It was obvious to everyone that something strange was going on, even for this place. Other patients followed along after seeing the more paranoid ones do it, and they covered their ears as well. One patient seemed to have a breakdown and covered his ears, getting down on the floor and rocking back and forth, screaming. The music came back on suddenly, very loudly. We had already put our own earplugs back in, and they blocked the sound despite the decibel level. 
many of the patients had managed to cover their ears in time, but some were not so trusting, and their eyes began to gaze past us a thousand yards and beyond. They began to march slowly toward us and then ran in our direction. Oh shit, I said. Wah wah. My voice came out sounding like a comedic trumpet telling you something silly had just happened in a sitcom or cartoon. The office where Samantha was controlling the PA system was only a short distance away, but there were now more than a dozen mental patients blocking our path, most of them with one subliminally planted thought on their minds, to rip out our throats. We need to go, Philip mouthed, pointing downstairs. Now. We opened the door beside us and retreated back to the basement. We ran down the stairs two and three steps at a time and reached the door leading to the basement hallway. The lower level of the hospital was still empty for the most part and we fled to the west. I imagined a dozen brainwashed patients running down the stairs behind us and ran even faster along the polished linoleum floors. My heart beat in my ears with a dull thudding sound. My shoes slipped occasionally on the slick floors due to all the blood that coated them. I looked back and saw I was leaving bloody tracks behind me and saw our pursuers were not far behind. There were about a dozen of them and they were running very quickly faster than I was. The records room, Philip shouted. We opened the doors quickly and slammed them shut behind us. Philip used his keys to lock them just as the patients collided with the steel door. It rattled and the doorknob turned back and forth. Crazed eyes looked at us through the crosshatch safety glass. The door shook in its frame and we backed away, hoping it would hold. There's a staircase in here, Greg yelled, leading us toward a door. I hadn't spent much time in this room, so I had no idea it was even there. Another hidden feature of the mental hospital. As I've said before, it was like the Clue Mansion, and I was discovering something new around here every day. Philip opened a narrow door which led to a spiral staircase. I tried to picture where it would go to. Greg answered that question for me. This opens up on the administrative area near the switchboard desk. It's our best shot at getting into that PA system and shutting off that music. Greg shouted loud enough for us to hear through the earplugs. We ran up the old steel staircase and came out in a hallway across from the switchboard office. This was where the nurse manager's office was, I realized. This was a personal staircase that she could use to easily access the records room, since she oversaw the cases of all the patients in the hospital and needed to look up patient information frequently. I looked around when we came out of the door but didn't see anyone. Then the door to my right began to swing open the nurse manager's office. The large, imposing woman who stepped out was about six feet tall, and had a terrifying look in her eyes as she raced toward us, her massive belly and breast swinging back and forth with each speedy step she took. She screamed something at us that sounded like, Mwah! through the earplugs. Her hands were outstretched like talons, and her long nails appeared freshly painted in crimson red, I noticed. As she got close, I silently apologized for what I was about to do. I held the katana out and thrust it forward into her eye. She kept coming toward me, the sword sinking in deeper and deeper, veering off towards the side and away from her brain. Her hands came close to my throat as the blade got stuck on the back of her skull. It began to sink in deeper and her gnashing teeth and distant-looking eyes got closer and closer to my screaming face. Greg ran over and began to swing his baseball bat at her head. He swung it again and again as her dome became depressed and sunken at the side and top. Her thrashing and biting movements became slower and eventually stopped altogether. She dropped to the ground, and I struggled unsuccessfully to release my sword, since it was lodged so tightly in the back of her skull. I stood there panting, in complete shock. I had known that woman well, and had just killed her in a gruesome fashion. The worst part was it wasn't even her fault. I had been defending myself from her. She almost killed me, I told myself. Greg put his hand on her forehead and I winced as he pulled the blade out of her eye with a hard yank. He almost tipped over off balance, but managed to right himself and handed me the sword. He wiped off blood from his bat and I noticed he seemed to be handling himself pretty well. I remembered him telling me once that he had been in the military and realized I had forgotten that part about him. He had also played a bit of baseball in college. I was guessing he had a better than average slugging percentage. The music continued to play dully through our earplugs and we walked as quietly as we could to the door that led to the hallway, where there was another door that we could quickly open and access where Samantha was hiding in the main office. At least I hoped she was still there. I held up my hand and counted down, three, two, one, go, 
then opened the door as we raced across the hall, stepping around a couple mental patients who were still covering their ears, thankfully. They gave us wide-eyed looks of fear, and we nodded at them as we raced past. Keep your ears covered, I mouthed. Philip had the key ready and opened the door quickly with the practice motion of an experienced security professional. It swung open, and we raced into the narrow hallway and closed the door behind us. The short hallway we just stepped into led towards another perpendicular hallway, with two other potential exits, and I realized I had made a mistake. Ideally, one of us should have been blocking each of the doors to prevent any attempt at escape, but it was too late. I saw Samantha race past, down the narrow hallway just ahead of us, running away towards the door ahead of us and to the right, which took her out of the main office area. Two cannibals moved slowly behind her, dragging a woman who was tied up and gagged, struggling to resist them. The two men saw us and dropped the woman immediately. They ran to catch up with Samantha. I noticed that they also had bright orange earplugs in, and were clearly not affected by the subliminal message playing on the overhead PA. The woman thrashed and struggled in the hallway, blindfolded and terrified. They had dropped her roughly to the floor, and my first instinct was to check and see if she was okay. I looked ahead and saw one of the cannibals had a gun. He was pointing it straight at me, and I ducked behind the wall just as I heard the loud crack of it firing. A hole appeared in the wall just beside me, and I stayed where I was, terrified, until I heard the door close. I waited a few seconds longer before daring to look out, and saw they were gone. We decided not to pursue, since we didn't want to get shot. We would just have to wait a few minutes and follow them to where we knew they were going. The room in the basement at the west end. The secret hatch that led back down to the tunnels. Philip ran into the switchboard office and turned off the CD player which was connected to the PA system. He took out the CD and carefully tucked it away as evidence. With the music off, we took out our earplugs. We managed to take the blindfold off the woman's face and she looked around and realized she was safe. I saw she also had earplugs in and I took them out for her. I told her the men who had kidnapped her were gone and that she was safe. We untied her wrists and took the gag out of her mouth. I couldn't help but wonder why Samantha would want to kidnap this woman. She had gone to a lot of trouble to do so. I saw she had an ID badge clipped to her shirt. Her name was Debbie, and I realized I recognized her. She was a registered nurse on E3, the unit where Marianne had worked. With all the bindings undone, the woman looked relieved and began to take giant, gasping breaths. You saved me, Debbie said after regaining her composure. They were going to take me back down there. I can't go back down there. I can't. She looked up at us with wide, terrified eyes that darted back and forth between us. You know what's going on, Debbie continued. I can tell. I was so afraid to tell anyone what I knew. I didn't think anyone would believe me. How much do you know? She asked us, her words coming out rapid fire. Well, we know that there's a clan of brainwashed cannibals living beneath the mental hospital. We know they kidnap patients and indoctrinate them or eat them. Now you tell us, what is it that you know? I asked. You're that guard, she said in surprise. The one who went missing. Marianne took you, didn't she? I nodded my head in confirmation. I used to be her best friend, Debbie said, still catching her breath. We used to travel together. Before all this started, years and years ago, another lifetime ago before she met Doug. She said that last sentence with a venomous tone that I was not expecting. Tell us what you know, I said. And hurry. We don't have much time. Debbie looked at me and seemed at a loss for words for a few seconds. I don't. I just can't. She looked at us with a blank stare, and I realized she was in shock. Philip must have noticed as well. Come on, let's sit down here for a second. Philip said, opening the door to the security office just next to us. We went into the small room and offered Debbie the worn but comfortable chair that had been Doug's favorite. She sat down with a sigh and put her head in her hands. She began breathing quickly and her hands started to tremble. Then she took a deep breath and composed herself. No, I'm not going to do that. I can't. She stared straight ahead for a few moments as if lost deep in thought. And then she looked directly in my eyes and started to tell her tale. I have to start from the beginning so you'll understand. See, I didn't care much for Marianne the first time I met her. She was arrogant, rude. She always had to be the one running the show, even when she was a young nurse. 
Debbie took a breath, then continued. We worked on the same floor for ten years together, though. And I eventually got used to her personality. When you work together for a long time, you can't help but start to form a bond. After a few years ago, I could just look at her when a patient was about to go off, and she knew, just by the look in my eyes, that she needed to go drop some Haldol or Olanzapine and get ready to call a code white. She took another deep breath and continued. After a while, we got to know each other outside of work. We were both single, didn't have many friends, so we started going out together occasionally. I made a couple other friends from work, and they started coming out with us too, and we had a regular night every other week on Fridays, and we jokingly called it the Psycho Nurses Sorority. We were all burnt out by that point, starting to feel like we were turning into mental patients ourselves. I've gotten better since then, but back then I was really having a hard time, and trying to figure out if I was in the right line of work, or if I should figure out something new. I thought again about what Ahmad had said to me months before, and felt a pang of remorse that he was being held prisoner down in the tunnels beneath us. I tried to remember his words, and they came back to me suddenly. We become like the people we surround ourselves with. The people we spend time with. And here, we're surrounded by mental patients. Truer words were never spoken. This nurse I had just met was echoing that observation. I had heard that psych nurses and doctors could sometimes develop mental problems. Sometimes even worse than those of the patients. I still wasn't sure if I would go that far in most cases, but... Marianne was the exception that proved the rule. The cannibal queen had been truly and completely insane, that was for certain. I tried to imagine her as a lady out on the town with her friends and struggled to comprehend it. In my mind, she was akin to the devil. I can see that look on your face, Debbie said. She's changed a lot since then, I can tell you that much. Sorry, Debbie, I didn't mean to judge. Go ahead, I said and looked at the clock. We were spending too much time here, I thought. But this could be very important information. We needed to know what she knew, especially if Samantha had been trying to kidnap her to keep her quiet. I guess that was the case. Besides, there was no sense pursuing too closely behind men with guns. If we caught up with them in the tunnels, they might be afraid to use them in case of a ricochet. Maybe not. I tried to rack my brain and think of a shortcut we could use to cut them off, while continuing to listen to her story. Anyways, Debbie continued, the group of us would go out regularly, and that went on for years. Marianne and I got even closer, and we started traveling together. We went to Europe, Africa, Malaysia, and Thailand. What does this have to do with anything? I thought to myself impatiently. It was from traveling that she started to pick up this... fascination, Debbie added. It really disgusted me, quite frankly, and I couldn't understand it for the life of me. She looked at the ground. Marianne had become interested in cannibalism. There aren't many tribes left out there that practice it still. There are almost none, in fact. But there used to be more. They practiced cannibalism out of necessity, from what I read. They ate their dead, and some went insane from eating the brains. I never did that much research, but Marianne became engrossed in the subject. Greg offered Debbie a bottle of water from the mini-fridge in the room. She took it and drank the water in big gulps. Soon after that, her personality started to change. She became odd and distant. All she ever wanted to talk about was her weird cannibalism fetish. That's what it seemed like to me, anyways. It wasn't healthy. Like, she would talk about it in front of the patients. As if they need that sort of talk while they're trying to get well. Soon after I stopped speaking with her outside of work, she met Doug. He was new here, fresh out of the military. They hit it off one day after a code white. She mentioned something off the cuff about cannibalism. I remember his face lit up and he started going on and on about some pygmy tribe in Malaysia or the Congo. I honestly don't remember. I stopped listening and walked away, but 20 minutes later they were still chatting. I saw her give him a piece of paper with her phone number on it, but didn't ask her about it. We were barely talking at that point, and she seemed resentful because the other nurses and I were still going out for drinks without her. Not that she wanted to go anyway. She took another deep breath and a sip of water before continuing. They started seeing each other outside of work, and pretty soon they moved in together. That's what I gathered anyways. A couple years later, they suddenly had a daughter, like, totally out of the blue. No one knew where this kid came from. It was like she had appeared out of thin air. Then they said they were homeschooling her and showed off pictures proudly. I assumed she was adopted or a foster child, obviously, because she looked to be around ten years old, and she looked nothing like either one of them. I thought about it for a moment. It had never occurred to me, but Samantha didn't look like her mom or dad at all. 
She had said Marianne wasn't her mother, but was it possible that Doug also wasn't her biological father? Suddenly the doorknob outside in the hallway started to jiggle. Then the door began to shake and someone banged on it hard from the outside. Someone pounded on the door with their fists. The other two locked doors started receiving similar beatings, and we heard the sound of someone kicking the doors and trying to break them down. Oh, fuck, I said. Who the hell is that? I don't know, said Philip, but I sure as hell don't want to find out. Police, open up. We know you're in there. Double fuck. Philip's eyes lit up suddenly, and he seemed to have an idea. There's a utility hatch. I think it goes down to the basement from the phone room next door. I had seen the hatch in the floor, but I had no idea where it went to. It was a narrow trap door that looked like it was meant for utility workers to quickly go down to the basement below where the main telephone connection room was. Let's go, I said. We left the security office quickly. The cops had been brainwashed by Marianne, and there was no way of knowing what they would do if they caught us. Samantha had probably called them herself and told the 911 operators our names, and that we had killed her mother. She could play the part of the sad little girl quite well. I had seen it myself. She was a very impressive actor when she wanted to be. We quietly locked the security office door behind us and snuck into the room next door. We closed the door behind us and Philip quietly pried open the hatch down to the basement. Greg, Philip, and Debbie went down one by one into the darkness of the basement below. I waited and went last. As I closed the hatch behind me and went down the ladder, I heard the confused voices of the police officers in the hallway outside. What the hell? They were here a minute ago. We stayed as quiet as we could and proceeded out of the phone room into the basement hallway. Wasting no time, we headed west, towards where the electroshock therapy room was. The place where all of this started. There was a corner up ahead, and as we came up to it, I thought I heard a noise. Wait, I said, not fast enough. Greg went around the corner first, and the razor-sharp machete blade sliced through his head like it was an overripe watermelon. The top half fell to the floor with a wet thud. His skull and brain spilled out with a splash of cerebrospinal fluid. Then Greg's lifeless body collapsed to the polished linoleum with it. His baseball bat was still clutched tightly in his hand as he lay dead, his foot twitching ever so slightly. The cannibal who came around the corner looked cruel and remorseless. I recognized him from the tunnels as one of Marianne's personal guards. I never knew his name, but he moved like he was born to fight. He sidestepped out from behind the wall and looked at the three of us with no fear in his eyes. We made a wall in front of Debbie and I handed her my old pocket knife. I had Tanya's katana now and I was ready to use it. That motherfucker just killed Greg, I thought. Greg had saved my life. Greg had a daughter. He had shown me pictures of her on his phone when she had been born. He'd been so happy that day. The son of a bitch bared his teeth at us and swung his machete blade with a practiced motion, moving it from hand to hand as he spun it with the grace of a street performer or stage magician doing a performance piece with knives. Suddenly, he sprang forward. He leapt quickly to the right, drawing my focus that way. I repositioned my body just as he sprang to the left, and with an acrobatic maneuver, he bounded off the wall and swung his blade right at my face. I was completely caught off guard, still unbalanced from pivoting to my left. I was surprised and outwitted by his agility and skillful movements. But Philip was prepared. He swung his axe as I recoiled, terrified. The axe blade sheared off the cannibal warrior's face with one clean swing. His machete caught my leg as he fell to the floor and I grabbed it, wincing in pain. Philip took another large swing of his axe and the blood sprayed high into the air as it connected with the massacred face of the man. Philip wiped off his axe blade on his pant leg and surprisingly, without skipping a beat, said we should keep moving. How are you guys so fucking calm right now? Debbie asked as we walked away from the lifeless corpse of our friend and foe, without a second glance. I've kind of been through some shit, Debbie, I said, putting pressure on my leg and ripping a strip of fabric from my shirt to make a makeshift tourniquet. Come on, let's go. You can tell us the rest of your story on the way. I get the feeling it's important that we hear the rest of what you have to say. She nodded and took a few moments to gather her thoughts again. I led the way forward on wobbly legs, terrified of what might be around the next corner. We had lost one more friend, but Greg would not have wanted us to stop. We needed to do everything in our power to stop Samantha. The fate of the world was in our hands for all I knew. I had heard her subliminal message magic, and one thing was for sure. If she pulled off her plan and one of her tracks went viral on YouTube, we would all be in a lot of trouble. 
The basement of the old mental hospital was quiet once again as we continued walking. We stepped past the dead cannibal's lifeless body, and a thought suddenly occurred to me. I pulled back his long, greasy black hair and found a pair of wireless earbuds planted in his ears. I took them out and held them up to the light. Music played softly from them. Shit. I looked up at my one remaining security guard friend. Are those what I think they are? Philip asked. But I didn't even bother responding. I just took the cell phone out of the man's pocket and immediately turned the volume all the way down. The screen was locked, but at least I could do that much from pushing the buttons on the side. The music decreased in volume until it was gone altogether. I dropped the phone to the floor and felt a satisfying crunch as I brought my shoe down on the screen. I knew she was dangerous, Debbie said, but I had no idea she was capable of something like this. It might be a good idea for you to finish your story, I told her. If she's got one of these assholes down here hunting for us, there's bound to be more. That guy was one of Marianne's personal guards, back when she was the cannibal queen. I guess now they're serving a new monarchy. Cannibal queen? Debbie rolled her eyes. Had I ever said that name out loud before? My brain was fuzzy from lack of sleep. The usual filter between mind and mouth was currently on hiatus. A little bit cheesy, don't you think? But yeah, I suppose that makes a sick sort of sense. You said earlier that you didn't want to go back down to the tunnels, I said to Debbie, only now realizing the implication of her words. That means you've already been down there once, right? How did that come about? We were walking towards the west end of the mental hospital's basement, where the old electroshock therapy room was. We kept our voices low to try to avoid detection. I made the mistake of confronting her. I realized there was something going on when I noticed that her car never left the parking lot. I didn't say anything about it to her just to see how long it would sit there for. It started to gather dust. I waited another couple months before I said something. I needed to be sure. We were coming up to another bend in the long corridor. As I've described before, the mental hospital's ancient basement was spooky to say the least. There were no convex mirrors at the corners to show you who was coming when you got to a turn like this. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as Debbie talked, and we rounded the corner. Philip held his axe up high, ready to strike. The corridor stood empty as we stepped carefully around the bend. Somewhere far off in the distance, I heard the soft squeak of shoes on linoleum. There was no way of knowing who it could be. There's someone coming, I said. We can't keep walking down this hallway out in the open like this. It's a disaster waiting to happen. Then I had an idea. I think there might be a better way, I said, and led them down a side hallway. What's that? asked Philip. I thought we were going down to the old electroshock therapy room to get back down to the sub-basement. Trust me, I said. I opened a pair of double doors revealing an ancient hallway. It led south towards an old service tunnel. No one ever used this old section. It had been left derelict and empty and smelled damp and rotten. The dim, incandescent lights were few and far between. Many of them burnt out. The corridor ahead of us stretched off into the distance, and I led them down it, into the darkness. The shadows grew longer and blacker as we proceeded towards the end. When we finally got to the end, I looked to the left. There was a very narrow corridor there which led east, away from the electroshock therapy room, which had been our goal. Come on, let's hurry, I said, sweeping cobwebs out of the way and ducking into the darkness of the side tunnel. It took a few seconds for them to follow me, but I was glad when they did. I heard Philip and Debbie's footsteps moving cautiously behind me, and looked back to see Debbie's terrified face a few feet back. She was picking up her pace and trying to keep up. The darkness was oppressive, and it became nearly impossible to see as we made our way deeper into the tunnel. The cinder block walls pressed in closely from the sides, and there was no ventilation. The air was filled with dust and a terrible smell like rot and mildew that made it difficult to breathe. A mouse scampered through the tunnel past my feet, and I felt something else brush past my legs a few seconds later. This one larger. Probably a rat instead of a mouse. I walked into spider webs constantly. They became a shroud over my face as I continued forward, ignoring their sticky feel against my skin. I felt the spiders crawling down my back and tried to brush them away with little success. Large, black millipedes skittered up my arms occasionally, and I brushed them away only to find more had taken their place a few seconds later. I heard Debbie breathing rapidly behind me and sounding more and more terrified. I thought maybe a bit of distraction was in order. Hey, Debbie? 
You were telling us about how you discovered Marianne never left the hospital, so... Did you spy on her and find out she was going down to the tunnels? I asked quietly. She waited a few seconds before responding in a trembling, terrified voice, which seemed to steady the longer she spoke. Kind of, I guess, Debbie answered. I caught her going out to Century Manor one night. I was waiting in my car, watching the exit to see if she would eventually come out. She always stayed late at work, and people joked that she lived there. But I figured out she was always just waiting for everyone else to go home for the night. She didn't want any prying eyes when she walked out there. She had also probably talked to Doug, I thought to myself. Since Doug was a security guard, he would have known the approximate locations of any of their guards, and could have informed her of their movements. He also would have used his access to the supervisor's key to make a duplicate of the Century Manor key, I assumed. I watched her go in there, and she never came back out. I waited and waited for her to come out of there, and she never did. Debbie paused and caught her breath. Philip followed quietly behind us, listening to her story. So the next day on her lunch break, I asked her about it. I made sure we were alone. See, at that point, I was still thinking I, like I was her friend. I was worried about her. I wondered if she was having some sort of mental breakdown. She was acting weirder and weirder every day. What did she say when you asked her about it? Philip's voice echoed in the tunnel behind me. She was surprised, I could tell that much, Debbie said. One thing about Marianne, she was always two steps ahead of everyone else. I got the feeling she was really nervous when I was asking her about the whole thing. She kept looking over her shoulder at the door to make sure no one was going to come in and hear what we were talking about. Eventually, she made up some story about a missing patient and how Doug had given her a key to check inside the old building. It sounded made up, but at the same time, we were missing more than one patient, so I guess it seemed plausible. I didn't press her on it, Debbie explained. It seemed like the more questions I asked, the more upset she got. Which I know from working with patients is usually a tactic to try and get out of awkward confrontations. It's a lot easier to get angry than to actually discuss something rationally. Anyways, I let it go after that and went home for the night. I went to bed and woke up to see someone standing over me in the darkness in my bedroom. I didn't see their face. It was covered with a black ski mask. I screamed, but they covered my mouth with a wet rag that smelled like chemicals. When I woke up, I was down in those tunnels. Finally, we reached the area I was aiming for. We made our way out of the old service tunnel and back to the main quarter of the basement. We crossed through it quickly to the north side of the main hallway. In the distance, I heard the sound of footsteps again. Probably police, I thought, judging by their numbers. They were looking for us. I showed Philip the door and told him to open it with the GM key. We went inside the storeroom. I checked to the right and saw what I was looking for. There's a trap door under those tiles, I said. There was now a large cabinet standing on top of the spot where I'd once crawled out of the sub-basement, what felt like a lifetime ago. They had rearranged the room in the past couple of months. Here, help me move this, I said to Philip. We each took one end of the large cabinet and managed to move it over a few feet with a great effort. It was extremely heavy. I pulled up the loose tiles and showed them the trap door. Remember when we were trying to get out of the sub-basement we couldn't get that hatch open? Even Roger tried and it wouldn't budge? I grabbed the handle on top of the hatch, pulling it open with an effort. The blackness below was oppressive. Ladder rungs disappeared down into the darkness, and I was about to descend when I heard Debbie starting to hyperventilate. No, 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 she said. Oh, no, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can go back down there. We need you, Debbie, I told her honestly. Somehow I don't think we can do this without you. I don't know why I believe that, but I do. If we don't stop her, she's going to infect the whole world with her madness. You've seen what she's capable of. And it sounds like you know something that might be able to help. Why else would she have been trying to kidnap you earlier? Debbie took a deep breath and stared at the ground for a while. Then she steadied herself and looked me in the eyes. Okay. Alright, I know we need to stop her. Ever since I escaped those tunnels, I've had nightmares about this day. Knowing that I'd have to come back down here and finish this once and for all. I'm just glad you're both here with me and I don't have to do this by myself. Debbie spoke with courage and I admired her more with each word. I realized she was a good person after all. There was no doubt about that. She was willing to risk her life to stop Samantha, knowing that many more would die if we didn't. Philip and I had made the same choice and had watched three friends of ours perish after doing the same. She took another deep breath and dropped down into the darkness below. 
The blackness swallowed her up until I could see her no more. I followed after her, and then Philip climbed down. When we reached the sub-basement floor, Debbie was already using her phone to illuminate the dark space with her flashlight app. Mice and rats squeaked and fled from us, and cockroaches swarmed away from the light and into the shadows. We made our way to the tunnel beneath E-Wing. The main tunnel branched off to the right, up ahead, and we approached it cautiously. Samantha and her two followers were at the other end of the building, but she could have others down here keeping an eye out for us. Once we reached the corner, I hesitated. I had watched Greg die just minutes before as he walked around a blind corner like this one. I grabbed a loose piece of concrete and threw it up ahead, trying to see if it would cause a reaction from someone waiting around the corner. It did. The machete blade swung down in the darkness and caught the piece of concrete and sent it flying. I heard muted laughter from around the corner. It was another of Mary Ann's guards. He was waiting for us. The man stepped out into the space in front of us, blocking our path. He was still a few yards away, but I knew he was capable of closing that distance quickly. I also had no doubt that there was a pair of earbuds in his ears, and a phone in his pocket transmitting another one of Samantha's songs as well. The man was just another puppet of the new cannibal queen. His mouth turned up at the corners in an awful smirk, devoid of any humor. His eyes looked inky black in the darkness of the tunnels as he stepped toward us, his machete hanging down at his side, clutched in his hand. I was out front again with my katana, which I had taken from Tanya's dead body. I silently promised once again to avenge her death, and return the cherished sword to its owner, her brother. It would undoubtedly need a good cleaning, though. The ceiling hung down low, and the walls pressed in closely at our sides. A feeling of claustrophobia flared up badly as he got closer, and I waited with dread for him to strike. The only thing that gave me reassurance was the fact that my blade was longer than his. Once he was within striking distance, I made the first move. And that was a bad mistake. He was waiting patiently for me to attack, so that he could counter-strike. My clumsy movements were no match for his practice skill with a machete. My blade missed as he spun away to his left. His machete blade came down and knocked my weapon out of my hand. The movement looked effortless, and he smiled as I backed away from him, afraid for my life. That's when Debbie decided to take action. She took the pocket knife I had given her earlier and grasped it by its blade. She threw it with a practiced motion, and I heard a wet thuck sound as it landed in the cannibal's eye socket. I heard him scream and watched him grab at his eye with both hands. He fell to the floor and held his bloodied face. The pool of blood on the ground grew larger as he huffed and made desperate animal noises. Philip decided to put him out of his misery and brought the axe blade down on his neck, leaving a wide, gaping wound which revealed the bones of his spine. His head lolled forward and he lay motionless as we walked past. You're pretty good with a knife, Debbie, I said. I've been practicing. She smiled as she pulled the knife from the dead cannibal's eye socket. Like I said, I knew I'd be coming back down here, sooner or later. I asked Debbie to turn off her phone, and the sub-basement was bathed in blackness once again. The lack of light was soothing. My headache had grown from a dull ache and pressure behind my eyes, and was now a dark cloud blossoming with thunder and lightning bolts of pain that jumped out to my temples in time with my heartbeat. The pain settled slightly after she turned off her torch, and I asked her if she could keep the flashlight app turned off for a while. I could lead the way better in the darkness. She argued for a few seconds, but Philip convinced her to trust me. He reasoned it would be easier to see attackers if we let our eyes adjust, than if we relied on what little light we had to see with. We would look like rabbits to a jungle cat prowling at night, with our little white lights shining as they lurked in the darkness. I showed them the way back to the hole in the wall which led to the caverns. It was a long walk, but uneventful. We kept quiet, afraid to be heard by anyone lurking in the shadows. We arrived at the tunnel. It had been carved by crude tools at some point in the distant past, I wondered how long it had been there. It looked almost as ancient as the tunnels themselves. We climbed up into the narrow gap in the stone and began to crawl on our hands and knees, out of the sub-basement and into the caverns. The rats and mice were a steady stream, moving to and fro past our scrambling hands and feet. 
They nipped at my fingers, but I wasn't as forgiving this time, as I elbowed them and knocked them away. The last time I had done this, I had been heavily doped and badly brainwashed. I had wanted the vermin to like me, I remembered thinking numbly. So I had let them bite me. What combination of drugs did that to a person? Ketamine? Benzodiazepines? GHB? I'm no expert, but holy shit, I'd been clearly high as fuck. As the space got narrower, I had more and more trouble forcing myself to go forward. The stone walls pushed against my back, and my head crashed into something hard above me. I looked up and saw a sharp rock jutting out with my blood dripping from it. I got down on my belly and crawled forward, trying to ignore the terrified, high-pitched whimpers behind me. Poor Philip, I thought. We were both a bit claustrophobic, and this was far from ideal. Debbie soldiered on without complaint, just huffing slightly at the slowdown. The smell of dead bodies and rat shit permeated everything, and made it increasingly difficult to breathe as we got closer to the opening at the other end. We finally crawled out on the other side. I came through first and nearly threw up from the stench. The pit full of dead bodies was not far away. The smell would get better once we were past it. At least now we were in an open space. The air was moist and chilly in the cavern. The stone floor gave way to a ramp which brought us down to an area with several tunnels opening up from it. A foyer of sorts for the cannibal caves. Down each side tunnel was a different section of the commune. To the right of us was the bottomless pit filled with corpses. A community garbage dump, essentially, just for cannibals. There were countless dead in the hole. Rats and mice had an endless supply of flesh and blood to feast on there. I realized suddenly that Debbie had never finished her story. It had seemed important at the time, but now we were so focused on finishing our mission, we had all forgotten about it for the time being. How'd you get out of the tunnels, Debbie? Before she could answer, I heard music coming from up ahead. It came on suddenly and without warning. None of us were prepared as we should have been. I heard a metallic clang as my hand relaxed without any conscious effort on my part. The katana I was holding fell to the floor of the cave, and I heard Philip's axe and Debbie's knife drop as well. The gentle, lulling tones of the music made me feel as if I could drift off into the darkness, even standing upright as I was. I looked down and saw that my feet were moving. That's interesting, I thought sleepily. We were walking forward towards the sound. The music got louder as we got closer to the source. It drew us past the living quarters of the caverns, down deeper past the places I had been before. My eyes were half closed and my mouth hung open. I was unable to speak in my slumberous state. All I could do was listen and walk towards the sound, feeling like a man in a dream. The song was a siren and we were sailors, only we had neglected to tie ourselves to the mass. It sounded as if someone was walking ahead of us, carrying a stereo which played one of Samantha's hypnotic songs in their arms. We followed along, rats pursuing the Pied Piper. I looked down and saw the metaphor was apt. The rats and mice were walking along with us, scampering quickly to the soft beat of the music. I couldn't see who was up ahead of us carrying the radio, but I saw their shadow occasionally as the dark outline of their form slipped past the corners of the cave just out of sight. They led us deeper and deeper into the darkness, until there was no light left to see with, none at all. The walls of the cave closed in, and I felt that crushing weight once again as I had before, the weight of all those millions of tons of rock and earth above me, ready to fall in on me at any second. My breath was fast and shallow. I felt like I was drowning in the darkness, Every time the wall of the cave brushed up against my arm or my face, I would feel increasing panic as the space became narrower with each step we took through the blackened tunnels. Eventually, we ended up crawling on our hands and knees again, scurrying with the rats and mice as they scampered over our fingers, biting us in a panicked, terrified frenzy. Soon I found myself on my belly, squirming and wriggling, trying to go further. My waist was stuck and I was pinned down by a rock from above. I felt like I couldn't breathe as the weight of the world pushed down on me. The tune of the song told me to keep going, so I pulled and strained and tore the flesh from my belly and my sides, 
in great gashes until I was free. The blood was slippery and wet and helped me to slide through. Long flaps of my lacerated flesh hung from my belly and flanks, but I only gave them a passing thought. Soon I was able to get up on my hands and knees again. Drool poured from my open mouth and landed warm on my fingers. But maybe it was blood. Or both. I slept, and somehow at the same time I was awake, crawling forward into the darkness. The music drew us down and down and down, deeper and deeper. The music told us not to worry, just to listen and to follow. So we did. I tried desperately to focus my mind and resist, but my thoughts swam away from me. Five, four, three, two, one. Wake up. The words came softly from a familiar voice. It was the voice of a young girl. Or so I had once thought. I looked around, blinking away the sleep. My eyes widened as I surveyed the scene around us in an increasing terror. What I saw cannot be put into words, but I'll try. The cavernous room was lit dimly by candlelight. Tapestries with crude markings hung from the walls and ceilings, with a wicked-looking symbol painted upon them in blood. There were around thirty cannibals standing in a large circle, observing us. I recognized many of them, but there were fresh faces as well. Their clothing was ripped and filthy, and they all appeared malnourished and zombie-like in appearance. But their devotion was unquestionable. They regarded the young girl at the front of the room on the raised dais with reverence. Samantha sat upon a throne of many, many bones. It appeared to have been laboriously constructed, and I thought again how she must have been planning this for a very, very long time. This was her true happy place, it seemed, and her real taste was much more macabre than I had ever thought possible. There were several disembodied hands up on the raised platform where she sat upon her throne. She looked down at us with an unknowable expression on her face and stood up from her chair. She walked over to the pile of disembodied hands and picked one up lovingly, like a favorite doll. I saw it was dressed in a little blue security guard uniform. A big smiley face had been painted on top of the hand, near where the wrist should have been. Hello, Jordan she said with the faintest hint of a smile playing at the corners of her lips. Do you want to play a game with me? I realized I could speak again. The music was no longer playing. How long had we been walking for? How long had we been asleep? Hours, it felt like. We were sitting on the floor with our hands tied behind our backs, but I had no memory of that happening. I only remembered stumbling and crawling down, down, down into the darkness. I vaguely recalled the flaps of skin I had sheared from my flanks and belly, and winced in sudden pain and terror at the recollection. I'm done playing your game, Samantha, I said. Looks like you finally beat us. So what's your plan now? Are you going to subliminally mindfuck the whole planet? Make them into a bunch of brainless zombies like those people upstairs? Because I gotta say, I, I kind of expected a bit more than that from you. She looked at me with an irritating smile but didn't bother to answer my question. I watched as she took one of the disembodied hands in front of her and began to manipulate the index and middle finger, making them walk like a stick puppet. She giggled as she made the fingers walk along the floor of the cave. The itsy-bitsy security man walks through the cavernous cave, she sang. Dave, one of the other security guards who had saved me, walked in suddenly, his robotic-looking steps were timed perfectly with the movements of the dismembered hand as Samantha manipulated the fingers to make her sick marionette walk. Suddenly I realized that's what Dave was now. A puppet. How is this happening? How the fuck was this even possible? He continued marching into the room, walking headfirst into walls and tripping over large boulders clumsily. His face looked like a mask of terrified panic as I watched him fall over. Then an invisible hand seemed to pick him up, and he kept going. He was covered in blood, and his hand was missing. This is what I was trying to tell you, Debbie whispered softly. She's not really a little girl. You know that, right? I pried my eyes away from Dave with a very considerable effort, and looked at Debbie for a moment. I didn't understand the connection. 
Yeah, I said. Her growth was stunted by the lack of sunlight down in the tunnels, right? She's, like, closer to my age? Debbie shook her head. Oh, no, she's older than that. Much, much older. Her face was suddenly a mask of fear. Samantha's childish giggles turned into the cackles of an old hag. Tell them, Debbie, my dear. Samantha's voice suddenly sounded old, almost ancient. She was a better actor than I had ever realized. Finish your story. She taunted as she continued to sing her demented tune. Down came the blood and he thrashed around and died. She tittered again at this. Remember I was telling you about the cannibals Marianne was so obsessed with? The one she traveled the world to see? Debbie asked, ignoring her. Well, it turns out she convinced one of them to come home with her when she went on one of her trips. Her people were dying off, and well, I think there was a lot more to it than that. You see, Samantha was never their child. She was their master. She was their teacher. Maybe they managed to get the better of her along the way and kept her under their control for a while. But obviously those days are over. Samantha's wicked laugh rang off the walls of the cave, and I began to shake with fear. This was not going as planned, not at all. Marianne came to visit my people when she was traveling with her fat little lover. Oh, my dear old dad, Doug. They were so proud of themselves for finding me, so pleased that the rumors and legends were true. There were only a few of us left at that point, and the death of my people was inevitable. Too many had died from the sickness of the mind. They were too weak to consume the true gift. The jewel hidden inside the skulls of men. Only a few were chosen as such. But Marianne and Doug, they were strong. They took the pink goddess juice and drank from the goblet of man. Only later did I realize they were not worthy of it after all. They succumbed to the madness like so many others. I looked at Samantha unbelievingly. This all sounded like utter insanity. yet somehow plausible. It had been a really crazy couple of months. They had their uses, though, Samantha said. They had their talents. Doug with his computers and Marianne with her background in hypnosis. They made quite a team. I thought I could fool them and keep them under my thumb. But they grew stronger than me for a while. They fed me the same cocktail of chemicals they gave to you to keep my power in check, to use me for their purposes. Unfortunately for them, they ran out of their little supply of drugs. Fools. They didn't even realize the power of this place. But I can see it here, glowing blue from the depths of the earth, coming up through the stone like fire. Have you heard of ley lines? Well, they are here, more than one intersecting in this very place. Their power is enormous. Samantha is completely insane, I thought to myself. But then there was Dave walking around in step with his decapitated hand as she marched around on the rocks like a little toy soldier. I had to admit, the sanatorium had always felt strange to me. The rumors of ghosts and other unexplainable phenomena were seeming more and more plausible by the second. Back home, I could only dream of such power, Samantha went on, dancing her Dave marionette as his terrified eyes wept and he silently screamed. My heart drummed in my chest and my terror intensified with each word she spoke. I had never felt such fear in all my life. How the hell were we going to get out of this one? We sat shivering on the cold stone floor of the caverns our hands tied behind our backs. Samantha was up front doing a performance piece for us in the giant candlelit space. She had told us all to be quiet for her puppet show. One of her goons stood up front a few yards away from her, holding the large boombox she had employed to lure us down there. I got a feeling she intended us to lure us to a second location after this, using her Pied Piper song. Probably to a butcher's block, I couldn't help but think. I watched as she sat cross-legged on the dais, playing with her disembodied hand dolls and moving them around in a miniature version of what was happening right in front of us. 
She said the lines of dialogue and different voices for the show she had planned. From what I could gather, I was the protagonist of the play. Each movement she made with her decapitated hand dolls was replicated in exact time by our friend standing in front of us. She held two handmade figurines that represented the players on the stage in front of us. Currently, Matt and Dave were up front performing. Matt was portraying me. Dave was representing Samantha herself, and she made her voice into a high falsetto when she spoke her lines, mocking me for having trusted her. Boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. She intoned sarcastically, shaking Dave's disembodied hand forwards and backwards in a faux sobbing gesture. His actual body heaved up and down in front of us, as if a large invisible hand was moving it, holding it from above with strings like a giant marionette. I'm stuck in this very dark, scary room and I want my daddy. Matt bounded in, taking giant gravity-defying strides. It looked terrifying and unnatural. He appeared as though he were being pulled by invisible strings that held him aloft from the ceiling above. But there were no strings. Only Samantha's mind and the power of the ley lines, making him bounce like Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon. I'll save you, little girl. Samantha's voice boomed in a loud baritone, an imitation of my deep voice. She swung the hand puppet up and down rapidly as she spoke. Matt's entire body flew up and down in the air, as his head whipped back and forth in time with her words. Blood began to pour from his nose from the motion, and sprayed all over us everywhere. Audience members in the front row splash zone may get wet, Samantha laughed. Her puppet bobbed and bounced around rapidly for a few more seconds as she spoke the next lines. Blood continued to spray everywhere, painting the walls and ceiling of the cave red. Oh no, I don't have time for this door. I'll have to go get the supervisor, Samantha said mockingly. Stay here, don't be scared. Matt bounced away in long, gravity-defying strides. We need to get out of here, Philip whispered from beside me to my left. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. How the fuck do we do that? I asked quietly. Debbie was silent to my right, but I saw her hands wiggling slightly. I glanced down with my peripheral vision and noticed in the semi-darkness that she had a knife in her hands. She had apparently concealed it somewhere and was now attempting to cut her wrist free with it. Good job, Debbie. Keep it up, we'll try to distract her if we can, I thought to myself. However, it seemed Samantha was doing a great job of occupying herself already. The cannibals in the cavern also watched her show in quiet reverence. They didn't move or speak during the performance. Entranced. Where did she go? Samantha said in a loud, doofus voice. This old dark room is all empty now. I guess she was just a ghost. Ahmad bounded in. Dave had already left stage right. The old Afghani guard appeared to be playing Philip. She spoke his lines in a sarcastic know-it-all voice. His hand had been likewise removed, and blood dripped to the floor from where it had once been. There's no one in here, Jordan. Are you sure it wasn't just the wind? She cackled again, an old hag's laugh. I'm sure, sure as sure can be. Let's go look for her. I looked over and saw Debbie had her hands free now. She leaned over and passed me the knife without anyone noticing. The clan of cannibals was so wrapped up in the supernatural performance on stage, they never looked down. I got the feeling this was the first time anyone had seen Samantha's true power. Their eyes were drawn like magnets to her, and no one saw what we were doing just a few yards in front of them. The darkness of the caves also helped to conceal our movements. I began to cut at my own bonds, feeling a glimmer of hope for a fleeting moment. Then I remembered the man with the stereo, standing just a few yards away from Samantha below the dais. His ears were plugged through all of this, and he looked ready to hit play at any second, to ensnare us in Samantha's song should we try to escape. Looking over, I saw Debbie's hands were busy and she was still doing something behind her. I watched in fascination and quickly realized what her plan was. The knife in my hand slipped momentarily due to the distraction, and I cut into my hands with a blinding flash of pain. I felt warm blood trickling from an open wound in my palm where the tip of the knife had dug in. I repositioned my cramped fingers on the hilt and tried again to gain purchase on the bonds. I felt the blade finally sink into the ropes and moved it quickly up and down, sawing little bits of progress into it. Philip saw me moving around and looked behind me as sneakily as he could. 
I saw his eyes widen slightly and prepared to pass him the knife next. I only hoped he would see the additional step that Debbie was taking after freeing her hands. I would do the same once I was free. Is that a little girl up in the window? Samantha said in her best impression of me. Her impersonation was not particularly flattering. She was reenacting the time when Matt had noticed her up in the window of Century Manor. I had gone in to check, and that decision had led to my subsequent descent into the tunnels. And madness. If only temporarily. Better go inside and investigate! The dismembered hand doll she was using jumped up and down in an excited movement, and I saw Matt bouncing up and down as well. Blood still poured from his nose and into his mouth, and his wide, white eyes stood in stark contrast to all the crimson as he thrashed and flew through the air, with no regard for the laws of physics. Samantha began to portray the scene in the basement of Century Manor, and I couldn't help but watch in terrified fascination as her macabre puppets continued to recreate the horrifying and truly fucked up events of my recent life. The knife sawed through the last fiber of rope. I passed Philip the blade as casually as I could, while Samantha continued her psychotic play. She still hadn't noticed us. Good. I held the rope in my hand so it wouldn't fall to the floor, and began to pull pieces off of it for the next part of our unspoken plan. An image had begun to form in my mind of what Debbie was about to do. I only hoped she was as good as I thought she was. It occurred to me suddenly that Samantha wasn't the only one who had been planning this for a long time. How many hours did it take for a nurse to learn how to throw a knife like that? Debbie had launched it with the precision of an expert, and had killed the cannibal in the sub-basement with one quick flick of her wrist from over ten feet away in near total darkness. The long blade had gone straight into the man's brain through his eye socket, killing him almost instantly. I couldn't help but wonder where she had learned that trick. Things up front seemed to be coming to some kind of a conclusion. Nearing the end of Act 1, I thought to myself. Better hurry, Philip. I shuddered to think what kind of snacks she had planned for the intermission. Samantha bounced Matt's body up and down, and then sent him flying off stage quickly, tossing him carelessly off to her left like a discarded banana peel. Matt's body went pinwheeling through the air, and I heard a very loud noise, and then another as his body hit the stone wall of the cave and crashed to the ground. Samantha giggled at that and looked at me. I froze, suddenly terrified. She was staring at me suspiciously. Her head began to tilt to the side, and she glanced down at my hands. I realized I had stopped moving my arms suddenly. My stealthy movements had been too overt, and she had noticed. Samantha's eyes widened, and she opened her mouth to say something. Just as the words were about to escape her lips, Debbie stood up. How many secret pockets stuffed with throwing knives did she have hidden in those sensible pants of hers? She held two throwing knives in her hands, I saw, as well as the rope fibers which she had compressed into tiny balls. She jammed the fiber balls into her ears quickly, and I did the same with mine. Philip got his ropes loose at that exact moment, and clapped his hands to his ears following our lead. Samantha was speechless for a second, just long enough. Her mouth hung agape as she froze in place like a victim of her statue song. I had a moment of satisfaction seeing her stunned like that. A deer in the headlights instead of a lioness on the prowl for once. Debbie took the first blade with one quick movement, threw it at the oversized play button on the stereo being held by Samantha's bodyguard. The Pied Piper song came on and began to play loudly from the speakers, and I saw the hilt of the blade still quivering from the powerful throw. Her precise aim wouldn't have looked out of place in a Lord of the Rings movie, I thought to myself later. She had tossed the knife with the precision of Legolas the Elf. Before I could blink, Debbie took her second knife and sent it flying into Samantha's goon's face. It landed in his right eye and went in up to the hilt. He dropped the stereo as he screamed, and in an unexpected bit of good fortune, the radio didn't break when it crashed to the stone floor of the cave. Instead, the song turned up even louder, suddenly cranked up to full blast. The volume dial had been bumped serendipitously when the boombox hit the floor. The song was muffled through the rope fibers in my ears, just enough to block the noise as it boomed louder without warning. I looked over at Philip and saw he had his fingers jammed into his ears deeper than should have been possible. His face was white and he looked as terrified as I felt. The cannibals in the room began to move in slowly towards the stereo. Samantha's goon was still screaming and writhing on the floor as she yelled at him to get up and turn off that fucking radio. She began to climb down from the dais and move toward the stereo herself, immune to her own song. We took the opportunity while she was distracted to head towards the exit. 
A candlelit tunnel indicated the way out. We snuck away just as the cannibals moved past us. They would have trampled us, I realized numbly. They took no notice of anything else. They simply wanted to get closer to the song. To be inside the song, as I had wanted to a little while before. Samantha nearly reached the radio when the cannibals closed in and fell upon her, trying to get near the stereo, trying to get inside of it, to be one with it as her song commanded them to. Her commands were impossible to resist in this place of power. They stepped on her and trampled her as we watched. She crumpled to the ground and I watched as their feet came down on her face and arms and back again. She screamed at them as blood poured from her face in terrified agony as the cannibals crowded around the boombox groaning and drooling, making half-asleep snoring sounds. I looked and saw Dave and Ahmad were moving in like zombies toward the radio as well. I grabbed Debbie's arms as she had started to move away, and I pointed at the two of them. She looked over and made a muted, exasperated sound, but followed me over to them. We used more fibers from the rope and hastily made more earplug balls. We jammed these into their ears and pulled them away from the crowd, their faces surprised and impossibly grateful. We went over to Matt's body on the floor at the other end of the cavern. I checked his pulse quickly as I learned in my CPR classes. Nothing. He was gone. The blood on the floor was indication enough. It was everywhere and his face was pale and lifeless. The eyes open, pupils fixed and pinpoint. Let's go. I'm out to Philip. He's gone. Matt was dead. The fourth security guard victim of Samantha and her cannibal commune. His death hit me the hardest. He had saved me once, I remembered. Up on the cliff above the mouth of the caves. Doug would have killed me if not for him. My heart hurt as I turned away and made myself get up and walk in the other direction away from his corpse. I looked back at him over my shoulder with a deep pang of regret. Somehow it felt like his death was my fault. And I couldn't shake the feeling. Debbie had hastily made a set of rope fiber earplugs for Philip and they were jammed into his ears forcefully as he stared at Matt's body, his lip quivering, eyes brimming with tears. Samantha's giant throne made of bleached white bone stood empty. She writhed on the ground, still very much alive. The cluster of cannibals stepped on her head and throat again and again. I saw she was now covered in blood and large contusions, which deformed her and made her horrifying to look at. She spit out several teeth, and I noticed she was looking at me smiling a terrible gap-toothed grin. Somehow she was still fucking smiling. And then came the rats. Drawn by her song, they swarmed into the cave. That wiped the smug little grin off her face. I watched as they swallowed up her now terrified eyes and mouth, and her entire body with their furry forms. The rats were not quite as affected by the song, it seemed, and they were still able to eat while being drawn to it. Their brains were not big enough to grasp the full message of the music, and although they wanted to be a part of it, they were also hungry. They consumed her face first as she screamed. The rats tore off strips of her flesh and pulled out her eyeballs with their teeth as she choked on her own blood. She spun and turned, shrieking in pain, trying to get away from them. They pulled off her fingers with loud snapping noises and crunched on her bones as we left, backing away from the bloodbath in the throne room. The crowd of cannibals was still swarming like flies around the roaring stereo playing its subliminal song. We headed out the exit tunnel and followed the trail of rats who swarmed in towards the cavern from the pit of corpses far ahead of us, near the entrance. They made a living trail of diseased rodent breadcrumbs, which we followed as they marched past us by the hundreds. There was no end to them, it seemed. Finally, the sound of Samantha's screams faded and ceased entirely. But we knew the song could still be heard through the caves, as it would be until the boombox's batteries died. The groups of rats running past us was proof enough of that. The vermin began to slow to a trickle once we reached the narrow space where I had badly hurt myself squeezing through. I looked at the tiny gap in terror. We were so close, but the space was so small. It felt like there was no way I would be able to get my girth through it, especially with my belly and sides already burning in horrible searing pain as they were. I got down on my belly, knocking away rats and mice as I put my face up to the hole, 
hoping they would find another way through and not try desperately to burrow through my face towards the sound of the siren's music. After a few moments of deep breathing and deliberation, I began to crawl through. I reached the tight spot and tried to relax my muscles and took a deep breath in, holding it, forcing myself to squeeze tighter into the narrow space. I wriggled and squirmed in further, trying not to breathe, as the rocks above and below pushed in painfully against my wounds. Digging in my fingers, I clawed my way forward through the increasingly small space as it got tighter and tighter and tighter. The world started to go red around the edges, and I felt my body and brain begging for air. I succumbed to the temptation and tried to take a breath. I felt my entire body tense as I realized the extra space I had needed to pull myself through was now gone. I was stuck. My mind raced and lost all focus. All I could feel was my fear and anxiety consuming me. I was overcome by panic as the lack of oxygen became too much for my mind to take. Doom blossomed in my belly and the dread filled me up like a balloon. My skin broke out in goose flesh and I began to scream. Except only in my mind. You need air to scream for real. Someone pushed me hard from behind. I felt a little bit of progress and took a tiny breath in. I felt the hand push again and I inched forward a little more. The ceiling of the cave gave a little bit of space. And I took a deep breath once again. This time the tunnel allowed it. I finally came out the other side and managed to get onto my hands and knees again. Crawling forward, my hands shook violently. My heart hammered hard in my chest. The pain in my belly and my sides rose up anew, having previously been dulled by the adrenaline. I gasped, struggling once again to breathe, this time for a different reason. Sheer agony unlike anything I had experienced. My chest hitched as I tried to inhale air and almost couldn't. I made the mistake of pulling up my shirt to look at the damage. I nearly fainted when I saw the ruins of my midsection, hanging loose in ribbons and strips. The macerated flesh was soaked in blood which dripped to the floor of the cave. Only a little further, I told myself. Only a little further. Finally, we reached familiar territory. The hordes of mice and rats had been reduced to a trickle. I saw signs of the cannibal commune beginning to appear as we neared the tunnel entrance. Human bones and old clothing, refuse tossed here and there. We made our way through the caverns where Marianne's people had lived. I wondered if they had all been consumed by the tsunami of rats that had invaded the small space of Samantha's throne room. It seemed entirely possible. I had never seen so many rats. There were thousands, millions of them it seemed. I imagined the sleepwalking clan being eaten alive as they stood around the radio. Tonight's broadcast will be our last. We thank you for listening. Now we return to our regularly scheduled programming, The Sounds of Silent Screaming for All Eternity. Would the power of the ley lines keep them alive as such? I had a strong suspicion the answer was yes. The pit at the entrance seemed like a walk in the park, now after the horror show we just experienced. We walked past it silently without a second glance and made our way up the ramp. I picked up the katana which lay abandoned on the floor. I remembered it falling from my hand vaguely, like the beginnings of a dream after waking. The narrow cylindrical tunnel carved crudely into the rock leading back to the sub-basement seemed downright luxurious and spacious compared to the tiny space we had just gone through. I leapt up into it with a spring in my step. We were almost out. I crawled through quickly. No more rats, I noticed. I stepped down from the hole in the sub-basement wall and looked to the left where I heard an unexpected noise. Hey, there's someone down here! It sounded like a cop. I saw his flashlight beam shining from a distance away towards the east, from the direction of the secret elevator. I heard footsteps running in our direction. It sounded like more than one person. Shit, it's the cops. I said to Debbie as she pulled herself through and stood beside me in the darkness of the sub-basement. They're still loyal to Marianne for all we know. We've got to get out of here. If they find us, they'll probably kill us. And not quickly. I had a feeling they would make us suffer for burning that bitch alive. But whatever happens, it was worth it, I thought to myself. The others heard what I was saying and hurriedly crawled out of the tunnel. We ran west, away from the flashlight beams and sound of gaining footsteps. I led the way, turning right and hurrying up the tunnel towards the outbuildings. I only knew one way for sure to get out of this place. We ran as fast as our legs would carry us. 
My heart hammered in my chest, and my breath came ragged and hard from my lungs. It burned with every breath I took, and a bolt of pain from a cramp had planted itself in my abdomen, and was being driven in like a sledgehammer hitting a spike with every step I took. Coupled with the exterior agony of my midsection, I felt as if I would die. The flashlight was not far behind us when we reached the ladder. It was off in the distance a little ways, just enough for us to climb up and out of the basement and slam the hatch closed behind us as we heard the cop reach the bottom of the ladder and begin to climb. We moved a heavy piece of blackened furniture over and rested on top of the hatch as the cops began to pound and beat on the door beneath us. We took other burnt items and debris and moved them over as well, covering the trap door in junk. The pounding noise went on a little while longer, then stopped suddenly. The basement of Century Manor looked different now. First of all, it was no longer filled with darkness and shadow. Sunlight streamed in above, and I saw it was morning. Above us was a blue sky filled with clouds where the roof of the building had once been. Burnt timbers stuck out like rotten teeth and obscured the view in places, but it was there. The sun and the sky. I had missed it. We climbed the blackened stairs, careful to step over the holes and gaps where the blaze had scorched the wood. The fire department had done a good job, and the lower level had been left mostly intact. Once we reached the top of the stairs, I saw the ruins of the burnt-up building all around us. The air still reeked of smoke and carbon up here, and we hurried out through a hole where the front door had once been. For a second, I heard Marianne screaming in agony from somewhere up above me, howling as she burnt to death but then I realized it was just the wind whipping around the ashen eaves. As we stepped outside, I took a deep breath in. The air was wet and cool. A late summer smell of damp grass hung in the air. It smelled sweet and pleasant, and I breathed it in again. I heard sirens and saw flashing lights off in the distance near the mental hospital. They were moving toward us, and I heard Philip saying something about how we needed to run, to hide. They would kill us if they found us. I took another deep breath and held it in my lungs, just to enjoy it for one second longer. Three months later. The fresh-faced young man sitting across from me in the security office had a bewildered look about him. It was his first day at the mental hospital, and I had been told to show him the ropes. Philip and I were back on good terms and things around the mental hospital had returned to normal. At least, more or less. There was the ongoing issue of restless spirits walking the hallways at night, terrorizing patients in their bedrooms, waking up nurses on their breaks while they took naps on the night shift. Those instances had increased significantly since the event of a few months before. Perhaps rumors of these happenings had instilled more than a bit of fear in this young man sitting before me, I thought to myself. He doesn't even know what fear is, another part of my brain said. That side of my mind had grown cold and disconnected from reality. I guess almost dying will do that to a person. It was that part of my brain that seemed to be growing larger and more persuasive by the day. So it says here your name is... I paused and looked at the sheet of paper sitting in front of me, with his information on it. You must be kidding. That can't really be his real name. Yeah, you can just call me Matt, he said to me, trying to put on a brave smile that broke when I didn't give it back to him. I looked down and saw he had his hand extended like he wanted me to shake it. I ignored this, and he put it back down on his lap. Let's stick with Matthew, I told him. Oh, okay, sure. No problem. Just nobody really calls me that except my mom. Okay, so here's the deal, Matthew. This place is pretty chill for the most part. You be nice to the patients, they'll be nice to you. Don't stare at people. Don't turn your back on people. Don't, and listen closely to this one, don't go down into the sub-basement. He stared at me, his eyes wide, his face suddenly pale and his hands trembling. I decided to give him a smile to show him things weren't so bad around here, once he got used to the place. His eyes only widened further, looking at my maniacal grin. I hadn't been sleeping much. When I looked in the mirror lately, the face I saw looking back at me was no longer my own. Alright, let's go for a patrol. I jumped up from the desk chair and put on my radio belt. 
I let him try to catch up to me as I hustled out the door and started on my usual route, heading west through the main building. He caught up with me after a few seconds and was breathing heavily as he spoke. Yo, so what's the deal with the sub-basement? Are there escape mental patients down there? He asked, chuckling. I didn't laugh back, and he stopped and looked serious again. There can be escape mental patients anywhere, Matthew. Keep that in mind. But yes, they like to go down there because it's isolated. And doesn't get patrolled unless we have a real reason to. Most people didn't even know it existed until a couple months ago, but secret's out now, I guess. I didn't tell him the rest. That there were other, more sinister things lurking in the sub-basement now. Okay, I guess I'll make sure I don't go down there. Unless I have to, right? Like, if I saw a patient go down there or something, I'd have to go after him, right? Is that how it's supposed to work? I stopped walking and looked him dead in the eyes. The stream of foot traffic walking past us slowed and stared. One doctor stopped completely and watched the scene unfold. His brows raised suspiciously. Don't ever go down there. For any reason. Do you understand me? If you think you need to, just call me or Philip and we'll take care of it. This is really important. You have to tell me you understand. I realized I was holding his collar. And I had pulled him close to me so that his face was only a few inches away from mine. My knuckles were white as I clutched his shirt tightly and I could smell the morning coffee on his breath. He looked terrified, but he nodded his head. Sorry, I muttered. He said something back about how it was okay, and I released him and kept walking. Anyways, those are the schizophrenia units, I told him casually as we walked past wings A and B. Pretty good folks, for the most part, the schizophrenics. Sometimes they can really go on some epic rants. If you get caught talking with one of them, just be polite, hear them out. Just because they're mentally ill doesn't mean they're not worth listening to. It was true. As long as they were well medicated, the schizophrenics were the least of our concerns. I would show them the forensic units later. Lots of psychopaths, borderline personality disorder, and sociopaths over there. Also a few schizophrenics, I assumed. Like I've said, I don't get a lot of details on the backgrounds or diagnoses of the patients here. But I come to my own conclusions based on educated guesswork and things I overhear. One thing was for sure. The Code Whites rarely occurred on wings A and B. The forensic units were the most frequently violent. When we heard a Code White on the PA, we moved in that direction instinctively. It was mid-morning, so the hospital was abuzz with activity as we walked through the halls. I tried to give him a rundown of the place in a way that wouldn't get me into trouble if people overheard. I would share the nitty-gritty details later on. The pertinent ones, at least. We had returned the town to normal and saved the entire world from being brainwashed by a supernatural cannibal witch child. I would leave that part out. He didn't need to hear those details. The police had nearly caught us as we escaped from the burnt-out shell of Century Manor. We had only just gotten away by sheer luck. The officer who had been chasing us in the sub-basement had stepped awkwardly in the dark and had broken his ankle down there, impeding his escape. If he had been able to call for backup a little bit faster, we'd have been done for. We had escaped into the tree line and found our way through the woods into the town. Philip had a friend who lived nearby, and although we didn't know who we could trust, we were out of options and needed to hide. It turned out to be the best decision of our lives. His friend was a hermit. His name was Ted, and he spent the majority of his time indoors on the computer. Ted was an audiophile, as well as a bit of a hacker and conspiracy buff. When we showed up at his door, he was shocked by our appearances, to say the least, and almost didn't let us inside. We made quite a motley crew, the five of us. Dave and Ahmad, each missing a hand, and Philip and I covered in blood. Only Debbie was unscathed and didn't seem to have a scratch on her. Eventually, he let us inside, after Philip begged and pleaded with him. They had known each other since childhood by the sounds of it. We spent a while telling Ted our story. He listened to us enraptured. By the time we were done, I looked at the clock and saw we'd been sitting in his living room talking for nearly three hours. He had barely spoken a word except for the odd clarifying question or stunned remark. He stood up and began to pace around his living room. At least he lived alone, so we didn't have to explain all this to someone else. You still have that CD? He asked. I had completely forgotten about that. Philip had tucked it into his pocket when we had stopped Samantha's Song of Suffering in the switchboard office. The tune that had been playing over the mental hospital PA had brainwashed everyone in the building to attack us on sight and try to rip out our throats. 
I really didn't want to test it out to show him how it worked. I've still got it. Philip looked at him dubiously. Why do you ask? I was amazed it hadn't been destroyed in our escape from the caverns, but there it was. Philip held it up in his hands. The case which held it had protected it from damage against all odds. I should be able to isolate the tracks. If I can figure out how it works, I might, and this is a really big might, be able to reverse engineer something to tell people to ignore what they heard, to go back to the way they were before they listened to Marianne's CD. It's a long shot, but if something's been done once, it's a lot easier to recreate than to make it for the first time. With technology these days, I'm pretty sure I can at least deconstruct it enough to make a case to the authorities, assuming we can find anyone who hasn't been affected by all this. Ted held his hands out and looked at us, waiting for an answer. I realized that meant he believed us. I guess severed hands can be really persuasive. Plus, it wasn't like the five of us could have shared the same collective hallucination. He appeared to believe us. The fact that he had known Philip almost since birth probably helped as well. Wait, I said. Samantha's songs only worked while they were playing. So? Philip looked at me. We need to get the police back to normal, right? So how do we do that? Samantha's songs won't help. We have to figure out how Marianne was doing what she was doing. What if we ordered one of her CDs? We don't have to, Debbie said. I have one in my car. Someone offered it to me at work, and I, I thought it might make good evidence one day. Good, perfect. Now we just need to wait a little while for things to settle down, and we can grab it, I said. Ted, can you find out where she was selling those CDs? Maybe we can dig up some information on whatever website she's using. She probably had a list of customers on there. Maybe we can send out free discs to all of them to deprogram them. The group nodded and murmured agreement. We finally had the beginnings of a plan. We waited for a few days, thinking the police would be hanging around the hospital watching for us. Then Debbie and I made our way up to the sanatorium in Ted's car. Debbie jumped out in the parking lot and grabbed the CD quickly from her car. We managed to get away unnoticed. Ted spent a few days on the computer and managed to isolate the tracks and deconstructed the subliminal messaging. We had begun to overstay our welcome in his small two-bedroom house, and I got the feeling he would be more than happy to get rid of us. Once again, we were more than grateful for Ted's help with his computer expertise. He spent another two weeks trying to make a test version of his own subliminal sleep track. Debbie volunteered to be a guinea pig. The message Ted had hidden in the audio track was unknown, except to him. He said it was harmless and would hopefully be reversible if anything went wrong. It took a long time for her to fall asleep that night with the headphones on her ears, playing a recording of Ted's voice speaking softly for hours on end. But finally she drifted off. The overt message on the CD was a spoken word recording of him reading a Stephen King novel. Hidden deep within, however, was a different message. The next day, Ted decided to test out his work. We were in the kitchen having a breakfast of budget brand Fruitos with no milk when Debbie walked in. Morning, Debbie, Ted said. She nodded sleepily and headed over to the coffee maker. Yellow dolphin, red clown, brown up down. Ted spoke clearly and deliberately. Debbie jumped up in the air and clicked her heels. She banged her head on the low-hanging ceiling light in the process. I saw blood trickling from her scalp a second later. Fuck, really, Teddy? She had taken to calling him that lately. They had become pretty close. But she looked pretty pissed at that moment. Oh shit, sorry about that, my bad. He ran over to the hall closet and grabbed a bottle of alcohol and some gauze and used it to clean the wound. Ah, watch it! Debbie slapped Ted's hand away. I'll do it. So I guess we can take it from that your message worked? It got through to her, right? Philip looked at Ted anxiously. Yeah, I'll say. Now if we can get a few cops to listen to a deprogramming message, the rest of it should take care of itself. Assuming we can plant another suggestion there saying to spread the word... I smiled on recalling our successful efforts to stop the brainwashing and undo the damage Marianne had done. And now I was back working at the asylum, breaking in a rookie. I broke out of my reverie to the sound of Matthew's repeated questions. He was looking at me strangely. Yo, are you even listening to me? His face appeared concerned. I apologized quickly and showed Matthew the door leading down to the west end of the basement. This would be another important part of the tour. I told him to pay close attention. We got to the lower level and I opened the door. 
I led him out into the hallway and showed him the patrol check machine and the stairs leading down to a creepy little vestibule with an old wooden door. I had deja vu every time I went down there. You need to scan your card against the machine like this. I held up my ID badge against the machine and it flashed green. That tells the company you stopped at this location on your patrol. Go ahead, you try it. He held up his card just as I had done and the machine flashed red. Weird, it never did that. Let me try. I took his card and held it up to the machine. It flashed a different shade of red. Darker. Crimson red like blood. From down the stairs, behind the old wooden doors, I heard what sounded like a child crying. Without any thought or conscious effort on my part, I walked down the stairs and approached the door. The thick iron chain which held it shut was still there, the padlock intact. I pulled briskly on the lock and it gave no hint of having been tampered with. Yeah, it sounds like there's a kid in there, Matthew said. How'd she get in, though? Is there some way in, like, besides this door? I heard a bunch of rumors about that sub-basement beneath this place. Maybe she got in there somehow and made her way up here. I looked down and realized I had the key for the padlock in my hand. She was getting stronger. Listen, Matthew, I said, putting the keys away and putting my arm around his shoulder, leading him away from that place. This is going to be the toughest part of the job. Especially because I'm not going to be able to tell you the reasons. But you're really going to have to trust me on this part. We got up to the top of the stairs and I told him to look at me. He turned his head away from the great wooden door with a noticeable effort. No matter what, never, and I mean never, open that door. There are things around here that can't be explained. There are spirits here that are not at peace, and they want to do us harm. They might act innocent, but they aren't. And that kid, as you call her, she's the worst of all of them. She can make you do things you don't want to do. And I'm not telling you this to scare you, only so you understand, okay? I didn't want to walk down there just now. I didn't want to take out those keys. You need to fight her. And don't let her get inside your head. Do you follow? Matthew's eyes were wide and afraid. But he nodded his head in agreement and we moved on. I got the feeling he wouldn't last long here. As we walked away, the sound faded in the distance. The voice of a little girl, scared and locked in the dark, begging for someone to let her out. The story you just heard was written by me. That was Beneath the Asylum, my first novel by Jordan Group. If you'd like to read more of the story and find out what happens next, there is a sequel titled Escape from the Asylum, which is available now on Amazon. I also have a new book out titled From the Darkness, which is a collection of short horror stories, and I'll link both of those in the description below. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark's Wall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Larian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Aspinall, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabi Lavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Windy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gemstar, Vault 77 Citizen, Poppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, KC Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves and Oya Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brook, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, and No Name. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, as well as a Discord channel. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. 
Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. That really does help out a lot. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.